We will begin with, actually we left off Friday, Thursday, and we'll begin with uh, 2.14 financial services, 2022 proposed operating budget. Following the completion of the operating budget agenda, we will move into the capital budget agenda. And before we move into business, I'd like to note that Councillors McGrath and Councillor Cardinal will be joining us remotely via Microsoft Teams today. And Councillor Dogar and Councillor Weigel are absent at this moment. As we have councillors participating through Teams today, councillors, please have your video cameras turned on so that for voting purposes, we can see your hand is raised. If at any, at any point there are connection issues, please get in touch with the Legislative Services team. Councillors, as a reminder, anyone wishing to declare opportunity interest, please note that you must do so before the item, that's, the item starts. For everyone's awareness, there will be a designated breaks each day at approximately 10.30 a.m., 12 noon to 1 p.m., and 3 p.m. Councillors and our viewers and participants, for your awareness, prior to going into Council's considering final proposed 2022 budget, we're going to take a one hour recess to allow administration time to incorporate any changes made during the budget sessions. Now moving into process for today's meeting. Members of the public, we're, we're invited to pre-register by 12 noon, Friday, January 22nd, 2022, if they wish to speak to any item of the budget meeting agendas. Residents wishing to address council on the capital budget will have an opportunity to speak during a public delegation session at the beginning of the agenda. The final proposed 2022 budget will be considered for approval by a council today or at a later date. And finally, one last note, for the councils who are joining us virtually, please remember to stay connected during the meeting unless you are declaring opportunity interest on a specific matter. In accordance with the procedure bylaw, if a vote on a motion is taken while a councillor is disconnected, then the councillor is deemed to have left the meeting prior to the vote and will not be able to continue participating in the meeting. We are now at agenda item 2.14, Financial Services 2022 Operating Budget, now called upon Linda Olivier Financial Services. For the record, my name is Linda Olivi, the CFO, and I will be presenting the 2022 proposed budget for financial services. Financial services is proposing an overall $1,823,749 increase to the 2022 budget. The reasoning will be explained in the following slides. Revenues are showing a decrease of $201,337. Expenses, an increase of $1,622,412. For a net budget increase of $1,823,749. Financial planning is managed by Ray Kayan. The following functions are managed by the financial planning group. Budgets. Is financial planning is responsible for the overall budget, which includes preparation, implementing, and monitoring of the budget. The treasury function, which includes investment management, debt and reserve management, management of bank accounts, and overall cash flow management. Reporting function, responsible for the production and distribution of internal and external financial statements. In addition, managing the external audit function. Financial planning is showing a 71,247 decrease from the prior year. Highlights, salary, wages, and benefits have decreased by 63,937. The full-time equivalents or FTEs are lower by one position in 2022 offset by higher benefit costs. Accounting services. Susan McIsaac is the acting manager of accounting services. Accounting services is responsible for operational accounting. Billing services oversees the revenue invoices, which includes utility billing, collection of the payments and provision of cashier services. Accounts payable responsible for the payment of the municipality's invoices, we paid approximately 25,000 invoices last year. Inventory is responsible for centralized inventory. 
Insurance services is, is responsible for ensuring we have adequate insurance coverage and managing insurance claims. Taxation issues tax notices, collection of tax payments, and answering of customer queries. The accounting services budget. Revenues are budgeted to be 6,600 lower than 2021 and expenses $38,065 lower than the prior budget for a net decrease of 31,465. Accounting services highlights. Contracted and general services is budgeted to be 101,415 lower than prior year. In 2021, we were anticipating a much higher increase to the insurance premiums than what occurred. The budget for 2022 has been decreased to reflect a lower increase. Bank charges and short-term interest is budgeted to be 67,340 higher than prior year budget as online payment volume has increased, mainly due to changes in how people pay for our services. Assessment is managed by Kevin Navidi. Assessment, the assessment branch is responsible for the property assessments within the region. Of note, they no longer complete assessments on machinery and equipment nor linear. That has become the province's responsibility. The proposed budget for assessment, a slight decrease in year over year budget. Revenues are higher by $6,680, which is mainly from transfer from reserves for training that did not occur in 2021 due to COVID restrictions. Expenses are lower by 13,597, which equates to a 20,277 overall reduction to the 2022 budget. Assessment highlights the budget is in line with last year's budget. Information technology. Information technology or IT is managed by Anne-Marie Hintz. Information technology has two main streams of business, application services, which supports the organization through the implementation and management of programs that assist the business and offer efficiency to the end user. The other stream is infrastructure services, which is responsible for equipment and components such as networks, data centers, server, printers, mobile devices, to name a few. The net IT budget has increased by $853,096. The highlights. The following items are contributing to the overall change in budget from 2021 to 2022. The increase in salaries is mainly attributed to a maternity leave that was not budgeted in 2021, but fully budgeted in 2022 plus increased benefits and the reduction of one position. Contracted and general services increased by $909,433. This increase is attributed to the following. Internet charges increased by 136,000 due to planned upgrades in 2022. Based on our network improvement plan, we will be upgrading the bandwidth of four locations from 10, M to 30M to 100M connections. These locations include Fire Hall 3 and 4. Computer software decrease of 129,000. Department requires were much lower than prior years. Application software support increase of 563,000. This increase is primarily due to increases in vendor support agreements and new support agreements for business applications implemented in 2022. There is an increase in network service repairs and maintenance of 165,200 for mobile and radio equipment due to planned life cycling and new hires. Increase in stationary and office supplies of 62,000 was budgeted for printing service lease agreements. Our current agreement expires in 2022 and we anticipate a slight increase. Disaster Recovery Program. The Disaster Recovery Program, or DRP, is a short-term project. The Disaster Recovery Program is in place to complete the submissions to the government for the 2016 wildfire event 
and the 2020 flood event. The overall budget increase is 1,100,000. The highlights the disaster recovery program. To date, we have submitted $191,339,335 of expenses. We are preparing submissions for another 34,130,394. The total amount of submissions will be 225,469,729. The submissions for the 2016 wildfire have to be completed by May, 2022. We have already been granted an extension. We do still have a couple of outstanding projects that may not meet the deadline. And as we finalize the submissions, we, mo we know that there may be expenses that do not fit the criteria outlined by the province and federal government. This budget has been prepared to ensure we have funds to pay for these errors and possible late projects. In addition, we're adding personnel to finish the final submissions as it is a labor intensive exercise to, to submit all invoices and any applicable backup. Financial Services Administration. The CFO, Senior Administration Assistant, and the Internal Auditor are in this branch. There is a slight decrease to the overall budget. Highlights, sal salary, wages, and benefits are 32,803 lower than prior year due to a maternity leave the, the position was not backfilled. Personnel will return to the position in 2022. And that is the end of the finance budget presentation. Thank you, Linda. Are there any questions from council? Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair, just one comment, and that's a compliment to your staff for the efforts in a fairly comprehensive document. Sometimes hard to read the fine print, but <laughs> other than that, I just wanted to thank you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Boussier? Yes. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Bowman, and thanks, Linda, for your presentation. Just um, comments on the fire and the flood. <clears throat> Will we... Um, be presented with a um, <clears throat> history of the expenses and, and the cost to the community for, for the uh, fire and the flood, like what it actually cost the community. As you mentioned, some of the claims or some of the expenses are not recoverable through the province or through DRP. So will there, is it the intention of administration to come back sometime in 2022 or 23 and just let everybody know what the fire actually cost the community uh, through the financially chair, i guess yeah, through the chair to council boussier we do include a section within the uh, quarterly financial performance report that we present to council on a quarterly basis and it outlines uh, the costs that we uh, have submitted for as well as the insurance payment that we received and anything that the red cross for example contributed as well to our expenses we can give a, a more wholesome report if, if necessary, but yes, we already do that on a quarterly basis. And the flood is also included in there. So, and <clears throat> I think you mentioned we've got till the end of 2022 to submit any additional claims to the province for the, the wildfire of 16? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Boussey, no, we have till May 2022. Oh, May? Okay. And we've already been extended twice. Um, and so th there is no extension. Uh, yeah, available anymore because the federal government themselves want to receive what the costs are. So we, as I say, we are at the last bit and there's always things that pop up that should not be submitted. And so I'm just wanting to be fiscally responsible and put a fund together. Okay, thanks. And thanks again for the presentation. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cardinal? Morning, uh, Linda, Chief Financial Officer. <laughs> I wanted to say, uh, you know, thank you for all the wonderful work that you do for the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo. And I wanted to express my support and uh, and 
just picking up your spirits and how wonderful a job it is you're doing for you and your team. I appreciate the presentation. And uh, I know that you're going to be coming into retirement here soon. And I wanted to wish you nothing but the best. And uh, uh, thank you for all your community support and uh, all the wonderful work you do. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Majoko. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. And thank you uh, for the presentation. And I'm sure we'll really miss you. Thank you for your good services. My question is, uh, I, is or maybe it's a comment about insurance premiums being lower. Uh, so I wanted to clarify that. Is, is that uh, some glimpse of hope for residents of uh, Fort McMurray? Through the chair to Councilor Ventroka, no. Uh, our insurance premiums, and I just want to make a note that it's very difficult for municipalities actually to get insurance at this particular time, but our insurance premiums in 2021, we were anticipating a 20% increase overall of our insurance pay uh, premiums. And so we are not anticipating that level of increase, but we are anticipating between 10 and 15%. So, and we are seeing that come to fruition. So we did lower the budget because the uh, amount that we had budgeted for 2021 was too high. Okay, okay. So um, does that apply to um, everyone in Fort McMurray, like the residents to expect about 15% or it's just uh, no. the way you normally budget? Is that the, um, the actual situation that people should expect? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Bunjoko, no. Okay. Um, that is only for our facilities, our, our liability, et cetera. We are actually seeing uh, an increase in our insurance premium due to our, um, our risk. Because okay. we had the fire, because we've had several floods, and because we've had several instances from an environmental perspective, and also because of cybersecurity, we are seeing an increase overall. So, but that should not be necessarily the same um, history for the residents. This is just our own particular history. Thank you again. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councilor Joko. Are there any other questions from Council? I'm not seeing any. So again, uh, the echo with the other councillors, uh, Linda. Thank you for everything you've done and. Uh, and also being so knowledgeable when it comes to the finances. And I know it's gonna to be tough, tough shoes for the CEO to fill and I wish you all the best in your retirement. Thank you. We'll now move on to the delegation portion of the capital budget, which will be followed by council reviewing it pros 2022 budget. As a reminder, this public delegation session is for members of the public who wish to speak to the 2022 capital budget. Legislative Services, we, do we have any registered delegates? Thank you, Mayor Bowman. We have no registered delegates for capital budget. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have the capital budget introduction. I'd like to invite Linda Olivier back, Chief Financial Officer, to come forward. Thank you. The following section of, of the budget is the capital portion. The presentations will be for multi-year, first year of multi-year, one-year projects and capital purchases. Within your uh, binders, you will see some very long sheets and they're Excel, so exciting to me, I'm sure not to yourselves, but that's where you can follow along uh, about the amount of monies that we are expecting as well as shows the plan years, et cetera. Thank you. Are there any general questions from council on the budget before we yeah, go into presentations? I got one. Councillor Cardinal? I, um, I, I wanted to maybe run this by Jade again. Uh, I, I set a motion forward to uh, for the for Dory Lake uh, 
campground as well as uh, I think it was a Fort Mackay egress road. I wanted to just formally uh, acknowledge that I wanted to speak to those. When would be the best time? Thanks. Thank you, um, Councillor Cardinal, through the chair. It's Jade. Um, we can do capital budget presentations and then prior to closing um, for our one hour recess, we'll have council bring any motions. So your Dory Lake motion would be specific to operating budget. And I believe the second motion is more of a capital budget, but we can bring all those after um, we get through presentations and question and answers, if that's okay with council. So you you're talking about like right after we're done the whole budget? Thank you, Council Cardinal. So what we can do is go into individual capital budget presentations and questions and answers. Once we get through those presentations, we can take any motions. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Council Cardinal. I'll now call upon engineering who will present the capital budget for flood mitigation, rural water and sewer servicing, and the engineering department. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you, Mayor Bormas, <coughs> Mayor Bowman. Uh, good morning to uh, to yourself and to members of council. Just want to confirm that you can see my presentation. Yes, it's on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. So for the record, my name is Dennis Ward, the Director of Engineering. Today I'll be presenting the 2022 proposed capital budget for flood mitigation, rural infrastructure rehabilitation, rural water sewer servicing, and the RWSS service connection and engineering sponsored projects. <clears throat> flood mitigation design. This project is to fund the design of the flood mitigation project for the downtown waterways and Taganova areas for the ice jam and open water flooding events for the one in 200 year return period. The project upgrades flood mitigation to the higher elevation using a combination of elevated roads, berms, and retaining walls. For 2022, the request is $4 million. For 2023, the request is $1 million. The requested funds in 2022 will be to continue ongoing contracts and for new works planned this year, such as the design for REACH 6, that include public engagement, which is planned for Q1 of 2022. An RFP for design is then planned for Q2 of 2022. It also includes design for hanging stone expansion. RFP is planned for Q4 of 2022. Uh, and environment services, an RFP for the underground reaches one to four for Q1 of 2022. Flood mitigation construction. The flood mitigation, <clears throat> this project is to fund the construction of the flood mitigation project for the downtown waterways and Taganova areas, again, for the ice jam and open water flooding events for the one in 200 year return period. The project upgrades uh, flood mitigation to the higher elevation using a combination of elevated roads, berms, and retaining walls. Our request for 2022 is $13 million. For 2023, $34 million, and for 2024, $16 million. The requested funds of $13 million in 2022 is to continue ongoing contracts and for new contracts planned for this year. The new request is for REACH 5. Currently, is, uh, design is progressing and will be completed by mid-March of 2022. Two tender packages will be sent out by Q2 of 2022. Uh, one is the earthwork package, and two is the structural wall behind Rydell. Reach 8, Reach 8 Southwest Longboat Landing and Mills Avenue Booster Station. Uh, tender package is posted um, uh, this month. Um, Reach 10, 
retaining wall. This tender package is ready to be posted by um, mid-February as well of 2022. Uh, Taganova Eco Industrial Park flood protection uh, design is in progress at 30% and plan to have the tender package ready by the end of March of 2022. The recovery team deployment in 2022, such as traffic accommodations, field support, monitoring, security, scaffolding, etc. This slide shows the map for all the reaches, including Taganova and waterways. Uh, if you can see my cursor here, this is show reaches one all the way through to reach 10. And this particular map here shows the reaches and waterways reach 11. And this area here shows the Taganova. That concludes my presentation of flood mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Do we have any questions from council? On flood mitigation, yes. Councilor Ball. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Through the chair to to Dennis. Um, I was just just a little clarity on uh, you'd mentioned Reach Five. The design was going to be completed by March. Uh, I didn't think we had any preliminary design on that one. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, we're going to defer to our program manager for the flood mitigation, Maureen Nakaneshni, uh, to give you the update with Reach Five. Thank you. Councillor Boussier? No. Oh, sorry, Maureen. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Ball. The contract for the preliminary and detailed design of REACH 5 was signed last year and preliminary design is already underway. Uh, we hope to have some tender packages in, in February, March, April. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, what uh, what uh, is in that design? I know it's problematic there, so just curious. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, we are intending to have a berm uh, picking up on Clearwater Drive that will go in front of the parking lot that's between uh, Edgewater Court, which is a Wood Buffalo housing development, and the river. Um, directly in front of Riverwalk Villas, we're anticipating some manner of structural wall. And then once we clear Riverwalk Villas, we'll be transitioning back to a berm. Thank you. Is there uh, an estimate on what the construction value might be for that particular reach? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, off the top of my head, I want to say $5 million. Um, that sounds familiar to me. We'll have to double check and see what the um, preliminary design comes back as. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Boussier. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bowman. And through the chair to Dennis. Uh, Dennis, thanks for the presentation. And recognizing you you stepped in this job just recently, I just have a question regarding down by the boat launches. Um, is there any obligation to, to let the Raphael Cree family and Tom Weaver know that we're going to go in there and just flatten the entire boat launch area. Like, I guess I struggle how quickly that was done. Yet, we struggled to just to get a um, a north side or a south side snow dump. Like that, Keith has been Councillor McGrath has been talking about for eight years. I just, I mean, I drove down there one day, Dennis, and I know, like I said, you inherited this position just recently, and I was just kind of taken back and how we destroyed the. In, in my opinion, well, we changed the landscape of the of the dog parks and the and both the Raphael Cree and Tom Weaver boat launch. Was it? I guess my my question is: Was it necessary to to do what we did down there to 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 do the flood mitigation? Uh, 
uh, through the chair to Councillor Boucher. Um, I'm not sure of the uh, engagement that we had previously with regards to the communications piece of uh, with regards to communication or the engagement of uh, family members of uh, the folks that you mentioned. But um, I can defer to Maureen. She has the history. As I said, she's been working with the flood mitigation for the last year. But uh, if Maureen has further information on how we did that or what we did with the communications piece of it, Maureen? Yeah, just Dennis, and I'm not sure if the community is obligated or the, the city is obligated to let the families know, but I mean, in my opinion, we certainly uh, changed the whole landscape of, of those two boat launches and, and the dog park. That was, yeah. Through the chair to Councillor Boussiers, uh, the boat launches are one item where uh, there's been a bit of overlap between engineering and parks. Um, the flood mitigation project has largely stayed away from the boat launches. However, I believe parks has been doing work with the boat launches and the dog parks. Um, so Reach 11, for example, I don't believe actually touches the, the boat launches themselves. So I believe parks might be better suited to answer your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess a uh, question back to Dennis. Dennis, we've been um, talking about flood mitigation for a long time, and um, I, I believe you've reassured, reassured us that the flood mitigation work will be done in 2024. Um, I guess my question is what, what hurdles could come up or what unknowns that would prevent us from having this completed um, by the... 2024. Through the chair to Councillor Bruce here. Uh, at this point in time, we don't foresee any hurdles um, on our path now to, to get the work done. And of course, uh, as we go through the process of uh, getting the work uh, underway and completed, um, if there are unforeseen, then uh, we would definitely be providing the updates with that. But at this point in time, we don't see anything that would prevent us from completing it in 2024. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Boussier. Uh, also, Dennis, just I'm not sure if you can answer this or I see, like as Councilor Boussier mentioned, the boat launch. The other uh, thing, I know we need this done and it may inconvenience some people, uh, but we need to protect our downtown core. Uh, but also for the trap lines, the access to trap lines, we're going to, have we spoke to some of the indigenous community about uh, some way that they're going to be able to, to access the trap lines on the other side? Has that been something that's been considered? Through the chair, through the chair. Um, I can defer to, again, I'll defer to Maureen. I'm not sure as to the previous communications that were had with the particular groups, but uh, Maureen, if you have that information. Through the chair, to the chair. Um, Mr. Bowman, I'm not 100% certain of the trap line locations you're referring to. Um, if it's trap lines that are accessed via um, horse pasture park. Um, I don't believe that the work we're doing for flood mitigation in the park will leave them unable to access the trap lines. Um, if it's referring to the downtown, downtown core, um, the, the flood mitigation will serve as a, for sure, as a barrier for the flood water to enter downtown, but people will still be able to access the riverfront. And that's, uh, that is the intent of our program. Thank you. Okay, that's appreciated. I believe the trap line I'm referring to is actually the land right across from uh, where Sharika is in there, right across the river. That's where there's a trap line located uh, across that side there. And right now with the temporary mitigation, it's, it's pretty blocked for access. But we can look into that later and appreciate the response. Uh, Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. Uh, Dennis, uh, you had indicated that uh, we're going to be going to some community consultation, and one of the pieces of feedback I've often heard from the community um, is that in our consultation, we often don't attach any kind of projected price tag. And uh, from my perspective, 
when we're asking people what they want or what they think or, or what option would be best, if they don't know what it costs, that influences decisions. If, if I know something it's gonna cost 200 million to do versus 50 million to do, that will influence what I vote for, what I indicate through the consultative process on what I think might be most appropriate. So I guess my question is, can we include in our consultative process um, some projected costs that might be related to uh, what we're asking the public about? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Dennison, thank you for the question. And that's a very valid point. And uh, when we start our public engagement, we will certainly provide that information to give uh, some perspective of costs of uh, potential options. <coughs> Could be. Thank you. I so, would appreciate yeah. that. I, I think that it definitely has an influence on the public when they know what they're voting for or what they're asking for. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Dennison, um, sorry. Talk to me, but anyway, um, we will certainly in include uh, those values with the uh, with the options that we uh, that we provide. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Grattison. Councilor Cardinal. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair to Dennis, um, I I guess I recall you saying that you know March for Taganova would be an uh, an, an, an end date for. Uh, the planning is that my my uh, recollection as well as you know um, do we is there a certain area that is being uh, how do, how is the process going for which place gets fixed first or the, with the flood mitigation thanks uh, through the chair to Councillor Cardinal the Taganova Industrial Park as I said the design uh, should be completed by Q1 of 2022 uh, and then, of course, the construction services procured in early Q2 of 2022. We've identified the areas um, is where the construction is needed. I guess uh, I got one more question. Uh, do do you, uh, as the um, planning and not planning, what are we on? I'm sorry, uh, engineering. Engineering. Uh, do you do do you go up and fly with the helicopter or? anything to uh, you know monitor what areas exactly need to be fixed and are you doing it all on the ground through the chair to councillor cardinal we collect data from various sources we do do ground surveillance and we also uh, gather information from the uh, from the uh, previous flood and we get that information from various sources uh, of the province and uh, those that actually provided with information of any flood inundation so we, we work with the information that we can gather from all resources okay and then um i guess in Mc mcdonald drive on the way to uh, mcdonald island is that uh, is that somewhat of a uh, concern as well or is it did it not go over the bank there i don't really remember through the chair to councillor cardinal um I don't think that went over the bank there. Um, I can defer that to Maureen. She'd have that information based on the data that we received. So, uh, Maureen, if you have that information. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Cardinal, um, you're correct. The water did not breach uh, McDonald Drive. The ice stayed on the bank. Um, there was flooding on Mac Island, but I don't believe it came from McDonald Drive. I think it came from other corners of the island. Um, McDonald Drive is relatively high ground on the west side. On, on the east side, where it ties into Reach 1, we're looking at uh, tying that into flood mitigation through the Waterfront Park project. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, I got another question. Um, I noticed that uh, McDonald Island wasn't on the flood mitigation uh, process. Uh, and maybe answer that. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Cardinal, we didn't identify uh, McDonald Island as a uh, separate area. Um, um, it's just not identified as a separate area, no. So is that is there going to be? Because I know I know like that's 
one of our main areas as well is with all the sporting events and then of course the cultural center coming up and i was just wondering what what's our plans to uh, protect that area uh, at mcdonald island Through the chair to Council Cardinal, uh, I'll defer to more because I'm not quite sure of what the elevations uh, that are currently around Mac Island, um, uh, if we have those identified or not. Um, uh, so yeah, I'll defer to more if we have that information. Through the chair to Councillor Cardinal, um, Mac Island is kind of a, an odd situation for for us in engineering because. Technically, the island itself um, and its facilities are under the control of the Regional Recreation Corporation. Um, we've provided support to them in the past with um, things like sewer lines and whatnot, but we haven't been requested to provide support for flood mitigation. Uh, with regards to the Métis Cultural Centre, during the design stage, they reached out to us to inquire what flood elevations they should be building to, and we provided them that ele elevation. So I believe that's been incorporated into their design. Okay, um, I guess one more comment. Uh, maybe we could uh, funnel some uh, emails between RRC and uh, the RM because I think that we, sh we, we need to really take a look at that and support whatever mitigation that needs to be done at Mac Island, because I know there is some low spots on the Clearwater River and the Clearwater River is where uh, all of the flooding has been coming from. So I think we really looked at there's that, that there's behind the Rock Island, that whole place needs to be mitigated as well. That's uh, because there's Mac Island and there's Little Rock Island. That's where the low spot is. So if anything was to happen, I think that where the mitigation would start there. Through the chair to Councillor Cardinal, uh, duly noted, we'll, uh, we'll certainly follow up with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Benjoko. Thank you, Mayor Boma. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions here around, uh, I don't know if it's, um, <laughs> I don't know if there's, there's a possibility. So there's a fire drill normally, right? And I'm just wondering if there's anything like flood drill uh, that you would do to ensure uh, our preparedness as an organization and as a region. Uh, should there be a flood right now? If the answer is yes, how often is that done and when was the last uh, flood drill? And if you could just educate us a little bit about that plan. Uh, and uh, okay, the second question is actually to CAO, so I might as well ask. Um, I had a question regarding uh, the burden of insurance that uh, residents have, uh, are left with, uh, especially given the history of uh, flood in the in the area, and uh, CAO had talked about um, work being done, and there will be some information to be shared uh, uh, soon. I just wanted to know when um, the information on uh, insurance relief could be available to to public. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Benjoko, um, thanks for the question. I raised my hand a little bit early to speak to your emergency management planning. Um, I uh, will back up just a little bit, just to make sure we cover off, um, just to close the loop on some of Councillor Cardinal's questions about Shell Place, I guess, in its entirety. And while I don't know all the details, what I do know, um, most golf courses are designed to flood and, and are insurable. Um, Shell Place is mitigated the way it's, way it's designed and built. The cultural center, as mentioned, it is designed at one and 200, but I'll go back to uh, Councillor Van Joko's question about the, I guess, practice drills for, for a flood. We'd capture that um, through the emergency management planning and desk desktop exercises we go through and we involve all the regular stakeholders. And it, it's, we do drills and mock exercises, not just for flood, we also do it for fire and things of that nature. 
Uh, so what ends up happening is those that are assigned to the RECC, um, they go they go into the RECC, they're given a situation and they, they kind of work their way through it. So we do practice from that perspective. And the insurance information, um, we're trying to schedule some meetings here with uh, some insurance providers so we can have a, a bit more of a dialogue, one in particular, but um, we've of course been in budget the last few days. So as soon as this wraps up, we'll be uh, sitting and have that discussion. And there, there's some interesting opportunities, I guess some cities are taking uh, that we're looking into, not necessarily in Alberta, but trying to think outside the box so we can help alleviate some of those issues. And as soon as I have that information, I'll report back to council through briefing note, most likely or an in-camera session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Councilor Boussier? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bowman. <clears throat> and through the chair back to, to Dennis. Uh, Dennis, just further to Councilor Granison's point about us holding open houses and discussion sessions with the public. The, and again, you weren't in the chair when, when this happened, but after the flood, I I, um, I attended one of the open houses down at uh, the SNI or by Sarikas there. And one of the um, one of the areas had the waterways in Ptarmigan Park um, update. And to me, it was, it was a little misleading. It said 97% of the area was impacted. So if I'm just a casual visitor, I would assume that 97% of people, of owners had water in their, in their manufactured homes down there when I don't know if, if any single owner did. Like I have some friends down there and yeah, water covered their yards and all that. But having read the, uh, the briefing notes or the displays you had, it, to me I would have read into it that, you know, pretty well every home had water in their, in, in their in their house, which unfortunately wasn't true, but it, you know, it scared the bejeebies out of people not wanting to live there, but talking to the homeowners, majority of them didn't have any water except for some that was covering their, their lawn. So I guess when we go fur further, like maybe we can, I don't, I don't know, maybe be a little more accurate with our information or just clarification with an asterisk or something when, when we have these uh, open houses. So it's just a comment. Certainly not trying to attack your department, but it was just, um, or whoever sets that up. The second question is back to the um, flood mitigation on reach five. And I, I know uh, someone spoke to it. With Clearwater River being a heritage river, are we, are our hands tied when it comes to flood, the flood mitigation around the river walk and the other um, building down there? Through the chair to Councillor Bruce here, um, due to note about the uh, the information um, as we move ahead with that. Um, with regards to River Walk Villas, um, I'm sure they're, I'm not quite sure of the exactly uh, what the restrictions are, but of course, anytime we're near water bodies, we do have, uh, we do take the guidance from uh, regulatory bodies uh, and uh, can defer to Maureen to speak to that further with regards to our uh, requirements with regards to what we can and can't do near water bodies. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Boussiers. Um, the Clearwater being a heritage river hasn't come up too much in our regulatory applications um, so far. So for example, Reach 7, which is constructed uh, behind Longboat Landing, facing the Clearwater River and facing the Clearwater River, it wasn't specifically mentioned. Um, given that we're not doing work in the water body itself, I don't anticipate that to be uh, an issue. I think we're dealing mostly with the uh, regulatory aspects of the Water Act instead. Thank you. Okay, just um, through the chair to Maureen. On Reach 5, I believe you indicated we're putting a wall around the river walk, and I, and I forget, excuse me, I forget the, the name of the other building, Water's Edge maybe. Um, so where is in relationship to the river is the wall? Like how far, what's the setback, I guess, from the Clearwater River? Through the chair to Councillor Boussiers, uh, we're intending to put the wall in front of Riverwalk Villas on the existing trail. Uh, it's, it's 
probably, I want to say about 10 meters or less from the river. Um, so it is indeed very close, but River Walk Villas is very close to, to the Clearwater River. So we're really we're really stuck there. Um, the the heritage aspect of the Clearwater River, um, as I said, doesn't really seem to come into play. Uh, we're more impacted by um, the the aspects of building so close to the river through the Water Act. Uh, we do have to fill out um, historical resources applications for all of our work. Uh, including flood mitigation. So that's a, a, a separate uh, item that we have to attend to. So for example, if our approval from Alberta Heritage might say that we need to be aware of potential um, potential historical resources and we might need to keep uh, monitors on site and things of that nature. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and I agree, Maureen, that area is just those two buildings. It's, it's gonna be an awful tough job to mitigate the waters from, from those two buildings, thank you. And just one last question regarding the boat launches. Um, my understanding is both the both launches will be available to to jet boaters this, this year to access during the, during the flood mitigation work? Through the chair to Councillor Boussiers, uh, I believe that um, Temporary accesses have been allowed for in the Reach 11 construction plan at Horse Pasture Park. Um, I don't believe that we're in, I, I believe that the boat launches are still, accept, will be accessible this year. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Councilor Boussier. Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. So two questions, I, I guess question number one, and this may throw a fly into the ointment. Um, when permits were approved for those buildings, were they not required at the time to build them to the appropriate height? And if they were, why aren't they? Um, which is now causing this additional mitigation. That's question number one. Um, and you may not be able to answer that, but I'd certainly like to know the answer as to I believe at the time those buildings were constructed, there would have been a requirement in the flood zone to be built at a certain height. And if they're not, I would really question what happened there. Um, does anybody have an answer to that? Through the Chair to Councillor Grandison, I'll get uh, Brad McMurdo, Director of Planning Development, to chime in if, if I missed the mark here. However, it's a very good question regarding permits. And at the time of, of those I guess developments, the flood elevation was much different. It was at one in 40 and not what it is today. Um, perhaps Brad can speak to any condition that would have been standard on some of those uh, applications. So Thank you. I guess to follow up to that answer, uh, Jamie would be, were they built to the one in 40 then? Through the chair of Councillor Grandison. I believe that they were, however, I wasn't here, I might have been even alive when some of those places were built. But nonetheless, uh, Brad, can you uh, chime in through some of the development permit conditions here that we would have experienced through the flood area? Thank you, CAO Doyle. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Grandison, um, the comments earlier from the CAO are accurate. Uh, based on our review post flood, um, the structures were constructed in compliance with the bylaw at the time or the requirements at the time. As the CAO, CAO had mentioned, the uh, elevation and the requirements associated with that have changed over the years. Um, I would say in um, some of the developments insofar as went to acknowledge, fully acknowledge uh, the potentiality that a flood may occur. And in doing so, they designed the buildings accordingly. Um, you know, uh, going back to Riverwalk Villas as an example, the parkade was identified through the construction and development permitting process to accommodate, to potentially accommodate flood waters should it uh, should there, should there be a, a future flood event. Likewise, um, there was also consideration given in the areas of longboat landing. Um, and so at the time of construction, again, those, those, those developments occurred at, at different times or different eras, if, if I could put it that way. Um, but certainly at the time when, the, when buildings are constructed, they would meet the minimum requirements uh, related to elevation. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. And I, and I recognize that as times change, bylaws change to accommodate new conditions. So I just wanted to inquire because obviously all, now all of a sudden we're building a wall around a specific building just to ensure that it doesn't flood. So that was the basis of my question. Uh, so thank you for that. So my second question goes back to uh, Councillor Cardinal's comments uh, about the island. Um, I understand and, and find that, it, you know, it's wonderful that we are now, um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the new center that's being built there will be built uh, in accordance with the flooding. Did the buildings it, themselves at the island receive any flooding? I know that there was a tremendous amount of damage to the golf course because of ice flow more specifically. And has there been any consideration or could there be any uh, consideration to uh, some type of method to ensure that those uh, blocks of ice that are being pushed by the, the floodwaters onto the island to prevent that damage. Uh, Mother Nature is a, a force to be reckoned with, and I saw the damage uh, that these, you know, thousands and pounds of, of ice carved out into the, into the uh, golf course, and I'm just wondering if that can be mitigated in some way. Through the chair uh, to Councillor Grandison, very good point. Um, no, I don't believe there was no flooding in the in the buildings per se, but I think there was some uh, damage to golf carts and things like that, aside from from the actual golf course. And it's a good point to to understand. And I think now that uh, we've certainly seen what the damage can be caused by a block of that ice, uh, myself and uh, Greg Wall, CEO of, of RRC, can certainly ensure that. We're putting our best foot forward when it comes to flood mitigation around the area. I don't know the specifics about it, but it's certainly something I could bring back to council. I would appreciate that because I think if we're if we're looking at flood mitigation in its entirety, I think you know if we can prevent ongoing damage through floods to the actual island, if there's some me method to mitigate that, I think that would be an appropriate thing back. I know the RC is a is a separate entity, but they're also an entity of of uh, the RMWB, so I think anything we can do to support that would be uh, would be tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Grandison. Do we have any other questions regarding the flood mitigation? If not, we can move into rural, rural water and sewer, Dennis. Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and I'll continue with my uh, with my presentation. The rural infrastructure rehabilitation um, construction. Of the, this project consists of construction of uh, hot mix. Sorry. Uh, hot mix asphalt roads and associated roadside drainage in the southern rural communities of Anzac, Compton, Draper, Gregoire Lake Estates, John B. A. and Sapphire Creek Estates. To synergize and reduce the impact on the public, the construction was planned in conjunction with the Rural Water Sewer Servicing Program. We have no new requests for 2022 as the carry forward amount will be used to continue uh, ongoing contracts. In 2023, we'll be requesting 2.3 million, and 2024, we will be requesting 3.5 million. The rural water sewer servicing construction. Again, this project is for the construction of water and sanitary systems consisting of water and sanitary mains up to the property lines and all related infrastructures such as lift sanitary stations, manholes, cleanouts, water reservoir, pump house and hydrants in Anzac, Compton, Gregoire Lake Estates, John VA, and Sapri Creek Estates. This portion will be constructed within the municipal right of way up to the private property line. We have no new requests for 2022 as the carry forward amount will be used uh, to continue ongoing contracts. Um, our request for 2023 will be 9 million and for 2024, 
our request would be 6.7 million. Service connections, uh, rural water sewer services. This project is for the design and construction of water and sewer system on private lots. This project will enable existing residential lots to connect to the pipe water and sanitary mains already installed up to the property lines under the rural water sewer servicing program. For 2022, we are requesting $2 million. In 2023, we'll be requesting $13.5 million. 2024, we'll be requesting $11.8 million. And 2025, $5.7 million. In 2026 to 2027, $13.83 million. The requested funds are based on assumptions. Uh, those assumptions are that all developed and vacant lots will be hooked up in five years of the funding period and that all vacant lots will start hooking up in the last two or fourth and fifth year of the funding period. This, excuse me, this slide is the forecast or estimate of service connections in the five hamlets. There may not be an accurate model to predict how and when residents will hook up or the service connection to the service connection as required. The following assumptions are made to come up with and some uh, with some quantities and numbers to request the budget. In 2021, we were assuming 171 hookup hookups would occur, but in essence, we had uh, only 52. That concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Now, for the rural and sewer uh, connection, I believe looking at about 770 homes, are those homes, will they be have to be upgraded, some of them, in order to receive rural sewer and water? Through the chair, to the chair, um, there may be some residents or some uh, lots that may not have um, the um, ample plumbing and or electrical requirements uh, for the hookups. Um, I know there was a, um, uh, some work was done back in 2017, I believe. I'm not sure if we have the exact number of those lots, but they're likely unable to accept these, but uh, I'm not sure if we know exactly who they are or how many. Okay, thank you. And, and the ones that will need to be upgraded, is that going to be added on to this budget that, that's been allocated for almost $49 million? Will there be an extra charges on that, or is that going to be the responsibility of the homeowner? Through the chair, through the chair. Um, that is not included in the real water sewer servicing uh, program. Thank you. Councillor Grandison? Mr. Mayor, through the chair. So, based on what you said, uh, so am I? Am I to assume that we've embarked as an organization on a over a four hundred million dollar project without confirming the outcome, without absolutely establishing the that we're not going to have two delivery methods when we're done? Is that what I'm hearing? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there was some um, engagements done, of course, when the program started. Um, but uh, I, I, again, as I said, I'm not sure of the number of homes that are out there. There's probably uh, very few. Um, but um, yeah, some residents may not have the appropriate or the required plumbing and or electrical requirements for, for the hookups from our senior private properties. Don't, don't you think we should have known that before we started? Um, obviously not your decision, Dennis. I'm just sitting here looking at it. It feels like we put the cart before the horse here. Um, 
Having said that, please, uh, I, I don't know whether you can answer this, but I've certainly been told that there's some legislation within the uh, province that once the lines are run, rural water and sewer lines are run, and there um, that the province has some rules around uh, making sure that there's no separate, that there's an expectation provincially uh, for hookup. Um, which may in itself cause some issues moving down the road. Can anybody confirm or deny that information that I've been given? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, um, I'll ask Antoine Remp, uh, Director of Environmental Services, to speak a bit. However, once once the the lines are in, there is an expectation to to utilize it, and there's also an expectation to operate and maintain that line. Um, Antoine, perhaps you can speak about any provincial requirement or, or obligation that will exist uh, once the line is in and operable. Thank you, uh, CEO Doyle. Through the chair to Councillor Grandison. My understanding, and I would probably rely on our regulatory group to really get to the bottom of this, but th there's two different services. We have sewer, and we have water. So the moment that we have a service available, we have to make sure as the operations group to, we have to make sure that the parameters are met. So we provide potable water and we deal with the wastewater. Now, are we restricted in only having one stream instead of two? I I don't know if, there, if that's a clear the request from AP, for example, and maybe our regulatory group could jump in there, but I, I can't say for sure. But we do have a mandate to make sure that even if we have a system that is functioning, but nobody is connected to it, we have to maintain it and make sure it stays operational. So it's, it's definitely adding some operating costs to it, regardless of how many people connect to it. Uh, so I don't know if that really answers your question. But. Well, it, it does and it doesn't. And I, 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 I'm smart enough to understand that when the system's there, we have to maintain water flow, so on and so forth. And, and I get that part. And we have lift stations and everything else to make sure that we maintain an equalization and pressure. Um, it, it just, again, I go back to the cart before the horse. When I put in the water and sewer in uh, Fort Mackay back in the 80s, one of the things we discovered in our first winter was an education process that had to occur. There, there, are, there are many lessons learned um, within our own region that I would have assumed we would have tapped into those lessons learned to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes that others have made in, in the implementation of a water and sewer project. I know that um, some of the elders, for example, in Fort Mackay that had been, lived their entire lives without a pressurized water system, you know, they'd go out to their trap lines in the winter and, and shut the propane off because nobody taught them not to. And the understanding between freeze-ups and so on and so forth. So that was an education process and uh, certainly can't be held, uh, the, the residents can't be held accountable if they've got no experience and no understanding. So. You know, I think implementing a project of this size also requires an education component uh, to support the residents to make sure that they, one, understand how to use the systems um, and, you know, the consequences, for example, of shutting off the propane when you go out in the bush for two months uh, to make their living and follow up on their trap lines and stuff, that there are consequences to that. And if, if they don't know that, then they can't be held accountable. Like, I mean, there are some people that have lived their entire lives without a pressurized water system. So I'm hoping that somewhere along the line, there's been an education process for all of our residents uh, to ensure success for both the residents and the municipality. I know that's not such a question as much as... <laughs> Of, a, of an education process that I think has to occur if it hasn't. Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, thank you for that. And we, we've certainly noted it. And there there has been many, I guess there's been some comments and questions along rural water and sewer that I'm aware of uh, through the project life cycle, just like that. And understanding, um, I guess, 
our residents fully aware of what this actually means when it's all said and done. I believe um, there's been many, I guess, engagements in open houses that would have explained all that. Um, however, there's still it's still a massive project out there, and it's I think it's something we have to keep our, keep our minds on as we keep moving forward and ensure that the residents are as informed as we possibly can make them. Um, thank you, uh, Jamie, for that. Um, so based on my experience, uh, I'm going to make this comment that open houses, if, if a person doesn't know what question to ask, they're not going to ask the question because they don't know they need to ask it. So it, it becomes a much more complicated issue than open houses. I, I honestly believe it's a door-to-door -door educational process that has to be undertaken, whether it's the municipal staff members in those communities or whatever that looks like. But I. I, I certainly think that with the investment and, and for both the residents and the municipality, we want to make uh, absolute sure that we're as successful as we, we possibly can be. Through the chair to Councillor Grenison, thank you for that. And throughout the process, there was that door-to-door -door knocking and having conversations with folks, and they'll continue to do that. Um, I wouldn't know the exact details, um, but we, we provided things like... Um, homeowner guides, things like that. And we'll have more educational items as they move forward. I, I guess um, if Matthew Harrison's on the line or um, any of the communications team that would have been dealing with some of this, if you have any details that I've missed or, or you'd like to share, please do. Um, but to close out my portion, I do believe there's extensive engagements and, and communication to residents throughout the whole process. Thank you. Three uh, of the chair to... Uh Councillor uh, Randison. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, exactly what the uh, the CEO has said. Uh, I know that uh, working with the Indigenous and Rural Relations team, there's been uh, quite a bit of an engagement. Um, and we're certainly looking for that more one-on-one -on -one and explanations as well. That's certainly to come a more extensive engagement campaign as well. Uh, there's been a home ownership guide. So it's certainly on our radar. It's certainly something that we're, uh, we're working hand in hand with other departments, not just IRR, but of course with, with engineering and with environmental services to, to ensure that we address all the concerns and the issues. Thank you. Okay. Fingers crossed and moving forward because I know that uh, back in the 80s, we did a lot of that too, and we still had quite a number of challenges. So it, it became much more of a of uh, in-depth process and again uh, recognizing that when somebody's lived 70 years of their life without a pressurized water system what we would consider normal um, based on our lifestyles may be completely abnormal to the other individual and we have to make sure that everything possible is done to bridge that gap for everybody to be successful so thank you very much uh, through the chair to Councillor Granison it's uh it's Dennis Morgan. I just want to add that um, yeah, we've done a lot of uh, engagements and we've provided lots of information and we're always available for further consultation if necessary. Uh, for example, we are reconnecting again next week with, uh, with a group in Compton to sit down and uh, with those folks to our teams and uh, give them an overview uh, of the program and what they, uh, what they need to do for the hookups and to be there to answer any further questions. So uh, if groups approach us, then we always make ourselves available to, to provide that clarity, and we'll continue to do that um, to the end of this uh, this program. So, thank you, Council McGrath. Thank you, uh, True to Chair, and uh, yes, it's a uh, it's been painful. So, so what, I, what I will say uh, as a counselor in the last uh, eight years is that uh, there's been all these questions back and forth this morning. In fact, I believe there's a program for any resident to uh, amortize their hookups over and, and it can actually transfer over to the next year. There's been an extensive amount of work done with the hookups and velocity is like any pipeline. You have to have it or not you'll have a whole bunch of dust and nothing works. I guess my question to uh, through the chair, to uh, the project team, when we talk about flood mitigation and roar water and sore, roar water and sore is a, a bare necessity that uh, we've neglected for, I don't know, my uh, my four decades and it's been talked about the same thing with flood mitigation. In the spirit of that, and in the spirit of cost, 
how come we don't uh, look at these projects as uh, like any other project that can be done day and night to get a completion? And certainly the cost of the projects uh, certainly will go down because apples to apples, I guess, uh, when people are bidding jobs and they're only using their equipment uh, 40% of the time, 6% of that cost gets passed on to the taxpayer. So uh, I guess going back to the, what restricts us as a municipality to take these co capital projects that are so integral to all of what we do, any strap plan we've ever made, why don't we do them uh, double shift and get them done? Through the chair to Cust McGrath, um, if I understand your question correctly, uh, I think you're asking about whether or not we have um, more work or longer days or hours or days. Is that correct? Well, my 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 question, and I apologize to uh, all the administration for my uh, lengthy trying to explain myself. When we have projects like flood mitigation and raw water and sewer that have been on the books for decades. No matter what, we're going to have to do them as a municipality because they're just the core services, the bare necessities. Why don't these projects be done uh, in, in a fashion where instead of uh, an eight-hour work date are done round the clock to uh, to bring them to completion? Well, what restricts us, I guess, uh, through the chair, what restricts us as a municipality to just day shift the jobs? No different than how we've done the provincial jobs to about a tune of uh, $100 million.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, Councilor uh, McGrath, are you still with us? Do you still have your question? Uh, while we're waiting for Councilor McGrath, Councilor McGrath to uh, reconnect with us, uh, Councilor Boussier. Yeah, th thank you, Mayor Bowman. Through the chair to Dennis. Dennis, um, you may have to uh, put up with me for a few minutes while I vent here because I know you weren't part of this back in 2013. But we sat around chambers in 13 and we were told by some folks administration that, or I was told, all I, at that time there was a thousand homes in the rural. All 1,000 had the capacity to take pipe water and sewer. All 1,000 people were gonna pay to hook up and everybody was gonna be happy. And it was, I think at the time, and Councillor Stroud can probably correct my mistakes or my errors, that it was gonna be 190 million. I think I said at the time, we'll probably be north of 500 million and closer to a billion if we're, if we're honest with the public. So I, I guess my questions to you are, as of today, how many people have the capacity to take pipe water and sewer in the rural? Do we have that number yet? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Boussier, um, I'm not sure that we have that exact number, uh, but I can certainly confirm that. Okay. Um, do we know how many of the folks, because I do know some folks that live in, in the rural, and they're telling me they really have no intention of hooking up to the system. Um, do we have any kind of uh, idea of who has committed to the system? Through the Chair to Councilor Boussier, uh, once we put the water and sewer um, ready for hookups, then it's up to the resident to contact uh, contact the contractor to do their hookup, but we don't, uh, we just, it's a program that's going to be for, uh, you know, through a five year period. And uh, we don't have a, we just take the numbers as they come in or the requests as they come in, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't have a set number per se of uh, how many will be requesting hookups. Okay, so I guess the frustrating part for us is, and, and again, I don't know if the information that was shared to me seven or eight years ago was incorrect purposely or, or they just didn't know, but um, let's say at the end of the day, only 50% of the folks sign up. Is, does the system function properly? Through the chair to Councillor Boucher, um, we've, we've talked about uh, the number of people once they're hooked up that will determine the functionality of the system. Uh, of course, if it's, uh, it may require um, further maintenance if, if the numbers aren't there, per se. Um, and then, of course, it will become an operating expense. Um, do, we, do we have a price tag? And... Uh, where I guess yeah do we do we have a price tag on on this project? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Boussier, uh, currently um, are you referring to the program itself or just the the, just the entire project, Dennis? What this is going to cost, and that includes running it from the property line to the to the individual homes fixing their landscaping, fixing their driveway, if we, the purchase of the land um, to make this happen, all costs associated with running this rural water and sewer. I, we were told, and Councillor Stroud or Councillor McGrath may correct me, I think the total bill at one time was 190 million and we're supposed to be running at uh, full force in 2021. And Through I know, I, go ahead. Sorry, through the chair to Councillor Boucher, uh, the total budget to date is three hundred and fifty million six hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and that includes the cost to mitigate any damages to the properties in the rural after we run the services to their property to their home. 
through the chair to counter Bouchier, that includes the design construction and the service connection piece. The service connection also, uh, part of that uh, program, of course, is the uh, repairs to uh, two properties, with any damages during the connections. Are you comfortable with that price, Dennis? Through the chair to Councillor Bouchier, um, that's a tough question. Um, as of what I know today, I think you gave me your answer already. Um, just uh, I got a bunch more questions, but I'll uh, tune out for for one. But just one last one: um, Are we actually running water and sewer to Draper Road? Through the chair to Councillor Bouchier. Um, no, we currently aren't. Is is the plan to? Through the chair to Councillor Bouchier that uh, we don't have any immediate plans that was removed from the rural water sewer servicing uh, in 2020. Sorry, Dennis, what was that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Bouchier. That portion was removed from the rural water sewer servicing in 2020 or 2021, I think. Oh, okay. I have more, but I'll uh, hang up for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Boussier. Councilor Grandison? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. I just wanted to uh, clarify uh, my verbiage or, or the words I used. I, I used the words uh, don't know any better earlier and, and I hope people can understand my, my intentions here are um, to just make sure that all parties um, are fully aware of the dynamics of a new system. So if I, if I use the wrong verbiage, I humbly apologize. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Gratison. Councilor Cardinal. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair to uh, Dennis. I, 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 Dennis, I, I guess um, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, um, Fort Fitzgerald is involved with the rural water sewer stuff, right? And uh, if so, what what uh, is there a, a amount allocated for uh, Fort Fitzgerald as well as... Uh, it, it, with the sewer and water system, is there even a sewer and water system hooked up at that those that that uh, community? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Cardinal, uh, Fort Fitzgerald is not a part of the rural water sewer servicing program. Okay, um, I guess that would be my next question. Since they are a part of the regional municipality, I think that maybe I can. Uh, formally request uh, from uh, mayor and council and uh, engineering department in your your behalf there Dennis to maybe look into next steps moving forward and I'll visit the community and see how maybe we can both visit the community I just thought I'd put that out there thanks thank you council thank you thank you council cardinal council walkman Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, Kendrick took one of the questions away there about Fort Fitzgerald. Thanks, Councillor. Um, the question I have, is there um, any upgrade? I don't see any upgrades here uh, proposed of, you know, upgrades for the water and sewer and uh, even a booster pump house in Fort Mackay for the, you know, the next coming couple of years. Is there anything in the project that uh, you guys are looking at? Through the chair to Councillor Walkman, um, the, the rural water sewer servicing um, is not, uh, Fort Mackay is not part of the program. Um, the rural water sewer servicing program is for our seven uh, our communities. Okay, so the um, how can we look at the water and sewer system in Fort Fitzgerald and also in Fort Mackay? Uh, through the chair, Councilor Walker, we can work with our um, uh, environmental services uh, group and we can certainly undertake to uh, do an assessment on the, on the systems that are in Fort Mackay. Okay, yeah, um, thanks. 
being that said, um, there will be some upgrades that'll be needed there soon. So if we can get that maybe on the list or priority for both communities, that would be great, Dennis. I think uh, I can, uh, Councilor Walkman, I think we can, uh, as a council, ask for a feasibility study. So what we can do, we can further direct uh, engineering after we do that. Um, we can take that upon ourselves, I think, to get that done. And okay, do thank that. you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Stroud? <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and through uh, to Dennis. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dennis. Uh, my understanding is uh, when we first were doing the water and sewer that there was uh, petitions and uh, surveys done to ensure that each community was over 65% for hookups. Uh, this is what was driving uh, the piped water and sewer. Also, uh, the cost of uh, some of the residents, for example, their sewer pickup, sewer pump outs were like $250 just for uh, a sewer pump out, and some of them had to have them twice a month. Uh, the bylaw, my understanding, also states that within five years of this system uh, going in place, that there will be no potable system, and the cost for a resident that is not hooked up will be atrocious. Uh, to get a private uh, company to haul uh, in water and haul out sewer as we've been in that situation previously in the rural. Uh, it's also my understanding that the water and sewer lines have been brought to the boundaries of the Fort McMurray 468 First Nation. Is that correct, Dennis? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Strell. Um, I'll defer to Kasia Khan. Kasia is our program manager for the update to the team. Thank you, Dennis. Good morning. And um, through the chair to Council Stroud, yes, the answer is yes. The, uh, the first, first Nation connection points are established uh, on the force main running from uh, Gregoire Lake State to Anzac. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia. Uh, I think that's very important that uh, that all the people along 881 are hooked up. Uh, I know uh, Chippewan Prairie First Nation is also part of the program. So in John VA, uh, it's a low pressure system, right, Kashif? They will still be on tanks? That's correct, uh, Council Stroud. Yeah. Uh, uh, John VA is a low pressure system and trickle fill water system. Thank yeah, you. the same as what they had uh, offered for Draper. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yes, I will say that uh, Conklin is asking for a meeting. Uh, they're still challenged on, I know packages have gone out, and uh, but they still query me quite a bit on it. And I'm pleased that uh, engineering is going out uh, next Thursday for a sit down meeting and, you know, fully explain to the residents uh, what is required. And for example, they, there's questions like even, you know, uh, they can pay for it 20, over 25 years. And some of that information just doesn't seem to be filtering to the residents. So I totally appreciate that you're going out and meeting with Conklin residents. Uh, the Métis local has I believe 101 members and uh, they are, you know, want to understand the full process so that they can get their members hooked up. Thank you. Councillor Ball. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair to Dennis. Um, just a, a little bit more clarity on the service connection on the private lots, in particular, uh, the work on the private lands. Uh, it's my understanding it's about a 49 million, just a hair less than $49 million, about 850-ish lots, um, which works out to roughly 5,700 per lot. Is the intention that there will be a cost recovery on this, or are we uh, borning the full cost to, as the municipal or the municipality? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, I'll defer your question to Kasha uh, with regards to the recovery and the costs. 
Thank you, Dennis. To the chair, to Councillor Ball, uh, the recovery is through the service connection fee of uh, 16,000 and 10,000 that every lot owner will pay uh, as a revenue to municipality. So each lot owner in Sapri Creek will pay $10,000 over uh, 25 years or one in one or in one payment, and the the lot owners in all other uh, hamlets will pay 16,000, and that's the uh, the revenue that municipality will uh, receive uh, versus the 49 or 48 million total expenditure or service correction. Morning, thank, thank you. Thank you. Morning, Ronnie. Okay, thank you. So over time, we would recover that 49 million dollars. To the chair, to Council Ball, no, not. 49 will not be recovered only the $16,000 will be paid so roughly if you count total revenue stream that will be recovered within 25 years will be around 13 million dollars thank you okay um, further to that if we're doing work on the on private lands uh, if there's a failure in the system past the, the CC, which is on the private lot, who's going to be responsible for making those repairs? Through the chair to Council Ball, this is Kashif Khan again. Uh, uh, the contractor is being hired by the homeowner. Contractor is pricing the work for in, to include two years warranty. After the warranty, homeowner will be responsible from the stub at the property line to the building. It will not be municipality doing the repair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Boussier. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Um, just, uh, I'll go back to the, the answer that was just uh, given to Councillor Ball. Through the chair to engineering, what if the contractor that the homeowner hires decides to close doors and leave town? within two years who's on the uh, who's on the hook for the repairs assuming the system fails sorry well, the this only reason got... the only reason I ask is we've seen it with the wildfire we had a bunch of contractors come up here build houses under different names and leave town and no one's no one's available to to do the warranty stuff to the chair, this is Kashif Khan again. Thank you for this question. It's a very good question because it gives opportunity to explain the mechanism uh, uh, we have created to protect taxpayers' dollars. For example, no uh, front-end payment will be made to contractor. Un the first payment to the contractor will be made when the system is up and running. So uh, the taxpayers is protected with this uh, mechanism. Next can, comes uh, the can, protection can, of... Can I just interrupt for a minute? Thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah. So the contractor, if he's not being paid in full, I'm assuming they're going to have to have some fairly deep pockets to fund this if only partial payment is being given to them. Are we limited at the number of contractors? And maybe if I had a little contracting service and I didn't have the funds or the means, how would I take on some work if if I needed the the payment to complete work or or at least try to start the job? Thank you for the question uh, to the chair, to Council Bouzier. Yes, uh, this has been uh, discussed as an identified risk when we were discussing this mechanism. We discuss various options. How can the taxpayers will be protected? Uh, taxpayers' money will be protected. How contractor is protected for the payment? Uh, this uh, the bylaw of the rural servicing allows us to pay contractor without the the without the without the uh, directly to the contractor. For example, if the work is completed, the work is. Uh, work is completed and is certified by our safety code the payment will be made directly to contractor by municipality under the bylaws the contractor doesn't have to get the payment through the homeowner so that's the protection instituted in this payment mechanism thank you okay um 
what I mean you have some larger lots some acreages that we need to service and whether it's a ten thousand dollar payment or a sixteen thousand what are the actual cost to run the the infrastructure necessary for these houses to to take on the pipe water and sewer if, if we're talking a two or a four or five acre lot and i get it the the setback of the house and and where the services come into the house now impacts but and if we're digging up roads and driveways like do we have any idea of the costs for these acreages To the chair, to Council Bouzier, Kashif Khan again. Yes, we did. Uh, we did uh, an estimate uh, of these lots by visiting those in 2019, in which a contractor and a consultant went to a lot to lot and uh, got that uh, uh, engineering estimate at that time. Thank you. Okay, so if if, if I own a house at Sapri or. Gregoire Lake or Anzac, is there a set amount I have to work with from the municipality to hire a contractor? Like I understand I pay the ten or sixteen thousand bucks and the city's gonna pick up the other tab. But as a homeowner, is is my expense kind of unlimited? Kashif Khan again through the chair to Council Bouzier. Uh, the engineering estimate that we have prepared uh, provides us the guideline how much it will cost to uh, cost uh, what will be the cost of each house based on that based on the and also based on the prevailing prices an application committee reviews the court when it arrives and uh, we compare the costing uh, as per the current market trend our previous estimate and then we uh, we uh, allow or we uh, we approve the courts. Thank you. So, what about post COVID? We've seen a significant increase in inflation. Who's going to pick up the tab for that? Because I, I'll just take a guess, and I'm assuming if, if my work was quoted in 2000 and 19 or 2020 and it and it hasn't happened yet i'm pretty confident that the price to do the work now has significantly increased so as a homeowner the, the rm tells me you've got 70 grand and the contractor comes back and tells me well inflation it's at 100 grand who's picking up that the difference because we know the quote won't be honored after two years or after a year to the chair, to Council Bouzier, thank you for, for that very point. Uh, I was not explaining it. That 2019 pricing is reviewed under the current market trend by the three application committee members. And we adjust th th those prices to approve a, the most recent quote. For example, if somebody is quoting in 2022, we, all, all, we do have 2019 estimate but we do know the current market pricing and we compare those and we adjust those to reflect that. So any additional uh, uh, pricing due to COVID or market trend or inflation will be the municipality's cost, like in any capital projects. Thank you. Okay, so have, have we actually hooked anybody up in Sapri Creek? And paid a, paid a contractor. I'm just I'm kind of interested where we are with pricing. Mr. Ball, Councillor Ball indicated that we had allocated so many dollars to each lot, and yet I know what it costs to run some servicing to my house after the fire, and I live on just on a regular city lot, and it was certainly a lot more than I think what we de dedicated to each acreage lot and that was in 2017 so have we actually paid a contractor to run service to do just one lot in sapri that we're that we know of thank you for the question to the chair yes we do have hooked up 52 connections in sapri creek and we have paid uh 
all the payments requested by the contractor so far. Thank you. And what was the cost for the 52 houses? You don't mind me asking. The cost that we paid uh, are within uh, the, the budget numbers that we have presented. Can you share? If, details, if details are required, we can provide you uh, through a briefing note or some other means. Is it, is, okay, is it possible to get that briefing note today? I just have concerns where this rural water and sewer cost is going. I just, I'm not sure if we're being provided accurate information just based on a couple conversations with people I know that own houses out at Sapri. So if you could get the briefing note, that would be good. And uh, I have a couple more questions, but I think Councillor Grandison's waiting to ask. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Boussier. Councillor Grandison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. Um, my brain has been taxed again to remember the question that I was going to ask, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, I know, sometimes my brain doesn't work very well, Councillor Stroud. Um, Councillor Stroud had indicated, and, and I absolutely agree with her, that in the old days, the uh, cost of sewer suck out was tremendous, 250, et cetera. Um, but the municipality subsidized it at some point, did they not? From what I was told, that the municipality was subsidizing sewer suck out in the last couple of years before, or currently? currently so that is no longer the case in terms of the cost but it, it was at one time and it was outrageous councillor Stroud is 100 percent the water delivery charges were were minimal but the sewer evacuation was you could have families spending a thousand dollars a month quite easily and, and that's pretty accurate um, unfortunately I'm going to shut my mic off now because at this exact moment in time I can't remember the question I was going to ask so and I forgot to write it down. Fair enough. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Grandison. Do you have any other questions uh, in regards to rural water and sewer, Councillor Boussier? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bowman. And certainly, I'm, I'm not trying to beat up on Dennis or Kashif, um, Kasif, I'm, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. I, I guess I'm just confused if if I own a property out at the rural, and the municipality tells me that I have this much money to spend and I can't find a contractor that's willing to do it for that price, what are my options as a homeowner that's ready to tie into pipe water and sewer? Through the Chair, Councillor Bush here. Um, just for some clarity, we don't tell the contractor, we don't give them a price. What uh, the homeowner calls the contractor, gets the estimate from the contractor. Uh, we then review that estimate through the applications committee uh, and sometimes that may take some, just uh, just some review to make sure that the scope is clear and that uh, that they meet all the requirements for the homeowner. Uh, and then we just uh, we just move ahead with uh, uh, with the contractor or with the, getting back to the uh, homeowner to move ahead with the uh, with the contractor for the estimated price. And on your previous question, if I may, to date uh, with regards to the hookups we've done in uh, Sapphire Creek, we've uh, we've spent approximately 1.5 million dollars 1.5 million for approximately for 52 homes through chair council Boucher, that's correct okay thank you just going back to your my other question dennis so if the committee that you have rejects my contractor's price and then i go to l's contracting service and they reject that and then i go to councillor ball's and they say, we just can't do it for that price. I guess my question, what happens? Uh, how many contractors do I need to have provide a quote? And uh, the only reason I know, as soon as, we've, soon as everybody finds out the RM is on the uh, hook for the, for the servicing, there's probably going to be a bit of an uplift to these contracts. So if I strike out three times, what happens? Through the chair to Councillor Boucher, uh, we don't foresee that happening. We haven't had that. We've we've, uh, we've been getting estimates, as I said, we've been getting estimates from the contractors. We're reviewing them, and uh, so far there's been no contract or refuse. It's just been a um, 
meeting to understand the, the clarity for, for their estimates based on the information we have. And of course, uh, we come to an agreement to go back to the homeowner and then the contracts proceed. So okay. uh, we haven't had those issues. Okay, and just um, hopefully this is the last question. Um, now, some of the infrastructure that's currently on the rural homeowners' properties, is the equipment that's there now, because I think some folks are still going to have tanks and, and septic tanks, right? Sure, that's correct. Okay. So if, if, that, if that equipment is archaic and we got to upgrade that, again, the RM will, that's part of the contractor price and we'll pick up that work as well if we have to replace the infrastructure? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Bouchier, I believe that's uh, part of that uh, estimate. I'll ask Kashif to confirm that. Thank you, Dennis. Kashif, again, uh, to the chair, to Councillor Bouchier. Yes, the equipment, uh, which is tank pumps, they they will be replaced under the price or the quotes or uh, under the municipal dollars. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Councilor Boussier. Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair, through the kind encouragement of my colleagues over on the other side of the room, I brought out my pad so I can remember to write questions down because I forget nowadays. So just first off, following up on one of the comments that uh, Councilor Boussier made. So in, in my past life, I uh, was administering a grant on behalf of the municipality for the installation of septic tanks. And in doing so, um, sometimes communities would uh, select a favored contractor and probably through that program, 50% of the installations failed. Um, I appreciate the fact that you've written in for a warranty. Now, just again, so if a favored contractor is approved, they've met all of the conditions and this committee approves them and through the installation process, um, they're not doing an appropriate job. How is that being monitored? Like, are, do we have people that are there during the installation or we just go before the ground is backfilled and ensured that it was done? Because a lot of the problem occurred with the installation of these tanks uh, with, uh, with the uh, ground uh, not being built up and the tanks sank or, or collapsed because the, uh, the groundwork wasn't being done properly. So uh, I guess just following up on Councillor Bussier's question of monitoring the installation so that we don't have uh, difficulties after the fact. Through the that chair to Councillor Grandison, um, during the installation process, uh, of course, all the, um, all the installations have to be inspected by our safety codes folks. Um, as part of that uh, installation and the uh, permit process. Okay, so then we should cover the uh, two-year warranty period when we have our people ensuring that they've been installed correctly and the, the base work was being done for the piping. And, and I'm assuming all of the estimates for if we go across a driveway that's being driven over that all of the estimates for ground penetration for frost have all been calculated, et cetera, correct? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, that would be correct. Thank you, sir. Second question: Where in here is there is there part of this, including the removal of uh, of tanks? Uh, where's the responsibility and the expectation for the existing hardware that's in the ground from an environmental perspective? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Grandison, um, I'll defer to Kashif. Uh, um, for the removal. Thank you, Dennis. Kashif, again, uh, through the chair to Council Grandison, the, the, the removal of tank is included in the, in the pricing. Contractor is, when we research about how these tanks will be removed, we found that uh, the tanks can be filled with suitable fill in place. So that's the amount we are paying to contractor to to uh, to fill the tank in place. Thank you. That's the amount will be paid to contractor. Thank you. 
So the, so the tanks will be evacuated and filled in place and based on Alberta environmental rules, that's acceptable. That's what I hear you say? That's correct to Councils and Grandison. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Boussier. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor Bowman, through the chair. Um, so he just quickly did the uh, numbers there. So basically, Sapri Creek averaged about 30 grand. So my concern is, I know some folks out there, and their quotes are around 80 grand per lot. And I'm hearing some in Anzac and Gregoire might be closer to 100. So do we have any risk mitigation plans in place for for situations like this I, I guess i just i'm certainly not an engineer and uh, i don't know how to do your job but some of the numbers i'm getting from residents are certainly far higher than the the thirty thousand just quoted and if anything sapri may be an easier fix than um and Zach and Gregoire, because I'm sure there's going to be more and more of an uplift when we have contractors driving further and further from town to, to do work. So maybe sometime in the next week or two, we can get a briefing note on where we are with this, because I, I just, I'm not sure if we got a full understanding and our CRCOA want, CAO wants to speak to it. So I'll just turn my light off. Through the chair to Councillor Bouchier, thanks for, for the comments and, and the questions. Um, we are planning to do a, a briefing for Council on rural water and sewer, much like we did with, with flood mitigation. Um, the unfortunate thing is we just didn't have a lot of time before budget to get that done. And a lot of the questions uh, that we are being, uh, that we're asking and, and answering now will certainly be covered off by, by one of those presentations as well. And there may be more uh, arise from that, but uh, Council will get a full briefing on rural water and sewer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dancing Chief. Uh, just before we go on to the rest of your presentation, Dennis, um, just a quick question. All the numbers are going back and forth and uh, communication with residents. Are the residents aware uh, how much the municipality is providing budgeting for this, this upgrade per uh, property? Uh, through the chair, through the chair. Um, I'm not sure if I quite understand your question. Are you um, are you asking about each individual lot or the yeah? So the level? people, what we're paying um, for their service on their lot, um, basically the we talked about up to thirty grand we've paid for different ones in Sapri or wherever we put in properties now. But are the residents aware of the the cap limit? Like uh, Councillor Boussier had mentioned, if you go to three different contractors and you don't get you're not getting the right numbers. Like are they have the Residents been notified on what that amount's going to be for them going forward? Through the chair, uh, to the chair, uh, the residents do get to see what the uh, what the agreed amounts are. Thank you, Councillor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, they get to see just to follow up on the mayor's question. They get to see the agreed amount, so what the contractor's getting versus what the actual cost is versus what their contributions. They get all of that information for each resident. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Grandison, um, I'll defer to Kasha, but a part of the applications committee process, I'm pretty sure that the cost goes back to the, or the homeowner does get the uh, agreed upon cost. Uh, Kasha, if you could confirm that for me, please. Thank you, Dennis. Kashif Khan again through the chair to Councillor uh, Grandison. Uh, we have made it very clear and we are communicating with people in each community that what they have to pay and what uh, municipality will pay. For example, we have kept the two revenues or two uh, costing as a two separate streams. The money, uh, the service connection fee of 10,000 or 16,000, which ho homeowner will pay to municipality will be a separate stream of money or revenue coming independent of the money being dispensed on homeowner's behalf to the contractor by municipality. Okay. So it is very clear, make no confusion. The two revenue streams are not interlinked to create confusion. Thank you. 
Good. I, I think with the mayor's question of wanting to make sure that all of our residents know what the cost of this, see, in, in my mind, I think it goes further. I think all of our residents need to understand the total cost of this project and then the individual costs of hookup to each lot. I think that would val be valuable information. So again, just to follow up to the mayor's question, thank you. I think you've answered it and I, I hope we all understand it. Councilor Broussier? Yes, sorry, Mayor Bowman. Um, just one last question, um, and I know I said that last time. If, um, if I'm a homeowner and I take the payment plan and uh, I move, is there something on title for, for folks that are selling houses out there to know that uh, if I buy Councilor Granitson's house in Sapri Creek that I still have to pay another $15,000 in installments. How do we protect uh, the public that way? Is it registered on title? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Boucher. Um, I'll defer that to Kashif, or I'm not sure, Kashif, if you have the answer to that, or if it's part of our bylaw or legal. Kashif Khan, I will say my, my understanding uh, when we were discussing this risk with our legal, and legal can add on to it, my understanding is this, uh, like in any uh, house or a real estate deal, a, a, a lawyer puts forward an accounting statement saying that this state, this money will be owed from uh, these utility bills, and at the same time, he will be aware, uh, he will be able to tell the new homeowner what is left to be paid for rural servicing. So the lawyer will provide that information to the new homeowner. Uh, my legal team can tell us if there is something to be done on the title or not. Thank you. Through the chair back to Council Grandison. One thing I, I want to clarify, we, we can't say for sure that any legal representation is going to advise any homeowner on what's on title or not. Um, it, it's my understanding that this will be on title. However, uh, Chris Davis, senior, senior um, legal counsel is also on the call who is part of the, this program. Chris, could you clarify that piece of uh, information, please? Apparently he's not on the line. Um, back to the chair, I'll confirm that information before the day's out. I'm sure it's there, however, I just want, don't wanna speak at a turn. Thank you. Th through the chair to Sierra, what information is where? Through the chair to Council Bushier that the information about the grant program is registered on title. Okay, so legal is not on the, obviously not on the call? I believe he is. I just don't know if he's having technical difficulties because he, he is uh, participating. I just haven't can't find him on the screen. Okay, so maybe he can chime in. We'll just move on and then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Boussier. Uh, so, Dan, you could continue with the uh, engineering department report. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bowman. Okay, <clears throat> as shown on the table above, um, this, my apologies, I will be presenting this uh, 2022 proposed capital budget for our engineering department as a sponsor. As shown on the table above, we're requesting for $12.4 million in 2022, uh, $28.1 million in 2023, and $16.9 million in 2024. The 2022 requested funds of 12.4 million are for three projects under the public facilities category. Um, it's a waterline extension, Rio Martin Drive construction, deep utilities and culverts rehabilitation construction, and Grayling Terrace drainage 
construction. Uh, recreation and culture, a uh, project under recreation and culture category is for the Fort Mackay Community Center, and that's $3 million. Um, item number three, transportation. Projects under the transportation category uh, is the Rural Egress Road Anzac uh, construction, the Rural Egress Road Jambier, Garden Lane and River Bend Close Road Rehabilitation, and Fort Mackay Range Road 1109 Improvements Design and Construction. Detail on each project will follow as I go through each slide. The Fort Mackay Community Center the project is to address the interest from the Fort Mackay community to develop a community center. The project will provide a facility with a capacity to host multiple events. The project will provide a gathering place for the community. In 2022, we are requesting $3 million. In 2023, our request is $7.5 million. 2022, RFT is planned for Q1 of 2022. Design is complete. Land has been registered and acquired. And in 2023, we'll continue with construction. This slide shows a view of the proposed community center. Rural Egress Road Anzac Construction. This project is for the construction of an egress road for the community of Anzac. As a result of the May 2016 wildfire event, the need for this project was highlighted for the above referenced community. The egress road will provide a secondary egress road out of the community and onto the major road networks. We are requesting $100,000 for 2022. Uh, our 2023 request will be $5 million. 2024 will be $4.9 million. And 2025 to 2027, we have no request. For 2022, uh, tender is planned for Q4 2022 after receiving land acquisition, which is currently in progress, along with the design. Uh, design is in progress approximately 20% and planned to be completed by September of 2022. Note that the $100,000 request here is to enter a theoretic to enable us to post the tender. Uh, in 2023, we'll include tree clearing, excavation, topsoil, soil analysis to complete to the sub base. And then of course in 2024 will be uh, completion. This slide shows the proposed egress road for ANZAC of approximately 3.4 kilometers. Uh, next we have the rural egress road, uh, John VA construction. The rural egress road <clears throat> The project is for the construction of an egress road from the community of Jambier. As a result of the May 2016 wildfire event, the need for this project was highlighted for the above referenced community. The egress road will provide a secondary egress road out of the community and onto the major road networks. We are requesting $100,000 in 2022, $12.4 million for 2023, and $12 million for 2024. For 2022, the tender is planned for Q4 of 2022 after receiving land acquisition, which is currently in progress, along with uh, design. Design is in progress, again, approximately 20%, and planned to be completed by September of 2022. $100,000 we're requesting for 2022, again, is to enter a PREC and post a tender. Tender. 2023, we will continue with tree clearing, excavation, Field material, topsoil, soil analysis to complete up to the sub base, uh, and also to start bridge structure and culverts. And 2024, we will be requesting to complete uh, the project. This slide shows the proposed egress road for, drum, uh, for John V of approximately 4.3 kilometers. Garden Lane and River Bend Close Rehabilitation Construction. This project is for the upgrade of Garden Lane and River Bend Close uh, Road of approximately 1.4 kilometers. These roads will be upgraded to the current rural road standards. The scope also includes the additional benefits of mitigating existing drainage issues and eliminating dust issues brought forward by the residents. 
2022, we are requesting $3 million. 2023, $700,000. 2024 to 2027, we have no request uh, in those years. So 2022, tenders plan to be posted by Q1 of 22. Uh, the design is complete. Uh, 2022 also anticipate to do the subgrade and the first lift of asphalt and the ditching. In 2023, second lift of asphalt and complete any remaining minor work. This slide shows a proposed road rehabilitation of approximately 1.4 kilometers. Fort Mackay Range Road 1109 improvements, design and construction. This project is for design and construction of a local road from Fort Mackay Main Road to the end of the community center, which is on Range Road 1109. The scope also includes underground infrastructure such as water, storm, sewer, and sanitary lines. This project will provide all required infrastructure and provide safe access from Fort Mackay Road to the adjacent and future facilities, including the Fort Mackay Community Center. In 2022, we are requesting $300,000. And in 2023, we are requesting $2 million. In 2022, we plan to post an RFP for the design by Q1 of 2022. In 2023, tender plan for early Q1 of 2023 for construction. This slide shows a proposed road of approximately 300 meters from Fort Mackay Main Road to the end of the community center on Range Road 1109. Deep Utilities and Culverts Rehabilitation Construction. This project is for rehabilitation of deep utilities, water and sewer, the back alleys of Ross Haven Drive, and rehabilitation of bridge-sized culverts on Thickwood Boulevard and Confederation Way. The scope of work also includes replacement of deep utilities on the public utility lots between Romar Street and Roundell Place, and between Silver Tip and Simcoe Way. <laughs> This project will prevent failure of culverts and or malfunction of existing old water and sewer piping. We are requesting for 2022, $4 million. And 2023, $500,000. Tender is planned for or by Q1 of 2022 and currently design is ongoing and planned to be completed by the end of January, excuse me, by the end of February of 2022. Uh, 2023, of course, is the allocated to complete the project. This slide shows the location of the two bridge sized culverts on Thickwood Boulevard and Confederation Way and the deep utilities, the water and sewer on the back alleys of Ross Haven Drive and deep utilities on the public utility lots between Romar Street and Roundell Place and between Silver Tip Place and Simcoe Way. Water line extension, Rio Martin Drive construction. This project entails provision of a water line to the golf course located at the end of Rio Martin Drive. The existing water main at Ermine Crescent will be extended to the Fort McMurray Golf Club course. The project will provide the golf course with access to water. We are requesting in 2022, $1 million. The RFT is planned by Q2 of 2022 and the in-house design is ongoing. This slide shows a proposed waterline extension of approximately 700 meters. Grading terrace drainage construction. This project is to implement a permanent engineering solution to the occurrence of flooding of private properties in grading terrace caused by snow melt, typical spring runoff in the municipal reserve. The scope will include installation of stormwater sewer pipe catch basins manhole and construction of earth firm works to direct runoff away from the private properties. The project will address water drainage issues for the community of Grading Terrace. In 2022, we are requesting $900,000. Tender is planned by mid-March of 2022 to implement the permanent engineering solution. Design is complete and a temporary measure will be implemented 
be forceful enough to install sand bags as a burning system. This slide shows the project area uh, near Grading Terrace. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dennis. Um, before we go to questions, I have a quick question about the Ang Anzac Egress Road. Uh, how was that location selected? Uh, and was it community engagement or do you have that information? Uh, through the chair, through the chair. Uh, there were previous communications uh, held with the community and we have recently received a request to do further engagement uh, with uh, two groups in the uh, in Anzac and we'll be undertaking to do that um, as soon as time allows us uh, in the next uh, next coming uh, days or weeks. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Councillor Stroud. Moment, and thank you for the presentation, Dennis. Uh, I did want to raise some concerns and awareness on the egress road for Anzac. I totally understand that the project was initiated after the 2016 Horse River wildfire to provide an alternate egress road for emergencies and evacuation purposes. And I believe there was one public engagement in 2018 as per the briefing, which I attended. I do remember that some residents did not want the road to join up with the CNOC road as it, as it is an industry road and it is required for their own staff to evacuate. Was this engineering's understanding Uh, through the chair to Councillor Stroud, um, I am aware of the engagement that took place in 2018. Um, I also am aware of the fact that there were some um, RFPs that were out there, um, and I think they were um, also uh, resubmitted in 2019, as I understand it, um, and that include uh, that was was to be. Uh, uh, to have uh, more Indigenous uh, involvement as part of that submission that was uh, resubmitted, I believe, in 2019. And um, I'm not aware of anything that's happened since 2019. We've just been doing further engagement um, with regards to understanding where we go as of April 2021. Um, so our next steps, of course, again, will be to re-engage with the community to determine that preferred location as they, they do have some concerns. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, so we're now in 22, 2022. I attended a meeting in November of 2021, which was organized by the Will Lake Community Association and the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo. I thank the engineering department for zooming in virtually. From my understanding of the meeting in November, the engineering department was to have further consultation with the residents as the main concern was that the egress road now is going behind some homeowners properties, which they do not want. Uh, was this engineering's understanding at the meeting? Through the chair to Councillor Stroud. Um, when we went to that meeting, uh, those uh, concerns were brought forward and uh, we took it upon ourselves to re-engage uh, with them and um, of course we were just then waiting for timelines and since that um, Willow Lake community group have uh, also approached us so our next steps are to engage uh, with uh, with the uh, groups within uh, ANZAC. Thank you Dennis. Uh, this issue has been on Facebook causing dissension also you know with the homeowners concerned about an egress road be going behind their property because uh, it's a little harder for the municipality to monitor and uh, you know there will be uh, skidoos in the winter and uh, there's other machines in the summer and uh, that's that's their big concern. Uh, I, as per the briefing note I appreciate that you have option one there which, which uh, and I appreciate that engineering will continue conversations with both the Willow Lake Community Association Association, the Willow Lake Maiden Nation, and collaborate with the residents of Anzac. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Councillor Grandison. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair, so I, I looked at the rendering for the Fort Mackay Community Center, which is awesome. I, I guess I have one real simple question relating to that building. Will it be built in such a fashion that the community can actually use it? I, I'm sorry, that sounds very rude. Let me reframe that. I didn't mean it to be rude. Uh, we created a kitchen, for example, in Anzac that was so complicated the community couldn't use it. And I just want to ensure that this building is being designed and developed in such a way that it will be accessible and uh, meet the needs of the actual community. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Grandison, um, I'm not sure I have the answer to that about the use of it. Um, been asked to deliver on the project. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I, I can't answer that. Okay, well, perhaps it's something that we could just make sure that that uh, um, the use of the building will be accessible and and actually meet the needs of the community that may be outside of your scope, but I still think it's a reasonable question. Um, my second question is, so the golf course in Thickwood, how have they been getting the water to date? Have they been trucking it if there's no water line? Through the chair to Councillor Brandison, uh, yes, they've been trucking it since they've been there, and uh, this request came to the previous council for us to look into getting water to the golf course. Okay, so that will certainly be an appreciated upgrade, I'm certain, for all the users. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grandison. Councillor Ball? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair to Dennis. Um, I've got a pile of questions here, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to bounce all over the place. Um, and I'll, I'll stop and let Lance come, chime in and then take a breath and come back. <laughs> the uh, Fort Mackay Community Center, uh, just to start it off, I guess my question is, once I, I can appreciate a bunch of money is spent to date. Uh, once completed, who will be operating this facility? And once once it starts operations, uh, will we will we be also doing the operational expenditure moving from year to year? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, the request for us to construct this facility came from the uh, Fort Mackay Métis Nation. Um, we haven't been engaged in in the operations component of it. Um, but I would um, maybe look to Keith Smith. Um, typically, that would be turned over to our facilities group if, if it's the municipalities to operate. I'm not clear of uh, that ownership. Through the, through the chair to Councillor Ball, it's Jamie here. I'll, I'll chime in in a bit. Throughout the conversations, um, I guess, and the growth of this project, um, there was certainly the appetite for the city. Um, to run it much like they would another any other city asset. However, there, there may also present an opportunity uh, for it to be ran much like Center Fireplace or where we have a third party operator running it for us. We haven't uh, progressed that far in conversations. However, as it sits now, this will be a facility that's owned and operated by the RMWB. Okay, so I guess we'll figure that out as we move on. I mean, I know we, we, we issue grants to those arenas in the neighborhood of half a million to a million dollars a year, so depending on, on what their facility is. Um, some of the uh, projects that you had listed here, like uh, Jean Vier Road and, and uh, a few of them anyways, you had mentioned that the construction, or sorry, the design portion had been about 20% complete. Uh, where I'm, where I'm not seeing any uh, previous year costs, are those being done in house? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, no, it's um, it's be, it's been done in a in a different um, uh, project. I hope. So, it, in it, like just using Jean Vier as an as an example, the the road. Uh, you got a $24, $25 million project. Uh, are the engineering costs in the neighborhood of $3 million on that? Um, 
through the chair to Councillor Ball uh, today, I believe our costs to be around 1.5 million. And what what's the overall budget on that? Because it's portion, uh, you know, a portion of the cost for the overall expense of the build of the of the design. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, just give me a moment, I'll pull that up. Don't see those projects in here. I don't see those projects in here. The design ones. The design for these. The design for any of these. I don't see the design mm -hmm. costs for any of them. We should twenty-four million dollars. We've got bridges in this one. Should be twenty five million dollars. Oh, I get that. No, it was a year ago. No. Six miles. Six dollars used to be a lot. I know, but it's twenty five million dollars. Do you want to get that information and get yeah. back to us? We can move on to a few other questions. Yeah, I, I can continue. Ken? Is is Dennis still there or? Uh, yeah, third chair to Councillor Ball, the design for Anzac and John VA is one point nine million dollars. Collectively, okay. Um, for the job, that's just, correct. Yeah, just looking at the road uh, or the, the the little drawing there of the Jean Vier Egress Road, how many bridges are we building on that one? Because I, I believe it crosses the Christina, does it not? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, the best of my knowledge is one major bridge construction or structure, and there are two bridge size culverts. Okay. Uh, what else do I have? Um, the the golf course project. Um, I see you have a, a rough alignment. Looks pretty poker straight. Is there a cost sharing on that one with the golf course, or is that all a municipal expense? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, uh, that's a municipal expense request. Have we approached the golf course to look at a cost sharing? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, no, we have not. It was a request of the previous council for us to uh, investigate costs for getting water to the tenant. Are we going to look at talking to the <laughs> to the golf course? I mean, I, I can appreciate that they want to bring water down there, but looking back in history, that golf course was built, well, over 20 years ago, over 30 years ago, and it didn't have water then, and now it wants water now. So can you, can you investigate that for us and get back to us? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, um, investigate cost sharing is that correct yes please through the chair to council ball i guess that's something that we can undertake for sure thank you um, i'll give the mic up to lance here to sort myself out actually sorry uh council mcgrath thank you uh true to cheer it's almost uh, lunchtime. I don't want to be late for all the staff. I'm sure everybody's getting hungry. Uh, through the chair, I just uh, I take you off the the experience of others for a second. I'm talking about history, the present, Dennis. I know last year we had a bill of about through the chair. I think it was a little over 20 million by the time we built the temporary dams and bought in the pumps and stuff. I guess through the chair, I'm not sure how much the province and her, and her uh, good folks at the legislature got us. I don't think it was much, just like the water and sewer. But the question is, how much is in your budget this year, Dennis? And it might be operating, it might be captured someplace else. I know that there's a lot of silos where we put different funding envelopes and it's like dagger and cloak trying to figure it out when you don't work at the city. What is our cost this spring to do the temporary flood mitigation.
through the chair to Councillor McGrath. Uh, just give me a moment, I'll get that for you. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor McGrath, that uh, for the temporary efforts, uh, uh, it's 2.5 million. So, okay. Uh, and through the chair, I don't expect you to have these answers. I don't think it'd be fair for me to ask administration, but somewhere during lunch break, could we find out how much the province gave us to help us out with that endeavor? And I, I would imagine it would be starting before Patty's Day, uh, which is only a month away. So that's, that's the one question. The second one is just an observation I, I share with others. Because we've uh, taken some action uh, on previous councils on the SCRAC plan, the said bridge that you're talking about, the road alignment, that bridge will uh, serve as a catalyst to uh, connect Alberta and Saskatchewan. And, and when we get into the Transportation Committee, there's, uh, there's some links here that, uh, that certainly... It's, it's not spending good money after bad. It's actually setting us up in future generations for mobility, for people and goods. So just an observation I want to share with, uh, with uh, I, I guess, the future instead of talking about the past. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Councilor Boussier? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bowman, and through the chair to Dennis. Uh, Dennis, just to... Um, I guess maybe more for curiosity, just looking at the Grayling Terrace project. Now, I know those folks, because I know some people that live down in Gypsy and Garson. Um, so th their issue started just after the fire, I believe. And I, I wonder why it takes six years. And this is certainly not a reflection of, of the RM, I don't believe, or maybe it is. Um, just wondering why it's only been looked at now, when I, I know a few of these Houses have experienced significant water runoff from, from the Abisan Hill. I guess just, again, why s six years later we're just starting to pay attention? Is it just no one brought it forward to, to administration, or is it just we've been busy with other projects? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Boucher. Um, there was some... Uh, uh, loss of trees in that area, of course, um, during the 2016 wildfire. Uh, there were, those trees were removed as part of the uh, hazardous tree removal program. But I, uh, I believe that historically there have been issues there before, um, and there may have been some settlement that's gone on. But uh, we, since the loss of the vegetation there, of course, we identify that there's water that's been getting into people's property. So. Now we want to go in there to uh, to mitigate those uh, those uh, areas, of course, and that would uh, in, in the require of us to be doing some burning and some uh, connections to uh, to our storm system. But um, I, I do believe, and I can certainly track back to so far. But I, I think that historically there's been some issues back there uh, in previous years. Oh, okay, thank you. And then through the chair to our CEO or. Do we have any uh, anyone from legal online yet? Through the chair to Council Bouchier, yes, uh, Chris has resolved his technical anxieties and issues, and I think you should be able to answer your question now. Uh, thank you, CAO Doyle, and uh, through the chair, um, uh, Councillor Bouchier, if you could just clarify your question again. Um, I've been working on some other issues. Uh, through the chair. Uh, the question was uh, through the chair. The question was how do we, um, if, if someone ties in and takes the payment plan for rural water and sewer and their property becomes for sale and we sell it, how do we make sure that we collect the money? Is it, or how does the buyer know that he's walking into additional cost or the seller know? Yeah, um, thank you very much uh, through the chair to Councillor uh, Boussier. Um, because it's um, it's not something that we register on title, uh, what we do is we track it through our internal uh, financial uh, recording. And um, it would be uh, typical on a real estate closing uh, for a, a purchaser's a lawyer to 
uh, obtain a tax certificate um, that indicates current status. And it was always the intention that if there's a failure to pay, that we would have an opportunity uh, in the bylaw to take action by a tax notification. And so um, uh, I can, I, I think finance should be able to clarify it, but if we haven't done so already, we're in the process of incorporating that information into our internal records so that uh, the normal closing searches should uh, identify the status of uh, the participation A in the program and B, uh, the currency of payments to the program. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks. Sorry, we sorry, cut you off. Were you finished? Yeah. No. Oh. Uh, that's uh, that's the, the answer, Councillor. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So my question is, let's say I live at Tapri, I tie in, and a uh, job transfer comes in, and I took the payment plan. And how many years can we spread it over? Twenty-five. Did someone say? So I spread it over 25, well, in the first year, I haven't paid a whole lot. Who is responsible then? Maybe that's a better, who is responsible for making the payment? I've left Fort McMurray, obviously not gonna enjoy the, serv the, the new services of pipe water and sewer to my house, and I have 24 years left to pay. Have we told the seller that they're gonna be on the hook for, for that? Um, through the uh, through the chair to Councillor Boussier, um, my believe that the intention was that this is uh, in fact a benefit running with the land and not running with the individual. Uh, so the intention uh, was that um, because the benefit flows with the title, that the purchaser would be um, on the obligation to continue those payments. So in effect. The land uh, is uh, encumbered with that obligation, but then again, the land benefits from the obligation. So the participation in the program does um, set that that fact into motion for that remaining uh, whatever many years um, are required to pay out that ten thousand or sixteen thousand dollar contribution. Okay, so I guess the only concern I would have is if I'm a real estate agent selling you the house, Chris, and all of a sudden you're at your lawyer's and I get a phone call, because this has happened to me, where I neglected to tell you that there's going to be another $16,000 you owe on this property after having bought it. You know who gets really, really hit hard? is the agent that sold the house and didn't disclose that to you. And trust me, the lawyer would be saying, oh, your realtor, your realtor should have told you that. So how are we going to protect people that are buying houses that maybe are not told this? Uh, through the, the chair, uh, excellent question, uh, Councillor. And I know from your experience um, in conveyancing that these are real issues. Um, and uh, because it, it's not an interest in land which is registrable on title, we very much like um, on a closing uh, on a condominium, making sure that I get an estoppel certificate from the condominium, advising what the current status of the payments to the condo corp are. We in turn provide uh, tax cert certificates for a small fee. Um, and that information then advises the purchaser of the status of all the tax payments. Uh, this is not a tax, but it should be indicated on there. Uh, if we haven't done it, it's a conversation we need to have, but the program's new should indicate, A, is this a participating property under the program, and B, is the are the payments in good standing? And uh, that would be a normal due diligence uh, matter for the lawyer acting for the purchaser to uh, obtain. Correct. Uh, and the estoppel certificate is much different because the seller's obligated to provide clear title or the bank or whoever's selling the condominium. This is a little different though. So I guess question is, as a public citizen, if I want to buy Councillor Grandison's house out at Sapri, I can find out if there's money still owing to the RMWB for his pipe, water, and sewer. That's available to anyone in this community now or will be in the future? Uh, through the chair, um, uh, I'm not going to attempt to take over finance from uh, the uh, the director and chief financial officer, but 
it is uh, should be an item that is capable of being included on the tax notification that is acquired um, by the the purchaser's lawyer, and uh, uh, that that would be the the normal place to find that. And uh, I'd have to confirm with finance whether we've implemented that, and if we haven't, how uh, easy it would be to do so. But I think that was the intent of the program. Um, I haven't been directly involved for a little bit, but uh, when we had discussions about the implementation, that was the route we were going. Okay, and and I guess at the end of the day, it's, it's probably not a big issue, but I know if, if it's at the lawyer's desk and the buyers are signing papers and they get hit, well, you still owe 15 grand. I know who gets the call, and it's not fun. It's not a great conversation. And, and whether you could say, well, the seller... It was a material latent defect and the seller had to disclose to the buyer that they still on the hook to the RM for 10 or 12 or whatever it is. I, I'm not a lawyer and you are. I guess you could probably answer that if it, was, if it would be considered that. But I guess it's just something. I mean, because we're obviously with real estate, there's lots of transactions and this is going to continue for the next 10 or 15 years. And it's just it's, it's a surprise nobody likes to have when you're sitting at a lawyer's office. That's all. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, and, and through the chair to Councillor Boussier, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, there's there's a benefit, I think, to the vendor um, advising the purchaser that, by the way, uh, this property is on the rural water and sewer program. Um, that would be something I, I think would be material and important to advise purchasers. And uh, again, um, we will be uh, providing that information or should be on the tax certificate because we made a, it a provision that uh, the service connection issue uh, could be addressed um, uh, through the tax notification process. So uh, I think we've got that covered, but uh, I'll certainly follow up with the engineering and finance to confirm. And if we can get additional information to you to confirm that, uh, I will follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boussier. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the question for, uh, from Councillor Gratison, then we'll break for lunch afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. Just to follow up on Councillor Boussier's query of questions, if it's, I, I think there's, there's a two-fold possible solution. If it's identified because as a listing agent, I am required, you know, you speak to lawyers, things don't get to lawyers until after the transaction is done, basically, until the offer's been accepted. Um, I think if it's identified on the tax, when I pull title and I pull tax, which is required for the actual listing, if it's identified there, then we need to talk to our own real estate board to make sure that the listing agent is identifying that in the listing should solve the problems that Councillor Bussier is, is speaking to. So I, I think ultimately if it's identified on the tax statement that we have to pull, uh, that would address that problem. So just that as a comment. Um, my secondary note kind of refers back to the Fort Mackay uh, Community Center. Is that what it's called? Forgive me, I've turned the page. Um, but uh, I guess this question is more to you, um, uh, Jamie. It, would, it, would it not make sense that prior to building something, we have an actual agreement in terms of how it's gonna operate. Um, haven't we gotten ourselves in trouble before by, by putting the cart before the horse? I, I'm absolutely, and I, please forgive me, it's not that I have any objections to the project because the opposite is true. I just wanna make sure that everybody knows what we're doing before the shovels go in the dirt. Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, as it sits right now, the RMWB will manage that facility. That that's how, unless we get to some sort of agreement later on down the road, that we enter into some sort of contract with a third party person to, to run it. Okay. Um, but I, I do want to address your, your question a little bit before. I just want to make sure we got to it about <clears throat> making sure that the community, um, it's what the community wants. And from my understanding, and I believe the teams as well, <clears throat> is that this was an engaged project and a little bit unorthodox how we, how we got to it, but as I understand it, it, it was well engaged and it should be the right size with the right um, amenities, I suppose, for that community. So um, to answer that question, I, I believe it's rightly sized. Okay, honest. thank you. Thank uh, you. And, and, and I'm okay as long as we know that the agreement is the municipality's operating it kind of upfront, then 
we're not necessarily putting the cart before the horse and if things can evolve after the fact that's fine as well thank you for the answer sir thank you everyone we'll break for lunch when we come back we'll go move on to the next item on the agenda we're back at 1 20. thank you uh more Bain. lunch is going to be good Welcome back everyone, thank you. We'll now call on to Public Works to present the capital budget for transportation and facilities. Can you hear me, uh, Mayor Bowman? Yes, we can, thanks. Can you confirm that you see it? Yes, we're all good. Perfect, thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Keith Smith and I'm the Director of Public Works. Public Works consists of two branches with seven very much front-facing disciplines that provide services to our residents every day. The first branch being parks, roads, rural, and Fort Chipwine. The second being transportation facilities. This branch encompasses transit, fleet and facility services. I will now present the 2022 proposed capital budget for transportation and facilities. Budget for transportation and facilities is $25.085 million. The following slides will provide a project breakdown. Facilities is requesting no additional funding in 2022 to continue building security infrastructure upgrades. Current initiatives are carried forward from the 2021 budget. Above are examples of activities around camera coverage, mapping, and security, fencing installations over the past few years. Facilities is requesting 1.3 million in 2022 for the Fort Chipwan Six Bay Garage and Animal Control Facility. Preliminary and high level design for the bays that will serve to house public works, environmental services, and the animal control in Fort Chipewan. Facilities is requesting 8 million in 2022 for the continuation of the Public Works North facility. This request is to continue the project through the RFT process and commence ground works. Public Works North facility design was completed in 2021, construction to start in 2022 through to 2024. This is the current roads facility known as the satellite yard. The current public works north facility is replacement of the temporary office building with a permanent area for area for office and shop equipment storage building to protect the roads heavy equipment from the inclement weather conditions. Facilities is requesting 150,000 in 2022 to continue implementing the age friendly assessment initiative implementation. Age-friendly assessments were conducted and found a need to update some of the RMWB municipal buildings. 2022 initiatives include the focus on the execution of the develop developed scopes of work primarily on the rural areas, continuation of scope development based on completed assessments. Facilities is requesting 450,000 in 2022 upgrades to building management management automated systems at the wastewater treatment plant and the Jean Vier fire hall. In 2019-2020, there was an assessment of the existing facilities building automation systems that are used to control and automate the facility's heating, cooling, ventilation, lighting, and other critical building systems. These systems are being replaced with a sustainable system to assure continued environmental conditioning in these facilities and reduce the risk of catastrophic system failures. 
Above is the interactive display of a modern building management system. Facilities is requesting 2.73 million for building life cycle initiatives in 2022. Building life cycle plans for all major maintenance projects for approximately 270 RMWB facilities. Major maintenance work plans are developed and prioritized based on building condition assessments that adhere to council's strategic plan. Such initiatives include heating and AC replacements, water treatment tower plant mechanical review, and the roof replacement at the water treatment plant. Facilities is requesting 1.5 million for Jubilee major maintenance in 2022. As part of the condo corporation, it was identified that repairs to the parkade in Jubilee and updates on the electrical systems are necessary. This is the RMWB's proportion on the rehabilitation project. This project will enhance the useful life of these areas. This represents the RMD, RMWB's proportional share of the Jubilee Condo Corporation's building life cycle program over the next five years. Such initiatives include electrical upgrades to transformers and the main distribution panel, partial roof replacement, building envelope repairs, and fire and life safety upgrades. Facilities is requesting 150,000 to design a staff downtown parking lot in 2022. We are proposing to develop two areas located on Biggs Ave to meet the needs of our MWB staff that will be working at Jubilee Center. Project initiatives include paving, drainage, enhanced lighting, and site beautification that conforms to the DRP. Facilities is requesting 120,000 in 2022 for the Archie, Archie Simpson Arena backup generator for the design of the system. The location of the genset to support the Archie Simpson Arena during any potential emergency situations. Facilities is requesting 250,000 in 2022 for facilities operations sustainment. Examples of past initiatives include the compost washroom improvements and renovations at the wastewater treatment plant and the kitchen refacing at Bar Hall 1. Transit is requesting $90,000 in 2022 for three concrete pads to be constructed and or replaced. Improvement to existing transit shelters, that being Gregoire and Heritage Drive. A new shelter is being constructed at Willow Square and has been added to stop on Hospital Street. So on the Heritage, water pooling on leading edges towards the curb. Need to build up the pad to avoid water pooling and fixed landscaping concern. Willow Square will be a brand new construction. Mackenzie shelter built as temporary. This will be, and it was placed on unprepared ground and will be, we will be putting it in as permanent. Fleet is requesting 7.165 million for replacement of heavy equipment. As an essential, essential part of the services we provide, a list of heavy equipment was put forward and validated by Fleet as requiring replacement due to end of useful life. A total of 29 pieces of heavy equipment and attachments are due for replacements this year. As part of any well-planned asset management structure, the need to replace equipment in a regular and thoughtful process is critical to service delivery and balance approach to budgeting. Here are some examples of those that need to be replaced. A front end loader, a tool cat, and a bow make that requires life cycle. Fleet is requesting 3.18 million for replacement of light equipment. This request is for 54 vehicles. 38 of the 54 consist of light medium duty trucks and trades vans. Each of the proposed units has been validated by fleet services and the unit is in need of replacement. With each of these departments, meetings have occurred and will continue to be held to discuss unit type and fit for purpose prior to any ordering occurring. As an outcome of the fleet review project and as part of the overall asset management plan, a structured fleet replacement process is critical to optimizing equipment uptime by balancing repair costs versus replacement. Here are three typical examples of 54 needing replacement. With each of these departments, meetings have been and will continue to be held to discuss unit type and fit for purpose prior to ordering occurring. 
These trucks range from 10 to 12 years old with 120 to 280,000 kilometers. And that concludes that portion of my presentation. Thank you, Keith. Does anyone, any, does anyone have any questions for Public Works? Councillor Ball. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bowman. Through the chair to Keith. Um, I guess I've got I've got a few questions. You've got quite a quite a list of projects here, so um, just going to go through my notes. Uh, starting with Public Works North facility. Um, Where's the location of this? Third to chair to Councillor Ball, it's at, it's at the satellite yard, which is on the road heading down to the water treatment plant. If you're driving on Highway 63, you will see that huge Quonset. That is the location of the uh, Public Works North facility. Okay, so this isn't a new site. This is a rehabilitation of the existing site. And I see that you have a million dollars uh, spent from last year what has been what was done uh, last year and you've got eight million proposed for this year uh, what what is the plan for this year third to chair to councillor ball uh, prior to would have been designed and any any type of work that needed to be done in that regards this year we in 2022 we will definitely be putting shovel into the ground uh, this year uh, we will uh, begin construction of those facilities okay um, Moving on, age-friendly assessment. I'm happy to see this one. Uh, it's near and dear to my heart, but uh, I'm just curious about the overall program. Does it have a capital component? Are you actually repairing things or are you just doing the assessment? Through the Chair to Council Ball, there will be an assessment, but also there will be a scope of work in which will include add-ons. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, which one else did we have here? Oh, so the Archie Simpson Arena backup generator. You've got one hundred and twenty thousand for design and eighty thousand for the generator, or sorry, eight hundred thousand for the generator. Um, I was curious, would it not be possible to do this as a design build versus spend a year designing it and then the following year replacing it for eight hundred k when you could potentially do it for nine hundred and twenty, the full amount? as a design build in one year, I, I assume you just go out to a vendor and say, this is what we need, how many watts, amps, or whatever it is. Sir, the Chair, Councillor Ball, <clears throat> what this is is repurposing an existing generator that's already located in Fort Chippewan. So we need to take that, we need to design that, make sure it's fit for purpose, make sure it fits the building. So it's, it's not necessarily purchasing the equipment. We have the generator, it's just repurposing it so essentially you could do it all in one shot versus do the design piece first through the chair to councilor ball the plan would be for this year would be just to do design if 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 it can be done all in this year definitely we would come back with an amendment but that is not the plan as of now okay fair enough um the operational sustainment for two hundred fifty thousand. um it's an asset. It's through asset management, and it's the. I guess the intention is to, to, to deal with things that come up that are unexpected. Could we not just use a, the an emerging issues fund for this versus having a placeholder for a quarter of a million dollars? It feels like a slush fund to me. Through the chair to Councillor Ball. Uh, it, it pos it's possible it could be done through emerging issues. I, I'm, I'm assuming. However, this is this is just past practice how it's been done. It, it is exactly as you stated for those one-offs uh, that come up throughout the year. It could be reorganizations. Could be anything internally. So that's what that fund is for. But if it could be used through emerging issues, I'm I'm not sure of that that response. Maybe CEO Jamie Doyle can answer that. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, could you repeat the question, please? The operational sustainment um, project for two hundred fifty thousand. It 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 seems like it's for upcoming issues that are unknown. Uh, could that not be dealt through an emerging issue item versus creating a two hundred fifty thousand dollars slush fund that's just there in case? Through through the chair um, to Councillor Ball, I suppose you'd be right, but we would be going. We would have to use the 
uh, uncommitted CIR. Um, perhaps CFO could put a bit more detail, but that's that's how we could deal with it rather than having the sustainment monies there, for sure. Well, it, it just seems odd that it's a capital project that has no scope of work. Through the chair to Council Balsam, what we can do is uh, put it through as a capital amendment uh, uh, budget approval as we do um, on occasion and use the CIR fund. So we can bring it back to Council uh, using the uncommitted funds. Well, I would assume bring it back as needed. Right now it's not needed. Today it's not needed, correct? That there's is nothing, correct. There's nothing identified. Yeah. But in a week there might be something. That's correct. Fair enough. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Straub. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. And through to the presenter, Keith. Uh, I want to thank you for the presentation. I'm pleased to see the John VA Skate Park and the school receiving some upgrades and further appreciate that it was in the 2019 Parks Master Plan. Uh, thank you for putting in the project for replacement of a playground in Conklin. From looking at the present playground, I can see as presented that it does not meet playground industry standards. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Councillor Boussier. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bowman, and through the chair to Keith. Keith, just uh, a couple questions here and then I'll surrender the floor. Um, I'm looking at this, your, park, your downtown parking lot design and construction. I look at 2.3 million, and to me that's fairly significant money ask. And I look at the picture, and I see some weeds that could use a weed whacker, and maybe a few electrical standards that could use some repair. But outside of that, and I mean, I've walked through the parking lot, so I'm just curious why we're spending 2.3 million on something that would probably function for a year or two. And given that we don't know what we're doing with the whole re -down, redevelopment downtown, it's just, it seems like a waste of uh, a couple million dollars. Through the chair to Councillor Boussier, um, the, the initial request is for the design and that will be further hammered out. However, you gotta remember that those properties are undeveloped. So what will happen is that we will need to do uh, any type of rehabilitation, groundwork, including paving, site drainage, uh, electrical, anything of those matters uh, to prepare that. And that those sites are for uh, parking for municipal staff. And as as you recall from last week, uh, the plan as of right now is for Timberley Landing to relocate down to Jubilee. So we'll, we'll need those areas, absolutely. So again, the design will better determine that. However, there is a quite a bit of groundwork that got to happen in order to get it ready. No, I, I certainly recognize that, but I guess at the end of the day, if, if, if this is not going to be a permanent parking structure, would we, would we continue on with a spend of 2.1 million in the next four years? Like I get we're going to have a look at it for 150, and I'm sure it's going to come back and say, yeah, we should go ahead with all this, and we're going to spend another 2.1 million, and then maybe eventually, a couple years later, we're tearing it apart to, to build something. What, what, I guess what's wrong with the parking lot right now that people can't park on there and walk safely over to the RM building to work? Through the chair to Councillor Bustier, uh, what we'll do for the design is definitely, uh, you know, the earthwork that I talked about before, but there's also the electrical work that needs to occur as well as lighting to make sure that it's safe and operational for our employees. So it's, 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 it's a much larger scope of work than uh, than just earthwork but again it, it's it's for that uh, the purpose uh, our employees that will be working out of jubilee okay um another question was the the north operations and that's the one just as you you can take um well it, it's where the water treatment plant is right just at the top there through the chair to Councillor Bustier, exactly. You take the road going down to the water treatment plant, you'll see that huge white Kwanzaa with, a pol or with three or four, I think four or five uh, aqua trailers. That will be the site of the new uh, operation center. Okay, and we own that land 
all the land there? Through the chair to Councilor Bustier, yes, we own the land. Okay, and there's no opportunity to move down to the water treatment plant and maybe utilize some of their floors and build the, the building down there? Through the chair to Councilor Bustier's, uh, no, there's no opportunity to move this facility to the water treatment plant. This will not hold much office space. Really what this is is uh, you know, we will have the bays and we will also have the holding area for our equipment. The administrative portion is, is, is several offices, but it's more lockers and a lunchroom. It, it won't hold, uh, it, you know, most of our guys uh, at roads, they're not behind desks, they're not at cubicles, they're out clearing snow, they're out sweeping streets. So it's not much administratively heavy down there. It would be more for the equipment and the repair. Okay. Who owns the land just as you come across the bridge that's fenced in down by the water treatment plant? I think we use it as a parking compound. Through the chair, Councillor Boussier, uh, from my knowledge, it would be ours, the municipalities. Okay, thank you. That's it for now. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Councillor Boussier. Councillor Wago. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Keith, for the presentation. One quick question, uh, just for clarification. You were talking about, uh, where were we? When we were talking about the, the light equipment replacements, the 38 vehicles I'm assuming is the budget for this year and not the total for the 18 million over the next five years? Through the chair to Councillor Weigel, uh, what we're requesting is 54 vehicles and that would be for this year, 3.18. Awesome, and that's and that looks congruent just with every year. That just that's one of the things that you just budget for every year is the, approximately that amount of vehicles to be replaced. Through the chair to Councilor Wago, um, through fleet, we recently did a what we call a fleet matrix, and we we looked at our, our fleet and looked at what what it would take to keep it as current age, keep it as current replacement value, and based upon that assessment, that's this is exactly what we need in order to keep our fleet moving and keep it at its current age and keep our services to our citizens. Awesome, uh, thank you very much. Thank Councillor Weigel, Councillor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. Um, I guess my question, just as a follow-up to Councillor Weigel's question is, is uh, certainly one of the criticisms I've heard in the past is that we drive Tahoes and and uh, other uh, more higher end vehicles. And I just question, what is the process of ensuring that we're getting the best value for our citizens in terms of vehicle selection? I know it goes out to RFP, I'm sure. Um, but you know, sometimes today, the difference between economy and luxury and so on and so forth, the lines get pretty skewed. So I'm just wanting to know the process to make sure we're getting the most appropriate usable vehicle with the best economic return for our citizens. Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, uh, absolutely. Uh, most of the vehicles, especially light duty vehicles that we have, are very much fit for purpose vehicles. Uh, they are either your trucks or your vans or your trades vans. They are very much fit for purpose. They are not meant to be luxurious by any means. And we do uh, do, do the specifications as such. And any type of agreements that we enter into would be the same. So absolutely, uh, they are very much fit for purpose. And economy is number one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grasson. Councillor Boussier. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor Bowman. Um, Keith, just getting back to, through the chair to Keith, Mr. Smith, uh, getting back to the public works facility. Um, uh, I've been wandering around there for the last couple of years, and I noticed we've done a, a bunch of uh, work, including planting trees, putting a new road up to uh, Thickwood or Roslyn, or I think it's Timberland, I don't even know what road it is, but um, you're telling me that none of that work that we've done will be impacted by the the construction of a 27, whatever it is, 27,000 square feet and 36,000 square feet facility or whatever we're building there? Through the chair to Councillor Bustier, at this point, I, I don't think that that would be impacted by moving forward with this uh, with this operation, this building. I, I can't see it. 
Uh, if it does, it be, will be very minimal. But wouldn't it be something that we would, I mean, because obviously we just didn't wake up this morning where we thought about building a new building there. It's, it's probably been on the blocks for a bit or in discussion. So we do all this work and then we, and then there's a potential that we're going to tear it all up again or some of it. Like I, I believe there's been some trees planted and I know there's a big, um, a brand new um, path or asphalt path that goes in a different direction than the other one that was there for, for many years. So, I mean, it's fairly significant, the size of these buildings and just, so we don't know. Sir, to chair to Councillor Boussier, I do believe the planting that you're talking about, uh, I do believe that was on the ACO lines or probably around that area, but uh, the majority of the footprint that's there for the North Operations Centre, it's already been impacted. It's already it's already been unearthed. It's there shouldn't be much impact to the, the surrounding vegetation. Okay, um, I did have another question. Um, maybe I'll shut off. And I see Councillor Bangjanko has some. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Boussier. Councillor Bajoko. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kip, for, for your presentation. I just wanted to clarify uh, your plans for uh, replacement of light vehicles, light equipment uh, re replacement, uh, page 27. Um, it looks like, okay, you, uh, you had said in your previous answer that uh, 54 units will be replaced this year. And looking at your plan for the next five years, are you um, are you uh, planning to replace 54 each year for the next five years? Uh, that's one. And uh, were these vehicles bought uh, around the same time, or how come uh, all of them are at the state where they all need to be replaced year every year about 54 units? I don't know if I got the maths correctly. And then uh, how many vehicles do we have in all? How many light equipment uh, do we have in all in, uh, in RMWB? Through the Chair to Councillor Benjenko, I, I believe I copied down all your questions. First off, uh, this year we, we, we will definitely be looking at 54 vehicles. Uh, if you take note, over the last four to five years, there's been times in which we haven't had any replacement whatsoever. We've looked at it essentially through a 12 month uh, window. Really what we're doing right now, a part of any asset management plan, assets being these vehicles, these, these heavy equipment and this light duties, is that we need to constantly replace and, and upgrade. What we're looking at now is 54, and that will get us to the point uh, where we're good for this year. And moving forward, we'd be looking at possibly 30, 35 vehicles per year light duty. Through this, uh, sir, or through this assessment that we had done, with the number of people that we have, with the number, with the services that we provide, we our fleet is pretty much right where it should be. So you will see this kind of numbers year after year. Uh, when it comes to light duty, uh, we're, we have approximately 300. Now, anything below an F550, I do believe it is, will consider light duty. So it could be anything from a bylaw vehicle to a trades van. It's just not your typical sedans or SUVs. So it would be anything below that grade. So roughly, roughly 300. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Joko. Do we have any other questions from Council? I'm seeing none. So if you want to work, I continue your presentation, uh, Keith. Or sorry, Council Boussier, you have a question? No. <clears throat> we will continue with Public Works. With the capital budget for parks, roads, rural operations, and Fort Chippewa. Perfect. Thank you, sir. I will now pull up my presentation. Can you, Mr. Bowman, can you confirm that you see it? Yes, you're good. Um, I will now present the 2022 proposed capital budget for parks, roads, rural operations at Fort Chippewa. The proposed 2022 capital budget for parks, roads, 
rural and Fort Chippewan is $23.22 million. I will explain in the upcoming slides. Fort Chippewan Airside Pavement Rehabilitation Construction is in the amount of $16 million. This funding is to repave the runway and repair subsurface drainage. This project is supported by Transport Canada and we have received grant funding in the amount of approximately $11 million. This picture depicts the Fort Chippewan Airport and Airstrip. Outdoor rink asphalt surface upgrades request in the amount of 500,000 for 2022. Some outdoor boarded rinks in our community are approaching end of life cycle and the surfaces require replacement. This is the second location of the asphalt surface upgrade project brought forward for 2021. The first being Inge Bay and Thickwood, which is now complete. This funding is for 2022. We will see an outdoor rink in Abbasan repaired. Rinks are located in Abbasan, Waterways, Timberley, and Thickwood. This is a picture of the outdoor rink currently in Abbasan. Rural roads and parking lot paving in Fort Chippewan request for 100,000 is to begin the tender process in order to be ready for construction in 2023. The project is to improve safety and reliability of these roads and parking lots. An area photo for Chip One illustrating the Hamlet Road Network. Abbasan OHV staging area request for 140,000 is to complete public requested washroom, benches, and tables, asphalt parking services, and planting. The picture on the left shows the current OHV staging area, and the pictures on the right shows the proposed amenities. Safari Creek pedestrian trail upgrade design and construction request for 500,000 for 2022. This is to start the design of a safe pedestrian walking trail from a mailbox location to Vista Ridge complete with lighting. Currently residents are walking on an unlit multi-use trail that has been established by ATVs. This is not a safe trail for pedestrians. This is an aerial photo depicting Safari Creek Estates. Spray Park Replacement Program requests funds in the amount of $1.4 million for 2022. Spray parks in this replacement project are located at Syncrude Athletic Park, which is Dr. K.P. Wong, Wood Buffalo Park, and Lakewood Park. These three spray parks have issues with surfacing and underground utilities requiring major repairs. The underground surfacing is failing and the surfacing needs to be replaced, resulting in continuous downtime for repairs to keep them functional during the summer season. Replacing these spray parks will enhance the reliability for our citizens with our short summer to keep these amenities operational every day. The funding request for 2022 will see Dr. K.P. Wong spray park repaired. This slide shows the three, all three water parks, that being K.P. Wong, the one in Wood Buffalo, and Lakewood in 2024. Playground replacement for 420,000 in 2022 for life cycling to maintain CSA standards for Canadian Playground Safety Institute. This project will replace play structures located at Dr. Clark Module 3 and the Eco Boreal Module 2. We have Dr. Uh, above is Dr. Clark Playground Module 3 and the Eco Boreal Playground Module 2. Draper Trail Upgrade requests funds of 90000 in 2022 for a study to support the potential for, of an all-season trail connecting to Draper. This project will determine opportunities to provide all-season connection between communities and make trail usability for different modes of transportation. This feasibility study requires intensive coordination and consultation with various stakeholders and departments considering future development in the area. The above picture illustrates the Draper Trail. 
Playground apparatus replacement project requests funds for 400,000 in 2022 for life cycling to maintain CSA standards for Canadian Playground Safety Institute. This project will replace play structures located at Barber Drive and Timberley School. These pictures show the playground at Barber as well as Timberley. Squirrel Trail Replacement Pre-Designed Project requests funds for 80,000 80, in 2022. This project will take a detailed look at Squirrel Trail and Birchwood Trail system for recreational use and viability of repairing existing damages to the trail. This study will look at current trail alignment and answer questions such as, does it need to be re relocated? Is it repairable to a safe use, user standard or should it be eliminated if the use is extremely low? This aerial photo depicts Squirrel Trail and the areas that need attention. Inclusive Playground Project requests 450,000 in 2022 to promote inclusivity and provide equal play opportunities for all users. This project will further inclusive play initiatives by the addition of accessible components of Walter and Gladys Hill, Dickensville School, and Dr. K. A. Clark School site. The photos above illustrate such equipment. Jean VA site fixture upgrades. This project requests funds of 700,000 in 2022 for improvements at the Jean VA school site. And this project will install new asphalt servicing at the skate park replace the backstop field sports field, install furnishing for the field and park area. Previous capital projects have been seen improvements to the sports fields, playground replacements, preparing the fencing and infield. Drainage improvements are planned to be completed in spring 2022. The above photos illustrate the skate park and the school field at John VA. Playground replacement for Conklin School Site requests funds for 400000 in 2022 for life cycling to maintain CSA standards for Canadian Playground Safety Institute. The structure is passed as usable life cycle and needs to be replaced. Keeping with considerations and the importance of inclusive play accessibility for all users, this project would approve the opportunity to work with the school and community to install more interactive and inclusive features. <coughs> It is necessary to replace the structure to continue the same service levels provided to the community. And this is the Conklin School Playground. The basketball court replacement project requests funds of 400,000 for 2022. The surfacing of these courts are not suitable for safe play and are at the end of their life cycle. It would also see associated site furnishing installed to support sports fields such as nets, benches, and shade, shelters, and structures. And these are the basketball courts at all three locations. Water Mercury Sports Field School Board Project will request 100000 for 2022 to replace the school to replace the scoreboard. The scoreboard was damaged beyond repair in the storm event and requires replacement. Reinstalling the scoreboard will enable the school to adequately host events that require public scorekeeping and provide the same level of service for these sports facilities. This is the Father Merck field along with the scoreboard location. Fort Mackay Seasonal Dock requests funds for $150,000 for design of a seasonal dock system. The community need for a seasonal dock system has been identified. This project will engage, include engagement and design, including consultation on site location, site access, water access, and community preference. This project will then inform a budget request in 2023 to deliver a dock system for the community. This is the dock at Snide, which is very similar to the proposed one in Fort Mackay. Prairie Creek Perimeter Trail would ask for fund would ask funds for 150,000 in 2022 for trail design. Considering the characteristics of available land in Prairie Creek and the changes of Bobby 69 to Sapper Creek Trail, 
maintained by the municipality. A design study is believed to be the best approach to ensure clear expectations for trail locations are developed, community engagement can occur, and an agreement with all stakeholders are finalized. This project would then inform budget request in 2023 for construction of a perimeter trail system. This photo illustrates uh, Prairie Creek. Father Merker, the field access ramp project request funds of 150000 in 2022. The request for this project came forward from Father Merker School and previous council to public works to consider options for more direct accessible access to the sports field for people with disabilities. This project would see the installation of an accessible trail complete with handrails from the school directly to the sports field. Currently, there are stairs connecting the field or an indirect access along Thickwood Boulevard to Center Fire Place. These pictures show the sports field and proposed stairs at Father Mercury School. The SAP Functional Improvement Drainage, Drainage Project requests $1 million in 2022. Funds for this project will be used for necessary site improvements for this tournament class sports facility. This construction project is informed by the 2021 SAP Site Improvement Design Project, which has identified drainage issues at SAP Park impacting the sports fields. The SAP Improvement Design Project will specify specific details related to site layouts, yard facility reconfigurations, adding additional sports amenities, such as potential tennis courts and baseball diamonds. This is a picture depicting the SAP complex. Draper Community Sign Upgrade Request, $90,000 in 2022. The existing sign is weathered, needs to be replaced with a design that is consistent with other communities that were installed in other Fort McMurray neighborhoods. With the development of Saline Creek Parkway, a more suitable location for this replacement will also be assessed as part of the scope. The old Draper sign on the left and the new design used in our rural communities. This concludes this presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Keith. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Keith. Really appreciate it. Is there any questions from council? And I also want to add, uh, really pleased with the OHV staging site upgrades you have made there. Um, that's something the community is really going to we'll look forward to. Councillor Paul. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Uh, through the chair to Keith, you may need to phone a friend. Um, just, I've got a whole lot of questions here and, and I don't want to take up everybody's time and I certainly hope someone else chimes in so that they can ask some questions so I don't have to. Um, I'll, I'll just start with the four chip airside pavement. Um, the intention of that is to pave it this year in 2022, but we've got a large project for 2023 to do uh, roads and parking lots in Fort chip. Is there any thought to maybe doing those in the same year so that we're not moving a asphalt plant up and down to Fort chip? It's quite costly to move an asphalt plant up there. Sir, to share, Councillor Ball, absolutely. If there's any type of synergies that can be made uh, in work that needs to be done in Fort Chip One, absolutely, uh, that will be a priority and that will be looked at. Well, I, I guess it can be looked at, but right now it's up for approval for work this year and work next year. So, are we going to need to make a motion to postpone the Fort Chip airside pavement to 2023? Or are you ready to do the the roads and parking lots in 2022? Sir, to chair to Councillor Ball, we will be, the plan as of right now is to be ready for uh, uh, the roads and parking lots definitely in 2023. Uh, we will try our best, do our best to, to move forward with the airstrip in 2022 if possible. Uh, that one's much further along and that one has uh, funding in place. So absolutely. if. It, if it can be done in 2022, we will move forward with 2022. As you can appreciate in Fort Chip One, uh, there is the complexities of getting the material there and, and, and that's added to it, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't I don't think you're quite catching what I'm asking. I, I prefer both to be done in one year if it's possible and can 
can Fort Chippewa on airside pavement um, last an additional year to 2023 or does it need to be done this year? Through to the chair to Councillor Ball, uh, what we're doing here with the airstrip is definitely proactive uh, based upon the uh, engineering uh, review that we've done. Uh, the airstrip is at least good for another two to five years, but this is very much proactive in that case. So we can postpone to 2023 and do everything in one year. Through the Through chair, the chair if I yes. may, it's Jamie here. Uh, one thing I don't want to lose sight of, and perhaps the CFO could chime in if she's so inclined. If we push it off too far, uh, we could risk losing funding from the federal government to help us accommodate the, the paving. You want to chime in now? Al wants to chime in. So. Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. So, uh, CAO um, Doyle, it is, is it possible that we ask the leadership in Fort Chip by presenting the opportunity if they were to do up a BCR and respectfully request the feds to hold the funding for one additional year to save uh, to save money, so on and so forth, would that support a delay in this project and still maintain the funding as it exists? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Grandison, uh, that's not going to be possible. We've already had a one year extension on the funding and at this particular time transport canada will only hold the funding until march 2023 so uh, again and i don't i just need to understand so what could possibly if something needs to be done and it's funded mm -hmm. what in the logical mind of the federal government would could could say that if you don't do it by this time we'll take the money away from a project that needs to be done that, uh, that just doesn't make sense to me uh through the chair to councillor uh Grandison, this is a particular funding scheme that uh, Transport Canada has for airfields, and we did apply for it and we were given the, the monies. We haven't received them yet because we have to uh, apply invoices. And so there is only a certain time levels on these, this particular uh, grant program. And that is a lot of other grant programs that we also are involved in. They do have timelines that are associated with the, with the grant program. Uh, again. I, I totally understand your position and municipal position. I'm perplexed to understand how if the federal government and Transport Canada recognizes the need for upgrades to an airstrip that they could possibly say, do it within these timelines, we'll take the money away. Like that just, if it needs to be done and they've acknowledged it needs to be done, I, I don't understand how they could say, well, you know, we can spend an extra couple hundred thousand dollars the following year to bring back an asphalt plant. It just doesn't make sense to me. And and I know that's not your fault, no. um, the CFO, but uh, I'm perplexed to understand why that would happen. And, uh, and I'm wondering again, if we had some support from the uh, political leadership in the community with it, that might, uh, suggest to the federal government that they may want to th rethink their foolishness. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Grandison, I'm not being argumentative, um, but the delay unfortunately was our issue and therefore um, they have had the monies available to us for the past two and a half, three years. So now there is going to be, they pool their money together. So there's going to be another pool available in 2023 their fiscal year. And so um, any monies that were in this particular pool uh, will not be available after uh, March 2023. Okay, it just occurs to me that Councillor Ball's suggestions of synergies and the cost of, you know, cost of any capital project or any major construction project is set up and tear down a lot of times. And it's sometimes more expensive okay. than the actual project and how we are not combining all of these things and getting ourselves together just it just boggles me but i'll let it go for the moment your explanation i understand and i also appreciate i just don't under understand the irony of the whole thing when it's an identified project that requires to happen so thank you through the chair to councillor grandison and councillor ball i can certainly appreciate the need and desire for synergies and we don't negate that um, 
and as for the federal government, I think they consistently, what they do well is perplex people. Um, it's just unfortunate that in this particular pool of money, the synergy may not work. I mean, it's fine if, if we don't want to take advantage of, of the monies, but I would suppose that would be up to this council. But uh, I think I've stopped trying to read the minds of federal government. <coughs> Thank you. Councilor Broussier. Uh, through the chair to Linda, um, is there any opportunity that the federal government can grant the monies that are dedicated to the Fort Chippewan upgrades and we just hold it in trust or they hold it in trust and then advance when we provide evidence that the work has been completed. I, I, and again, I have no idea how provincial and federal funding works, but I, I struggle that the federal government would advance it in some form of a trust or keep it. And then if we can provide evidence that the work is completed, whether it's this year or next year, that they actually let us keep it or advance it. Like, so you, I guess just help me out, please. Through the Chair, Councillor Boussier, uh, unfortunately, that is not the way that this particular grant program operates and also other federal, not all, but all federal um, grant programs. It is within a certain timeline and then we have to uh, give in our invoices to prove the cost. They do not advance funds before the projects um, have begun. That's just not the way that they, their grant programs are, are set up or run. Okay, and, and, and they just threw the chair to Linda, they just won't put it in a, a little slush fund and then they send it to us once the work's done. If not, they keep it themselves. Uh, through the chair to Council Boosie, that is correct. Uh, I do want to say, though, that they have extended yeah, their no, timelines uh, yes. a couple of times in this particular situation. Yeah. So no, they I, have been trying to work with us. I was just hoping we get one more extension. <laughs> <laughs> so was I. Um, okay, thanks, Lyndon. And I guess through the chair to our CAO, um, it, it would just like I struggle listening to presenters when um, certainly not this isn't just directed at Mr. Smith, but we seem to waste a lot of money here. And unfortunately, that that money, that trough of money, continues to shrink and. It's it's difficult to personally to to accept budgets when there's substantial cost savings available if we would have just put our heads together earlier. I don't know. It, it's it's really frustrating, CEO. We waste a ton of money. This organization, unfortunately, and if there's ways that we can, as a council and men, work together and to save some money. Um, Certainly, I, I would welcome that because I'm sure there's a cost to mobilizing a asphalt plant in Fort Chippewan twice instead of just once. Um, yeah. Anyways, it's just kind of a comment, and unfortunately, it's not meant to upset people, but it just it's upsetting to me to watch. Thanks. Through the chair to Council Bruce, yeah, I, I thank you for the comment, and believe me, we. This team that's, that's here certainly understands that need for synergies, and uh, you can ask them. Um, between myself and Linda, there's been a lot of flogging of heads, of making sure that we get to where we need to. That This first budget of this council, of course, um, you all kind of jumped into the process very late in the game. I think as we move to the next year's budget, we'll see more cost, more cost efficiencies and savings as we engage more with you all. So I certainly do. Uh, take the feedback to heart and I, so does the team listening and um, as we transcend or descend to our five to one tax ratio of course that that's a lot of lost revenue so we have to be smarter and we have to be more efficient thank you CEO yeah and I just I apologize to the staff of the arm it's just not I'm not throwing darts at anybody in particular but Certainly having sat around here in 13 to 17, I don't think, and, and a lot of staff are not here that were here before, but, and, I, and again, lots of people have inherited the, um, the scenario that we're under now, but it's just, yeah, so I apologize. It wasn't meant to be offensive against any particular employee. I do appreciate the hard work you do, but 
hopefully moving forward, we can maybe work a little closer with, with other levels of government and, and everyone else. And hopefully there's some opportunities available in the next four years to save some money. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Boussier. Councillor Ball. Okay, I guess I'm back up. Thank you, Mayor Bowen. Uh, through the chair to Keith again. Uh, I'll change topics. Um, outdoor rink, um, I, I think it's a replacement program. There's three, I believe, that you're looking to do, and you've got it set up as a multi-year program. Um, I'm just wondering why it's a multi-year, and wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a little bit better if we could just do it as single single year projects where if you're doing Avisand in year one, um, it ends up staying on the books for three years versus done and gone, done and gone. So can you answer that? Through the chair to uh, Councillor Ball, absolutely. We, we looked at that setup that you, you've said there earlier, but what we're doing, we're showing it as more of a a life cycling for each of the uh, each of the rings that we have and as they're awarded they're definitely done as single projects but again this is just to show the life cycling and uh, and the movement and how we're updating these rings so yeah it, it, it can be done that way and it's kind of modified that way we got it set up so that it's 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 shown that way but we do it as one offs as we're moving forward yeah I, I, I can appreciate that and I can see I see how you set it up I mean I won't sugarcoat it. I kind of semi-invented that system to preload the system with pre-approved projects. Um, I'd prefer to see them as single years, and I don't know that that's an option to us at this point. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't, at this point, I, I don't know if it is an option, and uh, definitely I appreciate you uh, sugarcoating that process. OHV staging area in Absand. Uh, simple question. What type of washroom are we using? Uh, it says installation of a washroom. Is this going to be plugged into municipal services, water, and so on? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, it will definitely be similar to the one that you currently see in Raphael Creek. And I, for the life of me, cannot think of what that one is. I know where it is. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, it's kind of a outhouse style. So it's an outhouse. All right. Uh, Sapri Creek Trail upgrades. Um, how long is that trail? I mean, we're looking at a couple million dollars, I believe, for that one. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, you're asking for the length of the trail? Yeah, I was just curious how much trail work we're doing. and. Because it's identified as a pedestrian trail, I know there's quite a quite a number of OHV users in that area. Will we be considering OHV access controls to keep it as a pedestrian trail? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, uh, definitely we'd be putting in uh, uh, mechanisms to prevent ATV use. However, the actual length, I'll have to get I'll have to get back to you shortly with that. The actual length of the trail. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess another question relative to the same topic was the spray parks. Uh, you're doing the same thing with multi-year projects um, and you, same with playgrounds and there's quite a I, my preference is again those things are all all one year uh, would prefer them to be one year because I understand you call it a program but really it's being the work's being done at one site and then you're gone and then you go to the new site and then you're gone and they're obviously dotted all across the community. The first one you're going to do is KP Wong at 1.4 million replacement. To my recollection, it only costs us 600,000 to build it. Is there a reason for a significant, and, and I might be wrong on that number, but I'm, I think I'm fairly close. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, you're absolutely right. Uh, it was built in 2013. However, since that time, uh, we've had a lot of deficiencies with that park. And in order to repair it, and based upon recent parks that we've put in recently, that is what we're predicting the cost will be. Okay, thank you for that. Is the intention that we're removing the entire infrastructure, including the pad? Basically, Through the chair to Councillor Ball. Oh, sorry. Basically, just throwing out the park. Through the chair to Councillor Ball, you're correct. Okay, that answers that then. Um, 
playground replacements, uh, you had one listed at 420,000 as a multi-year project. Again, I think you know how I feel about multi-years uh, in this type of work. Um, there's another part, I think that's Dr. Clark you're doing for 420K, and then further on you have inclusive playground components at the exact same site. It's a requirement in our engineering servicing standards to have, I believe it's 25% um, accessible components, but we're asking for 400K, for 420K to do a replacement at Dr. Clark, and then we're gonna do another 400K or something like that at Dr. Clark for accessible. Why don't we just do one fully inclusive park for 420K? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, uh, I, I will definitely take into account uh, your feedback on the single year projects versus the multi year. However, uh, with the inclusive that uh, you're discussing, that is the replacement or the upgrade of the existing uh, Liberty Swing that's located at that playground. So that's that. That's the component that's being replaced. And at what what is the value of that? Those swings aren't four hundred twenty thousand dollars, or four hundred, or whatever the number is. So uh, through the chair to Councillor Ball, uh, what you see there is, I believe, three locations, just not one location. The for the accessible? I can't find it through on the chair to book here. Sorry again, sir. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Ball, yes, for the, for the inclusivity. Well, I'm going to turn the mic over to someone else here for a sec while I collect my thoughts on this. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Grand Grandison? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I have a couple of questions. So you said uh, KP1 was built in 2013, is that correct? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, I'm just going back through my notes. I'm pretty sure, yes, 2013. So what is the normal life cycle of a spray park? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, it depends really on the spray park that we install. A typical uh, spray park would last 10 years, and the more low maintenance, I guess, such as the one that's in Lakewood, that could be up towards 20 years. It really depends on uh, what we put there. So, uh, excuse me, just so I don't have to go looking through my notes. I didn't write. So, what is the cost of the replacement at KP Wall? Sir, the chair to Councillor Grandison, the cost to replace that one at KP Wong is 1.4 million. You've got to consider the earthwork, uh, the, the groundwork, the uh, lines, the water lines, the sewer lines, and the surfacing, plus the components that goes with the spray park. Uh, I understand that. I guess I'm trying to get an idea just for the future, because I think it's already been indicated with a one to five ratio, our monies are going down. And and our expenses are going up. So am I to anticipate that this park every 10 years is gonna cost the taxpayers a minimum of 1.4 plus in in inflation every 10 years? Is that what I'm understanding? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, when we, ins when we build the new one, we're hoping definitely to get greater than 10 years. However, you can appreciate that with spray parks, there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of uh, ground upheaving, there's, there's a multitude of maintenance that goes along with it. So 10 years time, we could be looking at the same situation. However, we will try our best to prolong it. As, as I, I have no doubt, sir, that you do your, your very, very best. I guess the answers I'm trying to get and the education I'm trying to do for myself, my colleagues and the public is, you know, each of these facilities cost X amount of dollars to build and then you have X amount of dollars of operational costs and if we're looking at 1.4 million to 1.5 million with inflation every 10 years uh, times five spray parks, that gets to be quite an expense for spray parks and that's the point I'm trying to make, so thank you for that. Um, Another question on a different topic. So uh, why $100,000 for a scoreboard replacement at Father Mark? I, I mean, I'm not quite sure, but I'm pretty sure the scoreboard up in um, at the end of Thicket there was like 30000 wasn't it? So I'm just not sure what makes a scoreboard worth $100,000. Are we talking a complete electrical upgrade? 
the frame for the, the for the sign, et cetera? Through the chair, Councillor Grandison, you're absolutely correct. It's for the scoreboard itself plus the installation. That still, I remember, uh, again, I, that just seems an absorbent amount of money. Uh, however, I mean, I can't dispute it. I don't have the paperwork in front of me or, or your pricing. But I do have a second question related to that. We have a scoreboard sitting in Conklin that's been sitting there for four years to unused. Has anybody considered repurposing that to a project like this? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, we have not looked at taking that scoreboard from the rural and bringing it into the urban. Uh, I'm not sure the usage, and I'm not sure if that's viable or if that would meet the needs of this scoreboard. So no, that has not been looked in from our perspective. Well, I would certainly recommend that we do look at it because if we've got a scoreboard that's not being used, that's capable of providing uh, what is required, that uh, we should again, going back to Councillor Bussier's comment about being more responsive to the taxpayers to look at our existing. If we have a scoreboard that's not being used and it can work, it's got to be cheaper to move it than it is to buy a new one. So I would encourage you to look at that. Um, my next question is, is kind of twofold. Um, so we have the funding. And again, I want to be very clear with this. I'm not questioning that the uh, project in John V is, is required or the boat dock in, in McQuire is, uh, is required. My question is, do the federal governments contribute anything to these projects? And if, if have we even asked? Through the chair to Council Grandison, are you talking about the docks? While we're talking about the docks in Fort Mackay and the playground in John Vier, both of them are highly used by the First Nations. And I'm just questioning, not again about the requirement to have them, just whether we have sought out or can get any funding or if we approach the chief and ask them to do a BCR and request that the federal government contribute to these projects. That's all my question is, are we getting federal support for projects that are supporting our First Nations communities. Through the Chair to Councillor Grandison, in my experience here, we, we, we've never gone to ask First Nations for political assistance to help get things across the finish line. We would certainly ex uh, exhaust every avenue we'd have from a, a federal and provincial government grant process, but not through uh, ways of, of BCRs. Now, <clears throat> not to say that that couldn't be effective, but it's it's not something that that we've ever looked at that, I, that I'm aware of. Uh, simply just go through municipal process and ask federal, provincial governments for grant monies if they're available. So, from my perspective, uh, C O Doyle, C A O Doyle, <laughs> um, uh, it, it just occurs to me that that I certainly am familiar with. Uh, with some of the leaders in, in these communities. And I, I can't imagine that they wouldn't want to support uh, the municipality because at some point in time, you know, we're gonna have 100 projects that we wanna complete and we're only gonna have the money for 70 and we're gonna have to start picking and choosing what projects get done. So if we can seek out additional funding, um, I, I would think we would put every effort forward in, in accomplishing that task. So I, I definitely think it's something that we need to start paying attention to moving forward. And if that requires, um, you know, I, I, again, I just can't imagine Chief and Council not wanting to do a BCR in support of a playground that supports their residents or in support of a dock which a great number of the uh, Fort Mackay First Nations will have access to and use and benefit from. I just can't imagine that they would not want to support us to ensure that we have the funding to make these projects. And if we keep doing it without asking, why would they put the effort forward? That's basically my point. So I'll leave that particular one uh, at that. And I have one last question. Uh, the Sapri Creek uh, Trail upgrade uh, Councillor Ball indicated that, uh, you know, there was quite a usage of ATVs on that trail system in Sapri um, and that we were going to put up preventative measures, which I know I lived in Apizans and the ATVs found their way around every obstacle that the municipality put up. Um, it, did we ask the community, did, did the community say we want just a pedestrian trail? Did, did we even ask that question? Because of people I know out there, 
probably would prefer an ATV trail to a to a pedestrian trail. Through the chair to Councilor Grandison, absolutely. Uh, the, we did ask the people, and this is the pedestrian trail. I think this this trail will definitely be in a different location than what's heavily used by the ATV users. So this will be more for the pedestrians. And uh, to get back to a question that was asked previously, I did phone a friend, and the uh, trail <laughs> itself is at 1.5 kilometers. Okay. Uh, so uh, based on what you just described, the pedestrian trail will be in a separate place, so those uh, off-road vehicle users will still access the trail that they've been using for what, however many years? Through the chair to... Uh, Councillor Granson, absolutely. The ATV trail is there and always put in place by those users. It's if you're in Sapre driving to uh, to Vista, it would be on the right side of the road. This this what we're looking at right now, this pedestrian trail would be on the left side. So it's, a, it's on the opposite side of the road. Okay. So it, again, to stop ATV users, it, it may be next to impossible, but this 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 one will be for pedestrians. The other side will be for ATVs, for horses, anything along those lines. Oh, that's wonderful, and I, I'm hoping that the community will police itself to keep the ATVs and the pedestrians separate. So thank you very much for your answer, sir. Thank you, Councillor Grandison. Councillor Benjoko. Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and thank you for the presentation, Kate. Uh, my question is, um, for scoreboards um, generally, I have uh, a question for uh, the cricket field downtown, it looks like there's a, a scoreboard there that hasn't been installed and it's been sitting there. I just want to know if you are going to be um, installing the uh, scoreboard there or if there's any reason why it's not yet done. Would that be uh, something that you would uh, be in charge of? To the chair, Councilor Banjoko. I'm not aware of that field. Can you, can you give me a bit more of a location or explanation of where you're talking about? Okay, I will get the, uh, more information across to you. The second question is about the walking trails. Uh, so uh, the walking trails in places like uh, Abbasand, uh, Beacon Hill, and even some of Timberley and Thickwood, um, I don't know at what point do you replace? Or oh, some of them are pretty um, damn it. Or, or are they already chair. included in your plans for the year? I see a lot of uh, works in other areas, but I didn't see a mention of Beacon Hill, uh, Thickwood, and some of our uh, Timberley areas. Thank you. Sorry, I was uh, accidentally on mute. Through the chair to Councilor Banjoko, um, through those trails, uh, we have crews out there constantly that would be uh, inspecting or assessing those trails. If there's any damage that's done or anything that needs to be fixed, if it can be done through our operating, that's how it would be uh, would be done through our operating. Uh, <clears throat> as you are aware, in previous capital plans, uh, there would have been opportunities for upgrading in infrastructure or putting in new trails. But for this year, it would just be done through the operating if there's anything identified by our teams. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Joko. Councilor Ball. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through the chair to Keith once again. Prairie Creek perimeter trail design. Um, this project's come to council before. Um, I believe it came and had four options for trail locations. I thought one was selected. Um, are we going full circle and starting this one over again? And I know there's land ownership concerns because you've got leased land that borders it, you've got a road and, and so on. Uh, are we basically starting the exercise all over? Through the chair of Councillor Ball, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you may have seen this one previously in previous budgets, and it was simply a lot of it was due to land ownership and how we can get the arrangement due to land ownership. But due to the highway now coming back to the municipality uh, being Sapphire Creek Trail, it gives us that opportunity to utilize that right away and also gives us that opportunity to really look at past options and engage back with our stakeholders to make sure that we get this trail right. Okay, that was 
my question wrong. Perfect. Um, SAP functional improvements, drainage, $1 million. I've got lots of questions about this one. I've, some of the users have spoken to me about this. As you know, I spend a little bit of my time out at that park. Um, the request is for long-term design and construction, all to be completed in 2022. I'm not sure that's achievable considering I don't believe there's any design done to date other than, I guess, visualization of where potentially water pools. Um, how did we come up with a million dollars if we haven't done a design and is the intention to go overland or underground? Sir, the chair to Councillor Ball, if you can, uh, uh, based upon our last, uh, I believe it was the last capital budget in 2021, we put forward with that study. So that study and design was done in 2021. And this is the recommendation of that uh, design and study to be implemented in 2022. The design is complete. For, I, I heard from the user group just recently, um, administration met with them and they said basically we have no idea what we're doing with it. We're just throwing a million dollars at it to see if we can fix it. Third and Chair to Councillor Ball, the assessment was completed in 2021 and based upon this assessment uh, for future design, this was the estimate that we were given, that we're given is $1 million to or work with that drainage issues. So do we know if we're treating these drainage issues as above ground overland drainage or underground solutions? This is this study that really would, looked at what's sorry, sorry that that would be the component of the design so if you don't know that i i don't think we've done a design so i, I struggle with approving this one right now because i don't think we've done a, a full design of this and the design will take the summer and that blows the construction season so i don't see how we can complete it in 2022. sir to chair to councillor ball the assessment was done in 2021 the design has definitely been started in 2021. We just don't have the finalized report. However, uh, it, it did look at what we have there existing and currently what's there and what we need that's required for the drainage issues. Okay, fair enough. But well, let me ask you this. Can you guarantee it'll be done by fall 2022? Through the chair to Councillor Ball. <sighs> that's a tough one. Um, that is our goal to do in 2022, by the end of 2022. But as you can appreciate, this world that we're living in uh, with the current pandemic, lead times, contractors, cap cap capacity, there's a multitude of different variables at play. Uh, can I guarantee it? I guarantee we will we will try our absolute best. That That's why I'm asking. So, all right, fair enough. Um, I, I, I can't support this uh, as it sits right now because I don't think it can be completed in 2022 and it makes sense for it to be done in 2023 once a full design is done in 2022. I would support funding a design component. It's important to get done on this site. Um, there are significant issues, um, but I can't support the construction of it this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Boussier. Thank you, Mayor Bowman, through the chair to Keith. Keith, if we came uh, as a council back to you and said, uh, can you cut your budget 10%, um, would you be able to still deliver the services that we do? Through the chair, Councillor Bustier, can you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah, I will be. If we say drop your budget by 10%, can you find ways in your department, and I understand it's fairly large, to continue to do what we do, do it well, and and save a couple million bucks. Through the chair to Council. Through the chair. No. Okay, Council Bush here, it's Jamie here. I, I think one we need to understand, of course, if it's operating or capital, I, I think it'd be hard. Uh, King, we, we've cut about 300 million uh, since 2016, and, and we're debt free. I think, um, We'd need to know a difference between operation and capital before we decide to cut 10% and, and what that would be. And of course, identify um, some of those and bring them, bring them back to council. I think um, Public Works, of course, is a highly front-facing group. And I think it would be tough to keep the service level if we cut it by 10%. I think something would, something would need to give. 
um, unless we, I really don't know. I think we'd have to really look at it first. I think it'd be premature for us to answer that just yet. Uh, I guess I just where I go with this CEO Doyle is, is I know I've had to cut our budget, our family budget, and I know most people given what's, you know, happened over the last few years in this community, we've all had to make adjustments. Um, and I'm not saying the RM hasn't, I'm just, we look at these numbers and they continue to be fairly large. Just for example, the Father Mercury, and, and maybe someone asked us that the score clock for $100,000 for replacement, do we not have insurance on it? Doesn't insurance replace it? I'm assuming not because we're asking council for $100,000. So why wouldn't we have insurance? Maybe it's not, maybe it's not an insurable product. Um, do we need to go out and buy 10 brand new vehicles this year? Maybe we could, like 120,000 kilometers on a vehicle isn't a lot, and that was one of the numbers mentioned. So um, just some simple questions, CEO. I just asked a simple question if he could, and he doesn't have to answer it now, I guess. Um, but I believe there are, are um, avenues through this budget that we could probably save some money without impacting our customers or our residents. Just, I think, you know, I just, again, CEO Doyle, I drive around other communities and I look at their vehicles and then I drive around our via, uh, our city and I look at some of our employees driving Tahoes and everything else and brand newer vehicles and, and expensive vehicles and you don't see that that much in other communities. Like, and I just wonder if there's an opportunity to save some money, but I don't need any more answers, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Boussier. Is there any other questions for count, of Council? We can now call upon environmental services. Good afternoon, Mayor and Councillor. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Antoine Ramp. I'm the Director of the Environmental Services Department, and I'm pleased to present our proposed 2022 capital budget. As you can see in this table, all our projects fall under the public facilities category. The budget that will be carried forward into 2022 from previous years is $80.975 million. Our proposed budget for 2022 is 47.73 million, while our proposed budget for the following five years will be 128.7 million. This brings our total budget to just to 257.405 million. The first project that we'd like to cover today is the construction of the Confederation Waste Sanitary Sewer Phase 2. This project is for the construction of a sanitary sewer line along Confederation Way between the Eagle Ridge overpass and the wastewater treatment plant. This new sanitary sewer will improve the capacity of our current system in the Timberley area and help us remain compliant with current regulations. This is a multi-year project that was started back in 2016 and the request for 2022 is $9 million, with an additional $2 million for 2023 for a total budget of $44 million. This drawing shows the section of pipes that will be directionally drilled under Highway 63 as part of this project. The next project is the construction of the Sanderson Pressure Reducing Valve, also called PRV. This project is to replace the existing freeway PRV chamber that is currently at the end of its useful life and construct a new water main along McDonald Avenue and Biggs Avenue. The remaining deep municipal utilities will also be replaced in streets that are disrupted to minimize future impacts to the finished areas. The design is complete and we are working on a tender package to be posted by mid-February 2022. The budget for 2022 is $5 million, with an additional $16 million in 2023 
and $8 million in 2024 for a total of $29 million. This drawing shows the streets and areas that will be impacted by this project in the next few years, along with the directional drilling under Highway 63. The next project is the construction of the Fort Chippewa One lift station upgrades. This project is for the reconstruction of three lift stations in Fort Chippewa One that were showing detrimental conditions in their mechanical, structural, and electrical components and required replacement. This project was started in 2020, and we are currently sitting at 70% completion. The request for 2022 is $5 million to complete and commission all three lift stations. We're expecting this project to be completed in 2022, so no further ask for the following years. The total budget for this project was $30 million. Here's a picture of one of the three lift stations that are currently being rebuilt. The next project is the A-frame road paving, lift station, and sanitary force main installation. The scope of this project is to pave the road as well as install a new sanitary lift station and sanitary force main, which will serve the 65 acres of industrial land east of the airport. Construction was started in July 2021 and is currently sitting at 25% with a completion date of Q4 of 2023. The request for 2022 is $5.3 million on our outgoing contract to complete the first lift of asphalt, complete the force main, and continue work on the lift station with an additional 1 million in 2023 for a total budget of 12.8 million. Here's a drawing that shows the section of roads that will be repaved just east of the Fort McMurray Airport. The next project is the Fort McMurray Landfill Closure Cell 123 Lateral Expansion and Old Landfill. Closing cells at the old landfill is needed to remain compliant with provincial regulations. There are no funds being requested for 2022 as the $500,000 that was approved in previous years will be carried into 2022. An additional $6 million will be needed in the following five years, starting in 2023, for a total budget for this project of $6.5 million. Here's an aerial photo of the old landfill that would be closed through this project. The next project is the design and construction of the Anzac Lagoon expansion. Expanding the existing lagoon is required to support the rural water and sewer servicing in Anzac as the existing lagoon doesn't meet the capacity requirements. Along with the lagoon expansion, we will also upgrade lift station A1 and install a new force main to the lagoon. This project is important as it will enable the RMWB to operate the wastewater system in accordance with environmental regulations. The design started in June 2021 and is currently at 95%. The design is planned to be completed by end of February 2022 and construction to start in 2022. The request for 2022 is 1 million with an additional 12 million in 2023 for a total of 16.5 million. This drawing shows the proposed expansion of the Anzac Lagoon. This project was formally named the Fort McMurray Water Treatment Plant Rehabilitation Program, which you may have seen in previous documentation. The name was changed to Fort McMurray Water Treatment Plant Process Improvement, Design and Construction to better reflect the scope of the project. The project began in 2021 with an assessment of the river intake, raw water pump house and ponds, as well as the entire water treatment plant. The objective of the assessment was to identify areas of improvement for operational safety and compliance issues, emergency response, condition assessment, asset management, security, and process optimization. 
This will allow the municipality to maintain the asset in acceptable condition, improve safety and reliability, and ensure the preservation or extension of the lifespan of the asset. We have no request for 2022 as the carry forward of 1.5 million will suffice for the needs of 2022. The budget for the five subsequent years is $12.6 million for a total budget of 14.7 million. This is an aerial view of the water treatment plant in Fort McMurray. The next project is a rehabilitation and construction of the King Street booster station. This booster station is nearly at the end of its 50 year design life. A consulting engineering firm reviewed the current status of all aspects of the station and the outcome of the detailed engineering review was the need for the replacement and repair of the process and control equipment. The design of this project is complete and construction has started. The request for 2022 is $1.5 million, which will allow us to continue with construction activities. The project is anticipated to be completed by September of this year. The total budget for this project is $3.8 million. This is a photo of the King Street booster station. The next project is the construction of the Conklin Sewage Lagoon. The existing lagoon in Conklin needs to be expanded to meet the increased demands of the residential and commercial areas of Conklin after the completion of the rural water and sewer servicing. This project will ensure we continue to meet regulatory compliance. RFT is planned for Q1 of 2022 for the 2022-2023 construction season. Currently, design is 90% and will be completed by March 2022. The request for 2022 is $7 million, with an additional $6.7 million in 2023 for a total budget of $13.9 million. This is an earlier view of the proposed layout of the lagoon expansion. The next project is the construction of the water and sanitary sewer in Fort Chippewa. While this project was originally budgeted in 2021, it was tendered at the end of November 2021, but was pulled off the market to give additional time to complete an engineering exercise to look at ways to potentially reduce costs while continuing to maintain the level of service required for the community. Because of the reduced window with the winter road, and the need to get that engineering exercise completed, we will not ask for any money for 2022, but will require $28.4 million for the following five years. Here's an overview of the water and sanitary sewer in Fort Chippewa. The next project is the design of the Fort Mackay water supply infrastructure rehabilitation. In simpler words, this project is for the new river intake on the Erz River and the raw water line between that intake and the Fort Mackay water treatment plant. That new piece of infrastructure will have an enhanced supply capacity sized to meet the projected 25 year community growth needs. We are not asking for any new fund in 2022 as the carry forward of 500,000 will suffice to design the pipeline. We will ask for an additional 1.5 million in 2023 for a total budget of $2 million. Here's an aerial photo of the current river intake from which the water is pumped to the Fort Mackay water treatment plant. The next project is the design and construction of the Fort McMurray wastewater treatment plant process improvements. This project is required to address critical equipment in the facility requiring upgrades or replacements to improve safety, efficiency, life cycle costs, maintainability, and reliability to continue to meet safety and regulatory compliance. We're not asking for any money in 2022, but the budget for the following five years is 9.05 million. Here's a picture of the wastewater churn plant in Fort McMurray. The next project 
is the design of the Janvier water treatment plant upgrades. The Janvier water treatment plant is a critical asset for the communities of Janvier and Chippewan Prairie First Nations. The current plant was built 25 years ago and needs several modifications and upgrades. This project will include all components of the water treatment system, including the raw water intake, pump house, pond, treatment plant, and piping. We are not asking for any money in 2022 because we need to confirm the water supply first, but we're expecting to come back to council in 2023 for 1.1 million. The $100,000 that was approved in 2021 will be carried forward to start the design at the end of 2022 after we receive the results from the water supply study, which is a part of our operating budget. Here is an aerial picture of the water treatment plant in Janvier, along with the raw water pond. The next project is the design and construction of the Timberley Reservoir and Pump House. The Timberley Reservoir and the Pump House have been in operations since 1981. As such, they are both approaching the end of their design life and need to be replaced. This project would be to refurbish the Timberley Pump House and Reservoir so they can continue to meet the current needs of the community and also have capacity for future growth. We are not asking for any money in 2022. There is a $332,000 carry forward that will suffice for the design of the RFP. We are in pre-design stage and construction will begin in 2023. The budget for the following five years is 6.5 million. Here's a picture of the Timberley Reservoir and Pump House. The next project is the construction of the waterline extension from the Parsons Creek Reservoir to Millennium Drive. This new waterline will allow the Parsons Creek Reservoir to provide redundancy, including fire flow, to the Timberley distribution system. The design for this project is complete. The budget that was approved in 2021 will be carried forward into 2022, and we're asking for an additional 4.05 million to complete the project in 2022. The total budget for this project is 5.775 million. This aerial photo shows the approximate location of the water line. The alignment, once final, will generally follow open park space. The next project is the construction of the waterline extension from the Parsons Creek Reservoir to Tiganova. This new waterline will allow the Parsons Creek Reservoir to provide supply redundancy to the existing water network in Tiganova and address water pressure issues experienced in the Timberley distribution supply along the North Highway 63 corridor and within Tiganova. The design was completed in 2021. The budget that was approved in 2021 will be carried forward into 2022, and we're asking for an additional 3.2 million to complete the project in 2022. The total budget for this project is 4.95 million. This drawing shows the approximate location of the waterline between the Parsons Creek community and the Tiganova Eco Industrial Park. The next project is installation of groundwater monitoring wells. Multiple groundwater monitoring wells were identified in the urban and rural areas following a discussion with Alberta Environments and Park. This is a regulatory requirement. $100,000 will be carried forward from 2021, and we're asking for an additional 580000 in 2022 for a total budget of 680000 This is a photo of a groundwater monitoring well. The next project is the design and construction of the Wood Buffalo lift station replacement. The existing lift station is reaching the end of its life cycle and the replacement will ensure a continued level of service for the Wood Buffalo area. This is a safety and regulatory requirement. 
the budget request for 2022 is $100,000, which will mostly go towards design, while the remaining 4.75 million is requested for the following five years for a total budget of 4.8 million. This is a photo of the existing wood Buffalo Leaf Station. The next project is the design and construction of the rural control system replacement. A new automation control system is required for the entire region. We are starting this project with the rural communities for scale and timing reasons. The current control systems in the rural will become obsolete in 2026 and the proposed replacement components will be phased in over the next three years. The budget request for 2022 is $400,000 followed by an additional 2.6 million for the following five years for a total of $3 million. The rural automation control system will ensure higher reliability, performance, and security against cyber threats. The next project is the construction of the Conklin water trim plant upgrades. This project will provide the components necessary to operate a second treatment train and a sophisticated resilient control system for operations. Having a second treatment train will ensure the capability to operate during marginal weather conditions and allow for safe operations in case of equipment failure in one of the treatment trains. The design for this project is 90% complete and will be completed in 2022. Construction will also begin in 2022 and is anticipated to be completed in 2023. The request for 2022 is $500,000, with an additional 3 million for subsequent years for a total of 3.5 million. Here's a photo of the current treatment infrastructure inside the Conklin water treatment plant. The next project is a design of the Fort Chipper One reservoir capacity expansion. Additional reservoir capacity is required for the Fort Chipper One Potable Water Supply Resilience. Should the water treatment, plant, water treatment plant be shut down for any significant length of time, this additional reservoir capacity will give us more redundancy. So the legislated fire storage capacity needs for the community will also benefit from additional reservoir capacity. The request for 2022 is $100,000 to start on the design with an additional $500,000 in 2023. Here's an aerial view of the Fort Chipper One Reservoir and Old Pump House. The next project is the construction of the Gregoire Storm outfall structure. This new outfall structure is the last piece of infrastructure of the storm system upgrades that were recently completed in the area to materialize and alleviate stresses on the storm system during major rain events. This will help reduce the probability of flooding in the area and improve our regulatory compliance. The budget request for 2022 is $3 million with an additional 7 million in 2024 for a total of $10 million. This is a drawing that shows the location of the new outfall structure. The last project on my list is the construction of the Janvier Sewage Lagoon outfall extension. This project consists of extending the Janvier Sewage Lagoon outfall. The scope of work also includes tree clearing, new sanitary manholes and pipes, a gravel road, ditch realignment, landscaping, and environmental approvals. The budget request for 2022 is $2 million, and the plan is to complete this work in 2022. This is a drawing showing the location of the proposed lagoon outfall extension. This concludes my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. And uh, this is just a comment, uh, Antoine. Uh, I want to thank you for your presentation. I appreciate the environmental upgrades to meet regulatory compliance and the requirements to maintain current service levels. 
in John VA, Anzac, Conklin, and Gregoire Lake Estates. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Stroud. Councilor Ball. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Through the chair to Antoine, um, I think I might need to phone a friend after hearing all of that. Uh, quite a quite a list of chores to do by the looks of things. I've I've only got one question uh, relative to the Fort Mackay um, water supply infrastructure rehabilitation. Uh, it's a design project, I believe. Um, there was no money budgeted for 2022. Um, when was it intended that that would be completed? And is it possible that you could do some of the design work this year? For the chair to Councillor Barr, thank you for the question. So the reason why we are not asking for any money in 2022 is because the project started in 2021 and we're carrying forward $100,000 that we had from 2021. The plan is to complete the design this year and then start the construction in 2023. Oh, okay. Thank you. I must have read that wrong. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Grandison. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. Uh, Antoine, thank you for your <laughs> very extensive presentation of uh, up, updates and upgrades. And it, it sounds like we're catching up on some work that has uh, been needed for a time. So my question is, and, I, and I'm going to sound like a broken record. So back in the 80s, when the water treatment plant was built in Fort Mackay, and I'll use that one as an example, the funding for that project was 90% federal through INAC and 10% provincial. And yet this budget looks like it's 100% municipal, uh, despite the fact that uh, the water treatment plant services the First Nations. And once again, I'm gonna ask, am, am I wrong in this or has there been any federal contributions in any way, shape or form for this project? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, that is a good question. And um, depending on the, the area, we share the cost, especially on the operating side, where we get reimbursed by Indigenous Service Canada for some of the work we do in Janvier and in Fort Mackay. In terms of the capital projects, in order for us to be able to receive funding from ISC or Indigenous Serving Service Canada, we need to make sure that they're involved very early on in the project. So we are taking those steps currently to have them come to the table. So when we get into construction mode, we're hoping that they're gonna be able to help carry the load. In terms of design, because of the complexity and the timeline and knowing that we have to get caught up with some of that infrastructure, we're carrying most of that cost, but that cost is much smaller than the construction cost. So our objective, for especially Janvier, for Mackay, where we have split ownership in the asset, is to really get support from ISC to get their share of the funding in the construction phases. Uh, which I can appreciate, but uh, um, uh, have we been successful in the past? Again, I know that project was built because 90% of the water volume that's delivered through that water treatment plant services the First Nations with a small portion serving the Métis on the south side of the community. I, 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 this is gonna be a point of contention throughout my time on council is that we are finding more progressive and aggressive ways to ensure that the federal government is assuming responsibility. It, it, let me ask you this question in a different way. If they don't come to the table with money, will we go ahead with municipal tax dollars and complete the project? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, great question. If they decided not to participate in the cost of construction, I would say that we're still going to have to proceed because we have to provide potable water to the residents. And especially even if we only have 10% of that population that falls under our jurisdiction, we can't just ignore those 10% because we're not getting support for the other 90%. So therein lies part of the, 
if I was the federal government, I wouldn't come to the table if you were going to foot the bill either. I would just drag it out until such time as you paid for it and say, oh, geez, too bad, sucks to be you. Um, kind of puts our back against the wall in terms of these. So, so here's my next question. What if we didn't upgrade the water line? Are we capable of supplying enough potable water for the community as it exists right now? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, great question. We are due for an upgrade. Like we have had an incident this year or in 2021 where we had a leak in our system and the amount of water we could draw from the river wasn't allowing us to keep up with the waters that we were losing in our system. So we are we need an upgrade. We don't have a we don't have an opportunity to wait another year or two. We are overdue for an upgrade. So we can't really hit pause until we can get the funding from ISC. But that being said, we have we are in communications. We have regular meetings with the First Nation group and the Métis group in Fort Mackay. And we are confident that ISC is going to come to the table because Fort Mackay has not received that much funding over the years. So I think we have a good chance of getting funding for Fort Mackay. And Janvier is another example where we have approached ISC and we've had meetings with the First Nation and ISC to discuss some of these upgrades that we're planning because Janvier is going to require a much more significant upgrade in the next few years compared to Fort Mackay. So as the need for joint funding in Janvier is going to be even greater. But we have approached, we have had conversations with ISC and the the response was favorable for the capital side of things. Well, I, I'm certainly hopeful that your optimism uh, turns into some financial support from the federal. Hey, I guess in all of these communities, you know, the federal government has made an election platform of ensuring that they upgrade the services to our First Nations communities across the whole country. And I would hope that just because we have existing infrastructure, whether it be John VA, Fort Chippewan, or Fort Mackay, that, that we don't get forgotten versus, you know, I mean, that certainly has been a commitment from the federal government and it, uh, just so you know, and, and I think uh, uh, Jamie's well aware <laughs> that this is not gonna be something that I'm going to let go because I, I think we need to collaboratively work with our First Nations and Métis leaderships collectively to ensure that the province and the federal government are, are ponying up their, their contributions because if we pay for it, if I were them, I wouldn't offer either. But thank you very much for your answers and, and your knowledge with regards to this whole issue, Antoine. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Grandison. Councilor Boussier. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bowman, and through the chair, D'Antoine. Thanks for the presentation, sir. Just one simple question. When I look at uh, the capital budget, both for the Conklin Sewage Lagoon and the Anzac Loot, Lagoon expansion, obviously both required and needed. Would the $30 million that's um, earmarked for that project be included in the rural water and sewer when I asked the question an hour ago, hour and a half ago? For the chair to Councillor Bussier, great question. For the um, Anzac Lagoon expansion, that project has three components to it. One is an upgrade of the lift station uh, an installation of a force main between the lift station and the lagoon and the lagoon. So the lift station upgrades and the pipe are included as part of the RWSS. The lagoon expansion itself is the one that we're covering outside of that budget. And uh, for the Conklin project, uh, I just have to check here. I might not have the answer just right this minute, hey, but um, I can get it to you. To the chair, chair Antoine, it's not I, I just send me an email later. It's not important. I just, I'm just trying to put a, a number on this whole rural water and sewer uh, expansion project. And I'm just wondering if sometimes we hide um, items in other departments. So if you're telling me that you guys would um, include whatever's in these two projects as part of the rural water, then I'm fine with that. If you're telling me that, I believe you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilor Boussier. Councilor Joko. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. 
And thanks for the presentation, though is a whole lot to take in for, especially if you are not an engineer. Um, so my question is uh, for the number of projects that is being done, what is the plan for local vendors' engagement and their participation? Uh, looking, I mean, at the impact this could have in terms of creation of jobs and also circulation of funds within our region. Also, do you have uh, KPIs, uh, target spend uh, for the indigenous uh, um, business communities? Thank you. Then uh, for um, Waterline water extension from Passing Creek to Millennium, um, I didn't understand uh, what you mean by uh, redundancy which will provide supply redundancy. Uh, if you could just uh, clarify, I know that might be a technical terminology, but my main question is the first question, the local economy. Thank you. Mr. Chair to Councillor Banjoko, thank you for the questions. So first question in terms of uh, supporting local, a lot of these projects are gonna have a dollar value that is gonna exceed the threshold where we can directly get quotes from local vendors, but the procurement process, and, and uh, Rachel, Director of Procurement, might jump in here, but we are working on, oh, it's already implemented that new procurement process that is going to encourage local and indigenous partners. But um, so that's that's pretty much the answer I would give, and I, I welcome Rachel or, or CEO Doyle to jump in. And for the second question, I can give you a quick, quick answer right now, the Timberley Pump House and Reservoir that is also one of the projects on the list here is supplying water for the Timberley area. And we also can use the Fickwood uh, Reservoir and Pump House. But if we have repairs to be made in one of those, especially in the Timberley Reservoir and Pump House, we have a hard time maintaining proper pressures and fire flows by using the other option we have on the system. By adding that new line, it allows us to have a, when I say redundancy, we're gonna have a new reservoir and pump house that is gonna give us that supply from a third, third point. So that's why we call it redundancy. Thank you. Um, again, I think um, um, we would like, or I would like a more, precise answer to local spend uh, priorities, the plans, and if CAO has some comments around that. I think uh, the community right now, we are at the point where uh, people are demanding for more of the spend locally. We have to make intentional plans to spend some of the monies that we are spending, construction, purchases, supplies, materials within the region. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Benjoko, uh, thank you, thank you for the question. Um, Rachel can certainly chime in after I'm, after I'm done speaking, but it's it's a common, I don't want to say issue, but it's a common struggle for us as we can't just issue contracts uh, and tenders to local vendors. It's it goes against the the trade agreements, so we put our RFPs and tenders and things of that nature out on uh, public notice so everybody has a fair chance to to bid on them uh, but I know firsthand that we can't we cannot um, I guess simply just give local folks work as much as we'd all want to um, I think if if they're competitive and they bid correctly and they, they can be successful but unfortunately we just can't dictate it all be local Rachel do you have anything you want to add to that Thank you, CAO Doyle, and through the chair. Um, we, I agree that what you've said is very accurate. We cannot, we have to adhere to our posting thresholds. Um, however, we are very pleased to mention um, that we have implemented a social procurement, um, our social procurement program, which will be specific to requests for proposals and requests for tender, or sorry, requests for uh, quotations. <coughs> Um, and phase two of this is looking at how then we can develop some type of community benefit agreement specific for the tender work. But we cannot give any preference to local. It would not, uh, it would go against our trade, trade, 
trade treaty agreement obligations. So how then do we ensure some local spend, some level of uh, local spend? Because we can, even if the main contractors are from anywhere, we can always um, ask that they demonstrate some sort of local spend, part of the purchases, no? Or part of the jobs, I don't know. I think that should be possible in our procurement process. And uh, if it's not, maybe it's something we can look at in future. I don't know if we have anything that will restrain us from doing that. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Banjoko. Uh, thanks again for the question. And Rachel, feel free to chime in as well. Unfortunately, it's, it's just not that easy to, I guess, dictate what uh, and who award winners subcontract work to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, good bids could end up being successful bids. So I guess I'll leave that there. However, the opportunity that you guys do have, which Councilor McGrath has certainly uh, utilized and they, they know him quite well, is through the, the RMA and AUMA to help advocate um, through those bodies to the provincial and federal governments to help us navigate through our trade agreements to be a bit more sustainable with our business communities to allow us some of that latitude uh, to um, give work to locals. Um, but unfortunately, it hasn't been, it hasn't been fruitful just yet. Uh, Rachel, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I do not. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That would be it. Thank you, Councilor Bujoko. Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and through to Rachel. Uh, we are working on the social procurement policy, though, uh, which will allow local vendors. Uh, I know there's a limit. Uh, I think it's believe it's 200,000 for construction and 75,000 for services, but we do have that uh, in place. Do we, Rachel? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, Councillor Stroud. Yes, those would be our tactics that we have been able to implement for the social procurement program specific to low value um, and below threshold. So that would be, as you had stated, um, below $75,000 for goods and services or $200,000 for construction activities. Thank you, Antoine. Do we have any questions from council regarding environmental services? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Antoine. We can move on with to Brad from uh, Planning and Development. What can we opine on? Good afternoon, Mayor and, and members of Council. My name is Brad McMurdo. I'm the Director of Planning and Development. And before you today to present the proposed 2022 capital budget for the planning and development department. Planning and development is the sponsoring department for the waterfront park revitalization project. The delivery department is the parks branch within public works. The overall project improvements will span from McDonald Island Parkway or causeway to Horse Pasture Park in waterways, spanning roughly six kilometers. In 2022, we are requesting a total of $15 million for initiating construction of the Sny Point outdoor event space and continued design work for the entire waterfront park boundary. This will also support the improvements required for the 2023 Arctic Winter Games. The Waterfront Park is a priority project for downtown revitalization and is a significant benefit for the region's residents and visitors. It is supported by the 2018 to 2021 Strategic Plan, the Parks Master Plan, Downtown Area Redevelopment Plan, and the Waterfront Advisory Committee of Council. The project provides an opportunity for the, for the municipality to meaningfully support truth and reconciliation Significant engagement with community, Indigenous partners, and regional stakeholders has been completed to date, highlighting strong support and excitement for this project. 
comprehensive feedback from this process in 2021 shaped the park's final concept design. Going forward, the Waterfront Park project will provide design and construction services to create a passive and interactive park space along the waterfront. It will be designed for use all year round, including outdoor event space, recreation areas, destination nodes, and the inclusion of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous public art, culture, and heritage. The park and event spaces will provide enhanced opportunities for community gathering and celebration, as well as have a positive impact on downtown businesses, further su supporting our local economy. We are working closely with the 2023 Arctic Winter Games team to ensure coordination and site readiness to host this important event. Beyond this, the project is also, uh, sorry, also addresses major infrastructure improvements, such as roads, site drainage, lighting, underground infrastructure, and utilities, uh, while providing permanent flood, flood mitigation to the one to 200 year elevation in coordination with uh, other departments, capital projects. Here is a concept design for the waterfront park where year round outdoor recreational opportunities will be encouraged and celebrated. For contextual purposes, this is a rendering of Horse Pasture Park. The McDonald Island, sorry, the McDonald Drive green space includes the design and construction of the causeway adjacent to the Athabasca River. This project will aesthetically improve the area and provide further waterfront connectivity as part of the waterfront project. Although we are not requesting funds in 2022, our waterfront park project team will continue to design the space with construction commencing in 2023. Here is a concept for the McDonald's Drive green space where, where pedestrian connectivity to McDonald Island Park, the new Métis Cultural Center, as well as the Total Interpretive Trail, the SNI and downtown is greatly improved. Celebration of our rich Indigenous history and culture will be significant here. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for the presentation. Councillor Ball? Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Through the chair to uh, Brad McMurdo. Um, just, just looking at the numbers here, you've got $6 million approved for 2021 and prior and an additional 15 this year. Um, is the intention to spend $21 million in construction this year? Or roughly? Through the chair to Councillor Ball. Uh, that is correct. We are anticipating um, spending a significant portion of the monies this year uh, to uh, uh, commence construction uh, this season and uh, meet the deadlines for the Alberta Winter Games, which I believe will be hosted in either January or February of, of next year. Um, so uh, aside from simply construction, there will be further design work that needs to occur for phase two, which is um, everything beyond essentially this, this the SNI design area, so um, everything along Reach Reach 6, um, all the way down to Forest Pasture Park. Okay, so some of, some of these uh, costs will be for design for doing the phase two uh, of the project. I wasn't aware of that. Um, what Do you know what phase we're at or, or stage we're at with uh, construction ready drawings for tender? Through the chair to Councillor Ball, for phase one, we are at 100% uh, completion of the uh, of the drawings. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair, um, maybe a loaded question, but I'll ask it anyway. So, based on the drawing that you showed me, uh, the conceptual drawing, um, we have a temporary structure up along the Athabasca right now and the development is that through where that temporary structure is currently standing? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Grandison, are you referring to the image uh, that I shared uh, for Horse Pasture Park? No, along McDonald Drive along the Athabasca there. Oh, my, my apologies. Um, yes, uh, so that does, the the image that I've shared does cover that causeway area. 
there are some existing infrastructures, uh, both, uh, I'll say, temporary and permanent. Uh, so obviously the permanent structures that are in place we would be working around uh, and integrate those into the design. Um, and then um, the other structures that are in place, uh, we'd have to obviously uh, uh, address those in the future as well as we design that space. Okay, thank you. I Just from the picture, I was assuming that, but I wasn't 100% sure. So this uh, pad, if you will, um, well, maybe I'll frame this differently. In terms of the community consultation, what kind of participation did you get? What kind of numbers, if I may ask? Through the chair to Councillor Grannison, it's a good question. The engagement has been uh, rather, I'll say, extensive. Um, broken up into two different uh, priority areas. Uh, so SNI, the SNI Point Outdoor Event Space, um, I'll speak to that one first. Uh, we had we commenced online engagement to understanding um, the restrictions uh, with, with the pandemic. Uh, we received 450 survey responses. Uh, there were um, over, I'll say, 3,000 individuals reached through social media platforms as well as uh, 17 virtual workshops and open houses, which uh, included 98 participants. With respect to uh, the priority area two, uh, again, uh, online engagement uh, was the tool that we used, um, or the means that we used. Uh, 567 survey responses were received, uh, over 62,000 um, direct reaches through social media platforms, uh, largely in response to a video that was created um for the area as well as 12 virtual workshops and open houses uh which included 61 participants i will say that uh, we're grateful to work with the waterfront uh, committee um, of council and uh you know working with that community has certainly helped advance this project and make sure that uh, we are engaging all stakeholders now, there's been direct uh, engagement with the indigenous community as well um, i can speak to uh, like as an example the atc uh, had provided us with great feedback that we integrated into uh, into this project. Um, we again want to recognize the long history and and um, you know the the use of this space. Um, the indigenous community has been very clear with us that it's uh, it's 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 important uh, to them, and and we need to make sure that we included some of their considerations into the actual design itself. Yep, one hundred percent agree. Um... In this community consultation, was there ever a price tag attached to any of the community's desires and wishes for this? Or was it just, what do you want? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, I do not believe that we had um, dollar amounts associated uh, with different elements as part of uh, the engagement component. Um, what I will say is that we were cognizant of the, um, I'll say the history of, of flooding. Uh, and ice flooding, uh, to be more specific. So we were, um, I'll say we were certainly aware and, and cognizant in, um, in the conversation with the public as well as the manner in which we were going to include certain uh, elements with uh, physical elements in the design so that uh, costs weren't going to be sort of thrown away, if I can, if I can use that term. So we, were, we respected uh, Mother Nature and, and the damage that uh, she can cause. Which, again, I appreciate. The only reason I'm asking the question is, and I've brought this up before, when we do community consultation without a press tag, I mean, if you ask me what I want, I'm going to tell you the Taj Mahal. But if you tell me I have to pay for it, it's going to cost me $30 million. The answers to my, your questions might change dramatically. Um, I, when I was running for office, I didn't hear any support of any kind from any of the people I talked to for spending this much money on a project of this nature. So I'm somewhat perplexed. And, and again, I get back to, you know, when we developed Mac Island and we said, what do you want? We ended up with a underutilized baseball diamond and, and uh, CFL sports field um, because there was no price tags attached to it, just to a wish list. So if I can have anything I want without paying for it, it looks very different than if I as a taxpayer have to pay for it. So having said that, if you could carve out, and I don't know if you have the answer to the staging area, if you will, um, that's going to be up in behind Sarik is up in there somewhere. What's the price tag related to that specific piece of the project? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison. Uh, it's a good question. Um, certainly appreciate your remarks as well. Uh, my 
understanding is that the approximate cost to develop priority area one is about 20, oh, I'll say about $26 million. And, and again, and I've certainly, you know, um, and I know they're apples and oranges to a certain extent, but we, we have a capacity staging area to run events already built at, at uh, on the island. And yes, there may be a cost associated, but I wonder if, if uh, those costs were subsidized for community events to the tune of X amount of millions of dollars, how many years would they last rather than creating a second staging area for those type of events versus the ones that already exist? We've already spent millions of dollars buying a football field that's not used and, and uh, the RSC has invested in uh, the capacity to uh, egress and, and so on and so forth onto that space covering for the entire field and everything else, which so much can be done, and yet we're talking about creating something very similar at another spot hundreds of yards away. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Would that be accurate, do you think? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, um, McDonald Island has been the host of uh, events both internal and external um, the external ones for example I would say um, you know at the, the carnival that, that comes to town I've um, you know, brought my family there of course um, I think that the intent of this project is to capitalize on the existing use of the space um, you know we have hosted several events down in uh, in I'll say on Sky Point or in that area um, and it causes, like, I wouldn't say irreparable damage, but it causes damage to the park to the point where um, future events are either um, potentially at jeopardy or the uh, use of the space to the general public um, is is disrupted uh, significantly. And one of the major investments in this this uh, area is the, is what's referred to as the Great Lawn, which is a um, a space that's intended to accommodate special events, accommodate vehicles. Um, of that nature that have caused damage in the past, um, as well as, you know, music events and things like that. There's a uh, stage. Um, but again, this, this just for clarity, uh, this, this, uh, the money that I've, uh, the $26 million that I've referenced spans from essentially, I'll say Snipe Point all the way to the causeway. So it's not simply just in that one particular focused area, but it's that whole, that whole space between the Athabasca and from here. And, I, and I, I do get that, which is why, you know, wanted to reference the cost, because because at the end end of the day, if uh, how many millions are we going to spend so we can ensure we have, uh, you know, events like Ribfest and so on and so forth, when those events could actually be done at McDonald Island, where the infrastructure already exists, um, and we don't have to worry about the damage. We have parking, we have all of the facilities and the ability to host events like that without any ongoing damage or concern for the future. Because again, in my, uh, the people that I've spoke to love the natural beauty of the SNI, love the natural beauty of the area more so than any more development. So I'm just somewhat perplexed and trying to get a better understanding. So that that's basically all I can add at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gradison. Councilor Boussier? Yes, yeah, th thank you, Mayor Bowman. Unfortunately, I have an appointment that I need to get to, so I'm gonna vacate the chambers, but I do have, one question, not for Mr. McMurdo, but for Linda. Um, I hope you can answer it, just regarding the budget. Um, through the chair to Linda. Just curious if, um, as we move from an 18 one to five to one ratio, where are we now with this year Mm -hmm. and assuming we're not at the five to one, which I don't think we are, what will be the impact to the overall? And again, it, obviously you don't have the exact numbers, but when we get to five to one, what's going to be the uh, dollar value that we have to work with moving forward with budgets? Through the chair to Council Boussier, you're correct. We're not at the five to one at this particular time. We're uh, just above seven to one. Uh, and I don't know what it would be with this particular budget because the assessments are not c complete. Correct. Uh, as for uh, the number that we could go down to, uh, it, that's a hard question to answer as well. 
uh, because our operating costs are going up as we bring in more and more assets to 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 maintain and operate. Um, but the amount probably would be between the 460 to 450 um, amount. 460 million? Approximately. Okay. I don't want to be okay. uh, quoted well, on that. Well, the good news is you'll be gone in a couple of weeks. So even <laughs> if you give me the wrong answer, I can't get to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no so it's somewhere between 450 and 500 million, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, Linda. Any other questions from council? I don't see any there, but thanks, Brad. Just a quick question for myself. Um, some of the costs associated with the uh, cost of Waterfront Park, are we looking at, does that include a lot of the flood mitigation in those reaches that it covers? Uh, thank you to, to the chair. Um, it's a great question for phase one, uh, which again is the SNI uh, outdoor area. Um, yes, it, it does include the top up as, as previously, uh, I'll say approved by the previous council and um, bringing us up to the 250.9. Um, in terms of in terms of phase two, um, the reason why we are still uh, working towards design is because we're working closely with the engineering department as well as other departments in the organization, environmental services being another. Um, to fully appreciate what the impacts of flood mitigation might be. And if uh, uh, if there's an opportunity to certainly uh, remove redundancy or overlap, then we've built that into this project. Um, so we're, you know, when, when and where possible, we will look after uh, flood mitigation. Um, and uh, in areas where uh, flood mitigation, um, the implementation side of it remains to be seen, then we work closely with engineering uh, to ensure that there isn't any uh, throwaway costs as a result. Super, that's great to hear. Um, second question, I don't know if it would be for you or the Waterfront Development uh, Group Commission com uh, Committee we have. Uh, that SNI point, like uh, Councillor Gratis had mentioned as a staging area, but that events area, is that going to be use, uh, able to be used by the public the same way the SNI point's used now? Uh, it's at a quite a low cost for the user and uh, provides a great spot for uh, local festivals such as the Ribfest, for example. Through the chair to the chair, um, that's exactly the intent. The intent is to uh, celebrate uh, what we currently have, uh, celebrate that natural space and, and access to the river, um, but certainly, um, you know, through trails and, and, in fact, even accessibility has been a major, a major concern or a major consideration that's been integrated into the design. Um, so strollers or anyone that has uh, barrier-free needs will be easily accommodated uh, in the new design. Um, but it's intended to be year-round use for families um, as well as have the capacity to um, host those special events that uh, our, com our community uh, uh, loves and, and you know mitigate any future damage uh, that we've had over the years with some of these events. Perfect. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for your presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll we'll take a, now take a 10-minute break, so we'll come back at 3.56. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir, for the break. Welcome back. I'll now call upon uh, Regional Sur Emergency Services, uh, Chief Jody Butts, please. Good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Jody Butts, and I'm the Regional Fire Chief and Director of Emergency Management. 
Today, I'm pleased to present our proposed 2022 capital budget for regional emergency services. As a summary, the RES proposed 2022 capital budget is $5,069,000 over nine capital projects, which are all determined as replacement and or maintenance projects. Five of them are related to vehicles transportation, totaling approximately $2.8 million. Our first project, RES is requesting $130,000 to replace five of our EMS defibrillators called life packs. The defibrillators provide treatment for life-saving procedures during medical emergencies, such as cardiac defibrillation and cardiopulmonary monitoring. The requested funds will replace obsolete monitors that are no longer supported with updated technology. Our second project, RES is requesting $65,000 for the purchase and installation of a digital messaging displays to be located in the different work areas throughout the fire halls. The digital messaging boards are essentially wall-mounted screens that will exponentially increase our situational awareness across the department by relaying Rela or sorry, relaying information digitally and simultaneously to all of our fire halls for the benefit of staff. Beginning with links uh, with the fire hall paging system will provide a visual awareness of deployed resources committed to active calls. In large scale events, this link to each fire hall and the employees within it will be an incredible asset in maximizing communications. An added benefit is the functionality during non-response. Digital messaging displays provide a different form of communication that improves the flow of information to frontline staff and improves situational awareness overall. Our third project, RES is requesting $20,000 to upgrade the existing immersive system and expand connectivity in the Fire Hall 5 beyond the Regional Emergency Coordination Center. The immersive system is a flexible cloud-based system that allows wireless content sharing for meetings, learning environments, and conferencing applications in large rooms or building configurations. Mayor and councillors, you may remember seeing this system in action during your recent visit to the Regional Emergency Coordination Center for your MEO training. The immersive system is currently in use in the, in the, in the Regional Emergency Coordination Center. This request for funding will allow us to expand connectivity and functionality beyond the rec room into other rooms within Fire Hall 5. Our fourth project, <clears throat> we are requesting $2 million to replace our fire data management software system. Anticipating a portion of the annual 911 grant funding to be used towards technological upgrades to maintain this service. Our current fire data management system has been in place since 1999 and is now obsolete and not supported by the provider. RES is reliant on the expertise of our internal IT department. We have reviewed a detailed scope of work requirements document and with mayor and councillor's approval, an RF RFP is anticipated to go out in 2022. This data management system for emergency services is considered a core piece of software that is fundamental to our daily operations that stores sensitive data and integrates across all branches of the department. The RES data management system's functionality begins from the time of the 911 call to the final reports and everything in between and serves as a common platform for each of our branches. <clears throat> our next project is, a re is the replacement of a pumper truck, which is a multi-year project that was approved previously in 2021. In 2021 required $120,000 with the remaining $1,080,000 for the 2022 capital budget. This life cycle replacement of a pumper truck designed for the urban service area is a project to replace a 19 year old unit. Maintaining a fleet of pumpers ensures a reliable fire suppression response. The anticipated delivery of this pumper truck is late September 2022. Our sixth project is requesting $300,000 to replace an ambulance. Replacing one of our ambulances each year supports our replacement strategy in maintaining a fleet of ambulances that will meet the RMWB's obligation to fulfill terms of the AHS ground ambulance agreement in providing EMS services to the Wood Buffalo region. Our next project, RES, is requesting 
$600,000 to replace our firefighter rehabilitation trailer. Now for us, rehabilitation means rest, recovery and decontamination. Firefighters are subject to higher rates of occupational cancers with 16 recognized presumptive cancers by WCB. We must invest in our people and continually look at ways to recover and decontaminate when exposed to those hazards. This is another opportunity to enhance mitigation measures to reduce risks associated with post-incident exposures. Replacing our 24-year-old trailer with a specialized unit that is readily available for rehabilitation process for firefighters during emergency operations and training exercises. Key elements for firefighter rehabilitation after exposure to strenuous activity in hazardous environments will be captured with this specialized units in such things as um, responder accountability, medical monitoring and treatment as needed, relief from climatic conditions, uh, active and or passive cooling or uh, warming of the core body temperatures of our firefighters, calorie and electrolyte replacement, rehydration, rest and recovery, and finally the release procedures after a full medical workup. This unit will complete our initiatives as we already put in as we have already put in place to enhance the health, wellness, and the safety of our staff. <clears throat> our eighth uh, project, we are uh, RES is requesting five hundred thousand dollars for the replacement of a twenty-year-old rural tanker truck. Tanker trucks play a critical role for an effective fire response outside of the urban area where there are supplied municipal water sources. A tanker truck's primary function is to shuttle large amounts of water to the fire scene from a remote water source. Its quick load and offload time is critical to its effectiveness. This truck has been earmarked for the community of Conklin. RES, <clears throat> sorry, our final project, RES is requesting $374,000 to replace six light fleet vehicles. These are all life cycle replacements. RES constantly evaluates the usage of light fleet and looks for opportunities and efficiencies and effectiveness. For example, one of our replacement vehicles is a half ton truck that will be replaced with a one ton flatbed truck and swapped out with the Fort Mackay Fire Department fleet. That completes my presentation and happy to take any of your questions. Thank you, Chief Butts, really appreciate it. Uh, do any of our council have any questions? I'm not seeing, oh, uh, Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Uh, and this is just a comment, Jody. Uh, I'm pleased to see the rural tanker truck going in in Conklin. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Stroud. Are there any other questions of Council? I'm not seeing any. Thanks for your presentation, Jody. You very much appreciate it. Thank you. I'll now call upon uh, communications and engagement. Good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Bowman, could you please confirm that you can uh, see my PowerPoint and hear me, please? Yes, thanks, Matthew. It's good. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mayor Bowman. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Matthew Harrison. I'm the Director of Communications and Engagement, and I'm pleased to present our proposed 2022 capital budget. For the 2022 year, we are requesting $250,000 in the proposed 2020 capital, 2022 capital budget. I'm sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. There we are. Uh, at the July 13th, 2021 council meeting, council adopted an updated flag policy, PRC 220, rep replacing uh, legislation that dated back to 1987. One of the key areas updated as part of the revised policy is the inclusion of indigenous flags. To that end, also included as part of the July council meeting, was a request for $250,000 from the Capital Infrastructure Reserve to fund the installation of additional flags, and that was approved. Installation did not occur in the latter half of 2021, and therefore we are now requesting those funds now. The funds will be used for the installation of additional flagpoles, most notably at the Jubilee Centre, where the policy prescribes the addition of a Treaty 8 flag and Métis flag to fly at that location. The work at Jubilee would require the moving and reinstallation of existing poles and installation of new flag poles. 
As well, funds will be used to accommodate additional flagpole installations in rural hamlets should there be a request to fly an Indigenous group's flag, which occurred, for example, uh, last August in Anzac, as you can see pictured on the screen before you. And I should also note that there are some instances where, as per the uh, flag policy, where flagpoles should be added to contact offices in rural hamlets or fire halls in the urban setting to align with the flag policy that calls for the flying of the federal, provincial, and municipal flags. Uh, in some cases, we have some flags that are doubled up on one uh, flagpole, which does not align with uh, standard flag protocol uh, procedure or, uh, uh, or practice. Based on our conversations with the municipalities facilities group, most flagpoles are estimated to cost between five to ten thousand dollars. However, the flagpoles at Jubilee are oversized and customized, I believe, and on deep pilings, it would cost an estimated twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Also worth noting, permission has been secured from the Jubilee Center owner, which is Alberta Infrastructure, to install additional flagpoles. And lastly, communications and engagement is the sponsoring department with Public Works as the delivery department. And that concludes my presentation for the communications and engagement capital budget request. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Do we have any questions from Council? Councilor Benjoko. Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and thanks for the presentation. Um, how many uh, flagpoles are we planning to install for 250,000? Thank you. Thank you, Ken, uh, Councillor Banjo, go through the chair. Um, so the 250,000, we would require to have, I believe, upwards of five flagpoles at Jubilee, and uh, if those are costing around 30,000, that would be about 150,000. And that leaves approximately uh, 100,000, in which we could, um, according to estimates from our facilities group, fund up to uh, about 10 flagpoles. As, as I mentioned, it's anywhere between five and, and $10,000 for uh, per flagpole. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council? I'm not seeing any, so thank you for presentation, Matthews. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna to go to motions now for councillors. So if you have any motions you'd like to bring to the floor, this is the time to bring it up. Councillor Walkman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I would like to motion that administration undertake a feasibility study for upgrades to water and sewer servicing for Fort Chippewan, Fort Mackay, and Fort Fitzgerald with the findings being presented to council <coughs> and that any funding required for the feasibility study come from the emerging, the emerging issues revenue, reserve, sorry. Thank you, Councilor Walker. We have someone second the motion, Councilor Cardinal. And Councilor Walker, would you like to speak to that motion? I, I second the motion. Thank you. Yes, speaking to the motion, um, there's a need in all three communities to do the study and see if the, um, well, for Fort Fitzgerald, I know that the, um, the water system there is water wells. And being 2022, we really need to upgrade that system there. Um, the other communities, they need um, upgrades in the water lines and in the sewer system and possibly a pump house in Fort Mackay being with the infrastructure that's coming up and all the, um, uh, we're looking at a spray park and there's no proper drainage system or uh, water system in that area. So uh, the feasibility study would be very essential there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councilor Gratton to criticism. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, just a quick question, uh, maybe more relevant for uh, Jamie. H has there been, um, I, I, I thought there was a study done for Mackay in terms of water flow and stuff, and I thought there was one done for Fort Chip, so Fort Fitz, I don't think there was, but am I mistaken? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison, I believe you could be correct for Fort Mackay in a way. I think there was a desktop analysis done in, I want to say, 2017 or 18 on, on water, um, at water and sewer. I'd have to revisit that. I don't believe there's been one for Fort Fitz, and I'd have to check on Fort Chip. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean we couldn't um, go back and, and revisit those and not throw away any good information, of course. It would just make our task a little bit easier if there was some work done. Okay, so absolutely in support. Just use the current documents rather than reinvent the wheel, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Grandison. Uh, Councilor Carlin, do you have a question or do you just waiting to make your motion? Both. Okay, go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you to Matthew for the last presentation there. But uh, anyways, uh, I'd like to make a motion for... Sorry, uh, Cardinal, Councilor Cardinal, we're just working on uh, uh, Councilor Walkland's motion right now. If you just have any questions or comments towards her motion before we vote on hers. Oh, no. I, I, I'm okay with... I just, Mr. Grandison had uh, basically asked, uh, answered my question that I was going to ask. So Perfect. That's fine. Thank you, sir. Councilor Benjoko. Thank you, Mayor Boma. Uh, so are we saying there is a feasibility study already done uh, for Fort Mackay and Fort Chippewa? Through the chair to Councilor Benjoko, I'm not sure I'd call it a full scoped feasibility study, but I think it was a desktop analysis. Uh, maybe Antoine or uh, Dennis, if you're on the line, maybe you could provide a bit more information on that, but I believe it was done uh, in the last few years, but I, I'm not sure if it would have went into the detail of an actual feasibility study. I think it should have been desktop. Okay. Um, just a follow-up question. Do we have um, a price tag for the uh, spray water pack at this point? For the future? Okay. Thank you. I guess I'm... Um, Okay. Through, the, through the chair to Dennis or Antoine, do you have a, can you provide some more information on that um, desktop study done in Fort Mackay? Uh, through the chair um, to the CAO. Um, yeah, we have uh, studies that were um, done in uh, for Fort Mackay and Fort Chippewa in 2017. Um, I don't think they were full feasibility studies, but uh, we can certainly pull that uh, pull those studies out to uh, to see what's in them. Thank you, Dean. Can I, Councilor Stroud? Uh, thank you, Mayor Bowman. Can I just uh, make a few comments or make a, ask a question? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, the spray park in Fort Mackay has been in the books for quite a while. They don't have the water pressure to have it. We, Everyone throughout the region has had their uh, beautification uh, pla placement uh, projects and uh, Fort Mackay is still waiting for theirs and when we were in Fort Mackay a couple years ago to uh, have a meeting uh, we went and looked at the seniors home there or elders home and there's not enough pressure so I'm just not sure we brought it up then the the pressure is just not there for the whole for the whole communities thank you through the chair to Councilor Stroud. Thanks for that. And I think that's certainly <clears throat> the basis for the feasibility study that Councilor Watkins alluding to that <clears throat> we need to understand what the current situation is and if there's any gaps to help facilitate some of those projects. So I think that's where, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councilor Walken, but that's kind of what you're speaking to so we can understand holistically the picture of what we need to do in Fort Mackay and Fort Fitz as well as Fort Chip. Yes, um, if, if there's anything that um, 
the study needs, I would like, you know, to come to leadership in the communities and um, direct, or the leadership there can actually direct the feasibility study and actually give the, um, I guess, the, the study that we did out there and bring it forward again. Any other questions for Councillor Walkman or comments on the motion? I'm seeing none. Uh, does anyone object to this motion? So it's carried unanimously. Uh, Councillor Cardinal, you have a motion to, to put out? <coughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to make motion that $730,000 be allocated from the Capital Infrastructure Reserve and included in the 2022 capital budget for the Fort Mackay Target Road Rehabilitation, which includes the support of an assessment of the road condition and remediation as required to ensure safe operation. Thank you, Councilor Cardinal. Do we have a second for that motion? Councilor Walkwood? Second that motion. Thank you. Councilor Cardinal, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes. Uh, uh, with, uh, along, with getting some information from the residents in Fort Mackay, I believe that the road has been deemed to be a municipal road so and uh the first the nations that have been um uh well fort mckay first nation i believe for sure i'm not too sure if it was mary mate uh, uh mckay matey as well but it could be both of them and uh they've been uh, uh keeping the road and i mean maintaining it and they're uh, actually wanting to have us um you know, foot the bill now from now on because it is a municipal used road to the the, the treatment plant there, I believe. Thank you, Councilor Cardinal. Does anyone have any comments or questions to Councilor Gradenson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair, um, Kendrick, I'm just trying to envision which road you're referring to because it's, uh, you're asking for a fairly hefty sum and I don't even know what it's for. Well, the Fort Mackay egress road is uh, located, goes to the water treatment, it goes to the water treatment plant, I think, or the pump station. So what's been happening is that um, the, the big trucks that are hauling from there are, have been breaking through the road and then the, the, the nations have been f fixing the road. So it's about, I believe, I got the email here, hold on a sec. So it's just basically like it is a municipal road. So if we need to come, if we need to come back to it, I think that everybody got the email on the Fort Mackay egress road. So if nobody read it, then I, I would be guilty of that, Councillor. Okay. But if, so, if, when you say the water treatment plant, that's the main road right through the community, is it not? Through the it chair, is, yes. Through the chair to Councillor Grandison and also to Councillor Cardinal, if I can just clarify, is this, are you, are you speaking of Target Road that goes up yes. through? Yes. So that's a different road that leads uh, through First Nations land into our old uh, dump site. It's our road and it does, it does need some work. Um, there's another lift of asphalt required, however, I think um, we would want to budget some money to go and revisit the entire road uh, because uh, if there is some traffic on there, we want to make sure that the sub base is adequately designed and engineered so we can handle the extra traffic and heavy road. So uh, perhaps I can ask you this. Oh, hello. Uh, this question, uh, Jamie. So it's are we own the road that runs right through the middle of the First Nations? Is that because of the water treatment plant? through the chair to Councillor Grandison. No, I, I don't believe it's the water treatment plant. It leads back to our old dump site. So we have a lease uh, with a province for that piece of property and the road for another 15 years, I believe. <clears throat> so it's still within our care control until that's over. So the road I believe Councillor Cardinal is referring to is that is that road. I don't have the map in front of me and I, I don't know if uh, anybody has it online to share. Maybe I'll have a look through my stuff here, but it's quite 
it's quite a straight line almost that leads right through the right through the reserve lands into our old dump site. So, uh, Councillor Cardinal, I, and again, forgive me, I'm just trying to get clarity. So, Council Cardinal referred to water trucks and heavy trucks deteriorating the road. Uh, if it's leading to the landfill, I'm just questioning why those trucks are even on that road. Like, what? Uh, if, I guess there traffic control that's required within this as well. That's, I'm just, again, trying to get clarity so that I can support the motion, right? Through the chair to Councillor Granison, if we just hold tight for one second, I'll find you a map here. Thank you. Yeah, I just, um, I, I got it in my emails here. I'm just trying to find it. Uh... I'm trying to find it on my computer here. I can't uh, seem to be able to pull up the email from the First Nations, uh, Fort Mackay First Nation. I'm just trying to pull it up. Just bear with me there. Um, not Lance, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> no, no worries, Councillor. <laughs> Did you did you hear Councillor Shroud Kendrick? He, she said it was from Mike Evans. Is that correct, Councillor? Yes, Councilor? it was from Mike. Yes, it was from Mike Evans. And I'm how do I? I'm just trying to. Oh, apparently uh, Jamie has it. Okay. This is this is the road here. So it comes through the reserve. This green line. That's our old dump site. This road we maintain, but it's in poor condition. I don't know if anybody like it's, it's heavily used. I believe, but it's by some heavier traffic, not just regular traffic and if we add the 50 mil of asphalt that they're requesting which is about 250 grand I think I don't think it's enough because I think the road will still subside underneath it it was it's heavy so we traffic. need to do some preliminary work before we actually assign a budget so, so that's 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 the 730 if we're gonna put this in this project we'll do the assessment and see what that's gonna cost but our initial assessment would be the base worth of 730 with the asphalt whatsoever. 730 all included. If we don't need that much, then we certainly won't do so it. So that's an appropriate budget. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jamie. He, he gave me, showed me the road, so I know which road we're talking about now, and uh, explained the, the budget as well. So I have more information now. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Grandison. Councilor Benjoko. <laughs> thank you, Mayor Bowman. I, I, my question is to Councillor Cardinal. I just wanted to know how he, we arrived at the budget uh, figure of 730,000. I'll leave that up to Jamie because they're, if, it, it, they have budgeted, I think, prior, prior oh. to this and it's, I get oh. Jamie to talk on the numbers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal, through the chair. I'll address them, I guess, as best I can. And I, <clears throat> we have a request, of course, to lay some asphalt on top of the road because it, it, there is some need for work and there's probably a bit of a safety concern as well. Um, what that work was budgeted as approximately 250,000 to put down that extra 50 mils of asphalt. However, it would, it would seem counterintuitive to just add the layer of asphalt on top of it when the, the subsurface wouldn't support the extra or the traffic that goes on there. So the budget that you see before you uh, is something that's been estimated by our engineering group to suggest as we do the assessment of the road, if we need to build and upgrade the entire road, that's the total cost of it. Of course, as we go through and do the feasibility, if it doesn't cost that much, we're not gonna spend it, of course, but that's what we figure the actual spend would be at the end of the day, if we had to re-engineer or, I guess, rebuild the subsurface all the way to the top. Okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, can I can I uh, comment on that? Uh, I got I found the email. Yeah, we already got the email, uh, Councillor, and uh, show Councillor Granison the the uh, diagram, the map of the road. Okay, because it is a waste transfer station, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Councillor Wakwa? Uh, and it just, I just wanted to refer to a, a comment made which says RMWV Engineering and Public Works Department admitted it had lost track of the a asset 
during uh, our meeting of January 13th. Fort Mackay has performed spot repairs for the years to this road, but it's time for RMW to protect its own asset. Details are in the attached briefing note. Thank you. Councillor Walkman? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I fully support that motion. Um, being a resident in Fort Mackay, that road um, gets beat up pretty bad. And being now that they built a new school in that area, it's be, it's one of, it's a main road. And uh, once the, the study was done, um, I believe that there's some major work that really needs to be done there. So thanks for making that motion, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Walkman. Councillor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. I have absolutely no hesitation in the municipality assuming responsibility for its own asset. I just have one more question just so I can understand this. So, uh, Councillor Cardinal uh, made reference to heavier vehicles. So, um, one of two things I think have to happen go forward is the road either has to be engineered to withstand the weight of the heavier vehicles or there has to be a restriction put on the road as to the weight of the vehicle so that uh, any damage to the road would be bore by persons who are driving vehicles heavier than what's recommended. One of those two things need to happen within this process. That's all, right? Like, I, I don't want to underbuild a road, I don't want to overbuild a road, and if it doesn't need heavy trucks, then there should be a weight restriction, and if it does, then it needs to be built to handle that weight. That's all. So I, hopefully that will be part of this budget. Thank you, Councillor Grandison. Are there any other comments or questions of Council Cardinal or just to speak to the motion? I'm seeing none. Any, any, anyone opposed? So then that's carried unanimously. Councillor Cardinal, you have another motion? I do, yes. Uh, shoot. <laughs> see if I find it here. Um, sorry, but delay, Jade. Okay. Jade has sent it to me. I, uh, shoot, lost it now. Hold on, bear with me. Here it is. Okay. All right. I, Councillor Cardinal, make motion that 100000 be added to the 2022 operating budget for the Public Works Department for upgrades to the Dory Lake uh, campground. Thank you. Everyone second that motion? Councillor Walkman? I second that motion. Thank you. And Councilor Carden, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm a resident here in Fort Chippewan. Um, I believe that uh, we, you know, just maintained, basically just uh, cut wood and, you know, that's really all I've seen done in the past years and maybe um, uh, somewhat a little bit of renovations to the, to the out, outhouses. Other than that, there there's not been no uh, upgrades to the Dory Lake Road, and that's and I, I you know I like I said I go to uh, Anzac and uh, you know other 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 places, and you know they're like and Gregoire Lake, like their facilities there are immaculate compared to what it is in Fort Chippewan, and um, I just figured that you know for starters and uh, for steps moving forward, I understand that, that you know we we are going to ask the province for funding, and in the meantime, uh, but uh, as as it stands right now, I feel that you know just to keep to 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 uh, acknowledge the community members and the children that are using the uh, facilities, and you know uh, you know I I think that it's be best to be good to put uh, you know new new fire pits. Uh, definitely new picnic tables and even possibly a, a floating dock or a, a long dock that they can actually the kids can jump off or 
or even a spot to where the sea dews be blocked from coming close to shore where they have that big orange orange uh, pylons uh, that are in the water that make sure that the kids are kept safe that kind of stuff and drag the beach um i think that's this is what the, the, this money would be for and just trying to make our little uh our only campground that we have here in Fort Chippewan a little nicer, and that's just just start just to start for the hundred thousand dollars. It's not a much, not a big ask, but hopefully we could uh, in the meantime for the next year we could ask the government and uh, like uh, Minister uh, uh, Rajan Shanji for Sani for for money for next year. But uh, I just figured that I asked for that motion, and uh, hopefully we can get that going today. Thanks, Councillor Cardinal. Sorry, I was. Uh, so you're not thinking money for Dory Road itself, just for the park? No, it's not. No, it's just, it's, yeah, it's just for the campgrounds. Like we would love to have the camp campgrounds uh, if it needs to go out to tender to another Indigenous community, uh, Indigenous company or a local-owned company to maintain it or, and build uh, uh, picnic tables and fire pits. Um yeah, that's 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 what I'm asking. Yes. Okay. Because um, I know when we talked, we met with uh, Minister Sani. We we talked about the Dory, the road itself, and that uh, what we were paid, what the municipality was paid each year to maintain it was far below what it cost us to maintain that road. So I know we did have a conversation together with her, and she said she would uh, assist us in moving forward to fix that deficit we're finding. And I'm just looking in now. Who who's the owner of the park? Uh, but uh, Councillor Grandison. Well, that thank you, Mr. Mayor, through the chair. That was my next question. Whose whose park is it? Is, is it provincial? Through the chair to Councillor Grandison. I'm fairly certain it's a provincial campground. Um, even the road is theirs. Um, we're provided with a small um, fund to maintain the road, which, of course, in, in typical provincial fashion, is not enough to cover it. Uh, Keith. Uh, or maybe even Brad or Michael on the phone, on the line. I'm I'm pretty certain it's a provincial campground and they own all the asset, correct? Through the chair to the CAO, Dory Lake Campground is provincial. They do, we, we have entered into an agreement with them in which they do pay us a certain amount, I believe it's 30 grand uh, per year to help with the upkeep. The road itself is provincial, although we have direction control and maintenance in which we, we maintain that road. So the, it's a provincial campground. So, uh, having said that, and 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 I have to apologize, Councillor Cardinal, but I, I, you know, where does it end? If if Gregoire Lake Provincial Campground was in tatters, would we ask for money from the municipality to fix it? I, I, I would much rather uh, suggest that our mayor and council draft a letter of support for the province to actually take responsibility for their asset rather than to ask the municipal tax base to begin because once we start down that slippery slope where does it end you know so this this would not be a motion i could support thank you and to add councilor cardinal i'm i've been to door lake quite a few times at provincial park there back in the day with the kids from uh, the school is very it was a great asset to the community my only fear would be that if we bought uh, docks and infrastructure for the park that'll be owned by the province. Um, I'd have to, we have to check into that and see who would own the assets put on there if it's a provincial park. Okay, well, I suggest uh, that we uh, ask the provincial province to uh, sign it over to us and we take over it. Then we have, then we, then we, you know, I think that that, that would be another good uh, Avenue to go on to go down. This is part. Yeah. This is in our municipality. Yeah. If you want, if we want to table this motion and look at that and have it come next, next, hopefully next council meeting, look at doing that. I think either getting the province to upgrade it or to uh, possibly take it over, uh, because I think putting money into something that's owned by the province, uh, as Council Grant, Council Grandson mentioned, we're kind of chasing our own tails. Um, but I really think I don't want to put anything into it and then the province own. The assets of Fort Chippewa and because of that through the chair if I may as well I think we'd also find ourselves on a bit of a slippery slope uh, with that as, as we don't have um, the authority to make any improvements to a provincial park 
uh, without their ex explicit approval. I guess with the best of best intent, they could uh, they could seek compliance or enforcement, if I can use those words, against us for a contravention of the Public Lands Act. All right. Uh, Councilor Cardinal, if you want to withdraw that motion and we can look into uh, options for the uh, Door Lake Provincial Park um, going forward. Okay, let's do that. Then I tape, I, I'll tape, I'll uh, retract my motion. Okay, thank you. Are there any other uh, motions, uh, Councilor Ball? Yeah, I have one motion. Um, I, Councilor Ball, <clears throat> motion that Capital Project 22135 Facilities Operational Sustainment Capital be removed from the 2022 capital budget. Do we have a second for that motion? Councillor Grandison? I second the motion. Thank you. Would you like to speak to that motion, Councillor Ball? Yes, this, this is the one that uh, I kind of briefly discussed where they have a capital project in the book for, it's only $250,000, but it has no scope of work, no defined work. It's basically a slush fund to utilize in the event something happens. Uh, so I, I, I suggest we remove it. Anyone like to speak to that motion or question? Can you repeat the the section, Councillor Ball? The well, the motion what you're uh, retracting. It's under facilities operational sustainment capital. It's number one thirty five. That one. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Does anyone have any questions for the councillor or comments? I'm seeing none. Uh, anyone object to this motion? Seeing none, it's carried unanimously. Thank you. Do we have any other motions that need to be put up? I'm. And is there one more call for motions? Uh, there's none. So thank one you. One more. Uh, okay, go ahead, Councillor. Hi, Councillor Cardinal. Make motion that uh, the RMWB look into uh, doing a feasible feasibility study in support of the uh, reconciliation department to a, a study on doing a cultural grounds for uh, the indigenous communities throughout the regional municipality of, of wood buffalo thank you council cardinal call you a second for that Wait. Councilor Benjoko? I second the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Can you speak to that motion now, Councilor Cardinal? What it's about? Yes, uh, it's, um, I, I guess it's a part of the reconciliation process. I, uh, I, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, the, the ceremonial grounds, uh, I'd like to uh, possibly have the Indigenous Rural Relations uh, look into uh, providing a ceremonial grounds uh i guess it would be in, in part to uh, you know uh funding for a sweat lodge, sweat lodge area and uh cultural cultural grounds in each community and just do a study feasibility study on what it would cost to have each community have their own spiritual gathering place provided by the rmwb and uh the IR our department department so we can able to have practice our uh, cultural uh, ways of life uh, i.e uh, pipe ceremonies uh, cultural cultural uh, sweat lodges those kind of goes those kind of things I believe that they're doing them in uh, Enoch and in Edmonton I think that maybe having uh, CAO and his team look at uh, the fundamentals of what comes with 
the what comes at those uh, facilities, um, and it be a part of our reconciliation process. Because uh, you know, I just wanted to mention that you know we do have our each and every uh, other areas have their churches that uh, they go and uh, worship in. Us as Aboriginal people, I really would like to have our our own people be able to go into our own spiritual grounds that prov that's provided by the RMWB, and uh, we practice our ways of life as well in part uh, in part of the 94 calls to action and in part of reconciliation. Thank you, Council Cardinal. Council Grandison. Uh, again, I'm a bit perplexed with with the motion, Council Cardinal. I I um I don't know which part of truth and reconciliation it would refer to, and certainly I I don't believe it's the place of the municipality to go on to uh, First Nations land to develop infrastructure for the benefit of the culture and. And when you speak to uh, places of worship and, and such, uh, those aren't built by government. Those are built by uh, the organizations themselves um, to the benefit of those who, who's, who's faith and who, whom support those. Um, again, I get perplexed by this, this type of motion because I, I hope you understand, I hope I've demonstrated my um, uh, not only understanding, but uh, my desire to, uh, as a government, to make sure that we are uh, respectful and compliant with truth and reconciliation and, and try and make up for some of the sins of our forefathers. But at the end of the day, I, 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 I don't understand how this, one, is would be a municipal responsibility, or two, how it even fits within truth and reconciliation and 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 uh, number three why uh, the municipality ought not be in the position of creating infrastructure on a first nations community so i am somewhat perplexed well I'm, uh, i understand you're perplexed yeah but it is the government that did uh, these things to our aboriginal people so in, in reconciliation that would be a part of the process well, i know it's out of uh, out of our out of our uh, scope of uh, governance, but when the, wh I'm just saying that uh, it doesn't, it's not going to be on First Nation land. It's not going to be on Métis land. It's going to be in RMWB land. It's not going to be. It's not going to be owned by no, no uh, First Nation nor any Métis community. It'll be practiced by those communities and other, uh, other uh, uh, nationalities. But it would be in in, in a place to have. That's uh, for uh, for us to be able to gather, even if it's just a cultural uh, area to where we're able to practice our ways of life, which is a, a sweat lodge ceremonies, pipe ceremonies, that kind of things. I just figured, you know, it's worth a try to see if we can look at it at least, right? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I'm I'm somewhat perplexed because I've been to a number of powwows. In, in communities, I've certainly been to sweat lodges in the actual communities, and and I believe all of those resources exist in all of these communities, so I'm not quite sure the value of creating a separate one on municipal land when it already exists to the benefit of those that are are already using them and, and want to celebrate that part of that aspect of their, their culture and, and their, their value systems. Through, through the chair to Councillor Grandison and uh, Council as well, um, I, I believe I believe what Councillor Cardinal's getting at is a cultural space for for wellness and, and con uh, cultural activities. Um, we've just as recently as last week starting having conversations about this very subject um, with the waterfront um, and priority area too as an option. So keep in mind, we're very early in the preliminary discussions of this. Um, we have been meeting, of course, and we're going to do some, some engagement with uh, the reconciliation table and community members, of course, utilizing heavily our, our friends in uh, IRR to help us get there. So to Councillor Cardinal's question, we are, we are early in the conversation of a space, just as you mentioned, and we're just not there yet. Councilor Benjoko. 
Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Yeah. I think I'm a bit confused uh, as to the um, motion. I was thinking is the education part and uh, creating awareness uh, of the indigenous cultures, the history of the indigenous peoples and making sure that we have uh, the training and uh, education that we, we need to be able to uh, understand and support the course. So, um, but the physical uh, locations and the um, building of uh, premises, I'm not sure uh, if, if that's what I thought the motion was. Thank you. Councilor Cardinal? No, I just uh, figured that I'd voice my concern on uh, how our spiritual, our, our ways of life were taken away away from the government, and I just wanted to put that on on the, in the minutes. That that's that's it. I just thought I'd ask, and uh, we weren't able to practice our ways of life, and uh, that's this was a part of it. And I I appreciate everybody's comments. Thank you, Council Cardinal, and uh, I would definitely support a feasibility study on this. Um, Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through the chair to Councilor Cardinal. Uh, obviously, through the conversation, I always get a little bit more educated, um, but I absolutely appreciate uh, Jamie's comments. I, I think certainly part of Truth and Reconciliation and the Riverfront Master Plan incorporating opportunities to celebrate the cultural history of our region et cetera, within infrastructure that's being developed and, and built to ensure that we always recognize uh, that we do live on Treaty 8 lands and, and the unceded territory of the Métis. I, I think that has to be incorporated into the things that we do uh, without question, and I 100% support that. I was just confused as to creating multiple uh, spots when, uh, like I said, I was familiar with many of them already happening, and um, forgive me sometimes, Councillor Cardinal, it's not, it's always just my attempt to understand more so I can be more educated, more empathic, and, and more able to support with my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grandison. Councillor Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Cardinal, I just want to say that I 100% uh, support your motion here. I think it's really important that not just for an um, culturally but educational. I think I think we can learn a lot together by having these um, grounds in all areas. Um, you know, I think that we have a lot of sweat lodges and uh, cultural um, uh, cultural things to the indigenous in the indigenous populations. But I do also think it's important that we respect and show that here in the in the municipality and the places that there aren't. Uh, I think it's a huge education piece, and I think um, it's something for us to grow and learn together and to be taught. And so I appreciate you coming forward with this, and I'll support it 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weigel. Councillor Stroud? Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and through to uh, Councillor Cardinal. Yes, I will. I definitely support this. I think hopefully through the feasibility study, if it's done in-house, uh, there will be consultation within all the communities to... Uh, gain the support that's needed for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Is there any more comments or questions from Council? I'm seeing none. Anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, that's carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Are there any more motions for the to be brought forward? I'm not seeing any. So thank you everyone. We'll now take a one hour recess to allow administration to incorporate all the changes made during the budget sessions. We'll resume at 6 p.m. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We'll now move on to the consideration of the 2022 budget, 2023 to 2024 financial plan recommendation. Can I have someone make the motion? Councilman Joko. Thank you, May. I move that the 2022 operating budget in the amount of 523,000, one um, million, sorry, in the amount of 523 million, dollars be approved, representing to 34,745,945 million, What am I doing? Am I okay? I move that the 2022 operating budget in the amount of five twenty three million one eighteen thousand eight twenty seven dollars be approved representing three forty seven million seven forty five thousand nine forty five dollars for municipal operations excluding the communications and engagement department and the community investment program and 128 million 166,561 dollars as a funding transfer for reserve and capital purposes be approved. Can I have someone second that motion? Councillor Weigel. I second that motion. Thank you. Is there any questions of, of uh, or comments by council? I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Anyone oppose? None. That's carried unanimously. And can I have someone move the next motion? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I move that the 2022 operating budget be amended to add. Sorry, Councillor Stroud. Uh, Councillor Geisen has to declare a, a pecuniary interest. Oh, if you want sorry. to take a. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have to recuse myself as my spouse is employed with St. Aidan's, and funding from this budget will support the agency. So I'll excuse Thank you, Councillor Geisen. Go ahead, Councillor Stroud. Thank you. I move that the 2022 operating budget be amended to add seven million one hundred twenty-six thousand seventy-four dollars for the communications and engagement department. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have someone second the motion, Councillor Walkman? I, I second that motion. Thank you. Are there any questions or, or comments by Council? All in favor? Anyone opposed? You know, it's carried unanimously. Can I have someone make the next motion? Councillor Weigel. Um, no, the next one actually has St. Aidan's House in it. The next one has St. Aidan's. Okay. I'd like to welcome back Thank Councillor you. Grandison. Mm -hmm. I move that the 2022 operating budget be amended to add 39,262,249. One second, please. Sorry, Councillor Weigel. All right, I'm back. Go ahead. Okay, take two. I move the 2022 operating budget be amended to add $39,262,249 for the community investment program, which excludes the following community investment program grants. A, St. Aidan's House Society for 257498 B, Fort Mackay Métis Nation Association and Fort Mackay Recreation and Cultural Society for 160,500. And C, King's Kids Promotions Outreach Ministries Incorporated and Family Christian Center, Legacy Counseling Center for $400,000. Thank you, Councilor Weigel. I have someone second the motion, Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman, I second that motion. Thank you, are there any other questions from Council? Call for a vote, all in favor? Opposed? 
That's one opposed. And that's carried with one opposed. Can I have someone make the next motion? Councillor Ball. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Gradison has to. Uh, once again, Mr. Mayor, I need to rescue, recuse myself as my wife is employed by St. Aidan's. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Do I wait for him to leave? I move that the two, <clears throat> excuse me, I move that the 2022 operating budget be amended to add $257,498 for the Community Investment Program grant to St. Aidan's House Society. Do you have someone second that motion? Councillor Walker? I second that motion. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Call for a vote. All in favor? Thank you, Council Cardinal. Anyone opposed? So now it's carried unanimously. Have someone carry the, uh, make the next motion, Councillor Walkwin. I need to declare conflict of interest. Okay, thank you. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I move that the 2022 operating budget be amended to add 160,500 for community investment program for Fort Mackay Métis Nation Association and Fort Mackay Recreation and Cultural Society. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Mm -hmm. You can have someone second that motion, Councillor Benjoko. I second the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from Council? All in favor? Councilor Cardinal. Yes. Councilor Cardinal. Thank you. That's carried unanimously. Keep your camera on. <laughs> Can someone make the next motion, Councilor Weigel? Uh, thank you, Mayor Bowman. I just need to recuse oh. myself for this next. Thank you. One. Thanks. Can I have make the next motion, Councillor Ball? I move that to the 2022 operating budget be amended to add 400,000 for a community investment program for King's Kids Promotions Outreach Ministries Incorporated and Family Christian Center Legacy Counseling Center. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Can I have someone second that motion? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I second that motion. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments from Council? I call for a vote. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Can some make the next motion? Councillor Gradison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the 2023-2024 financial plan in the amount of $567,098,059 and that $565,363,059 respectively with funding transfers for capital purpose of the $117,076,387 and that $112,157,590 respectively be used as the basis for the development of the respective subsequent budgets and no and. <laughs> it says and. <laughs> Can I have someone second the motion? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I second that motion. Is there any other questions or comments from uh, Council? All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Can I have someone make the next motion, Councillor Benjoko? I move that the 2022 capital budget in the amount of 155 million, 
249,000, public art fund transfer totaling 156 million and 48,000 be approved. Thank you, have someone second that motion? Councilor Ball? I second that motion. Thank you, any other questions or comments from council? I'll call for a vote, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried unanimously. This concludes the budget deliberations and approvals. Thank you everyone for all your time. This meeting is now adjourned.